That's fine. Yeah, I have Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go live now. We have quorum. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have quorum. And I'm here. It's Councillor Paquette. Good morning from Council Chambers, noted uh, Councillor Paquette. We are going live. We are live now from Council Chambers. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nkora Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and our settlers from around the world. This is the continuation of the uh, non stat public hearing from uh, Yesterday, I will do a roll call of council members. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Yes, good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right. I will explain the process uh, for today's non-stat public hearing uh, on the uh, capital operating and carbon budgets. All speakers will be paneled in a group of uh, up to 20. Speakers will present to city council in the order they registered. If speakers are absent when called, they will be moved to the end of the speaker's list. As a speaker, you have five minutes to make your presentation. The office of the city clerk has your presentation. If you have one prepared, and you can ask them to advance your slides by saying, next slide, please. The green light will come on at the start of your presentation. The yellow light will come on when you have one minute, uh, one minute left. We ask that you summarize your comments at this point. The red light indicates the end of your five minutes. When you have finished your presentation, please remain seated. Once all speakers within the panel have made their presentation, each counsel may each counselor may ask questions of the speakers within that panel. Once all public speakers have been heard, City Council will postpone the public reports listed in the agenda to November 30th, 2022 City Council meeting. This meeting starts November 30th and is expected to take place over multiple days in, no in November and December, during which we will deliberate on the budget. For the purpose of today's meeting, neither the main budget motions nor amendments may be put on the floor, seconded, or passed. In addition, no questions will be asked of administration. We have 11 and a half hours of meeting time each day of the public hearing. Here is how you can find information on the status of the public hearing. To start, 
I will read out the which has been already done, the uh, list of the speakers. The list of the public speakers will be publicly available and updated at edmonton.ca slash meetings. Updates are made as panels are read out. So thank you for once again participating and it's a very important conversation that we're having. And this is about our city's future and uh, the decision that we will make over the next number of weeks uh, for the four-year cap uh, budget, uh, all budgets. And with that, I will be coming back to the uh, list of speakers in uh, panel five. And we, the last speaker we heard was Peter M. Rongan, Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. And next speaker is Shafraz Kaba. He might be actually delayed. I'll check if he's here. Shafraz, are you there? We'll come back to you. And I will check again if Christian Fortang is joining us. Christian Fortang, no. Uh, well, next is Kaylin Anderson, Urban Development Institute at Benton Metro, joining us remotely. Kaylin, please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. Uh, it's nice to be here with you virtually this morning uh, with yourself and members of City Council. My name is Kaylin Anderson and I'm the Executive Director of the Urban Development Institute for the Edmonton Metro Region. I'm pleased to be here with you today to share some high level perspectives on the budget on behalf of the land development industry. As your city building partners, we recognize the, the significant and difficult decisions that are before Council as part of the upcoming budget deliberations. Given the volatility of our current economic climate, it is critical that the budget cultivates a business-friendly environment, positioning the City of Edmonton as a competitive and welcoming place that supports affordability, economic development, and ongoing growth. So with this in mind, there are three key areas where we would like the City Council's engagement and support through the budget process. These are igniting growth and development through public investment decisions, focusing on the primary functions and mandate of the municipal government, and getting the basics right in terms of core services. I will describe each area briefly. First, we ask Council to focus on priorities that catalyze economic development and talent attraction and retention for the future. Without ongoing private sector growth, there will not be an opportunity to fund future public sector priorities. For example, unlocking more non-residential land through transportation infrastructure is one good way to help generate wealth creation. Edmonton currently offers an affordability advantage in comparison to other major municipal centres within Canada. However, this advantage is precarious. Affordability is being eroded based on a wide variety of factors and businesses and households are struggling to keep up. The budget that Edmonton approves this month needs to reflect that we are living in an even more difficult marketplace. Decisions made today will impact Edmontonians, small business owners and investors who are looking to make Edmonton their home now and in the future. To ensure that Edmonton remains an affordable and competitive municipality that attracts jobs, investment, uh, and talent, it's important that Council remains aware of the material impact of increasing costs during the budget deliberations ahead. By supporting healthy market growth while keeping city costs low, Council can help keep costs for, for individual families low in turn. And this adds up to a clear advantage for Edmonton overall. Second, we recommend that you maintain your focus on the core mandate of the city. Keeping increasing costs in mind, difficult questions must be asked about what lines of business the city should be in and to what extent. For example, are services currently being provided that are within the purview of other orders of government? Are we creating inefficiencies by duplicating programs and services that are currently offered by the nonprofit sectors? And finally, are we unnecessarily competing with or limiting opportunities for the private sector? By focusing on the core mandate, more opportunities will be available for incremental improvements in our city's operations and maintenance, as well as for more transformative city building initiatives. It's really about getting the basics right. This brings me to my third area, which is delivering on basic service as well. The basic stuff is arguably the most important to the most people. This would include areas such as snow clearing, well cared for roads, well maintained parks, efficient waste collection and more. A well run city that provides the basics will support a high functioning business community and citizenry. To elaborate on this point, providing a clean, vibrant, safe and prosperous downtown is crucial to Edmonton's success. 
While only comprising 1% of the city's land mass, the city contributes almost 10% of the city's tax base. Improving the condition of the downtown is a particularly important area where council can focus on tangible and concrete solutions that will ultimately grow business confidence in our city and benefit all Edmontonians. To wrap up, we know that it's been a challenging few years for Edmonton and homeowners and, and businesses are still in a fragile state. Our industry encourages council to ignite new development opportunities, focus on the core mandate of the city and maintain the basic services needed to support Edmonton's ratepayers without increasing the burden further. We encourage council to identify and implement concrete cost savings in both the operating and capital budgets while improving on the core conditions that will enable our city to thrive. This is important because cities are in a competitive game with each other and each has to work harder than the next to attract talent and investment. With each spending decision, council should consider whether return on investment in terms of both cost avoidance, council should consider the return on investment, both in terms of cost avoidance and leveraging new public investments where they make the largest impact on private sector growth. We very much look forward to working with you to achieve these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, uh, uh, Kaylin. Next, we will go to Dale Gino from Wild North in person. Yeah, please uh, come join us at number 18, uh, right in that corner, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Dale, if you could go right in the, uh, on the other side and number 18. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to speak here this morning. I know uh, yesterday must have been a long, arduous day for you, and uh, today's bound to be another one, so I appreciate uh, you lending us your ears. Um, I am the uh, executive director of an organization called Wild North, um, legally known as the Wildlife Rehabilitation Society of Edmonton. Uh, we have enjoyed over many years a long and collaborative um, uh, arrangement with the city of Edmonton. Our function is to provide uh, care for injured and orphaned wildlife in the city of Edmonton and surrounding area. Uh, there are seven such rehabilitation centers in the province. We're the largest and most northerly and the only one that services the uh, capital region. Uh, it's a very important uh, function. Uh, here in Edmonton, we enjoy the, uh, one of the largest green spaces, of course, of any place uh, or any city uh, in North America with a river valley about 20 times the size of Central Park. So we uh, interface with much wildlife uh, here in Edmonton. And uh, as we enjoy these green spaces, um, that uh, grows and grows. Um, if you can just go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, we serve three main functions. Um, number one is uh, our rescue. We are the only organization that has a dedicated wildlife rescue in the province of Alberta and indeed in the capital region. Um, this is important because many animals uh, are not recovered and able to come into our wildlife rehabilitation center. Uh, we now can go out uh, and in this way we uh, respond to 1100 rescue requests every year uh, to go out and uh, help imperiled wildlife to bring them back to our wildlife hospital uh, here in Edmonton. Uh, next slide please. The other function is our care function. Uh, you can see here some work that our uh, veterinarians and techs are doing uh, in our wildlife hospital. Uh, here in the city of Edmonton. Um, so we provide care both at our Edmonton Hospital and our Wildlife Rehabilitation Center in Parkland County uh, out in Spruce Grove. Um, here we take in about 3,500 animals uh, every year. And the important thing to note is that Wild North is the only organization uh, in Edmonton and surrounding area that is legally allowed to uh, license by the provincial and federal governments to conduct this kind of work. So this is not a function that the um, uh, Fish and Wildlife does or the City Park Rangers or, or anything like that. Um, we're the sole organization that um, looks after injured and orphaned wildlife in northern Alberta. Next slide please. The other function of course is our education component. Uh, we work very hard to help teach uh, the citizens of Edmonton how to live in harmony with our local wildlife. Uh, we receive 13,500 calls on our wildlife helpline. Uh, 311 um, routes a lot of their calls to us 
and uh, enables us to help educate uh, citizens on what to do uh, when they encounter wildlife or if they have conflicts. Um, we also speak to uh, 9,000 students uh, in Edmonton, um, again, uh, teaching them how to live in harmony with our, our local wildlife. Next slide, please. Here is uh, just a list of some of the stats. Um, so since our inception in 1989, we've been working closely with the city of Edmonton. Um, we have admitted over 50,000 wild animals uh, here in Edmonton, um, 3,500 uh, each year, uh, 1,100 rescue requests. We go out and, uh, and help these animals or needs. So these are ones that the public are unable to get for themselves uh, and, and bring in. And again, Fish and Wildlife does not provide uh, any, any services there. Um, 150 different species, 13,500 uh, wildlife related phone calls come through our hotline. Um, lots and lots of volunteers, as you can see, uh, about 240 uh, help us in our work. Uh, we teach many school children and we collaborate with uh, organizations across the city as well. Next slide, please. Since 2015, um, the City of Edmonton recognizing us as an essential service has provided annual funding um, in the amount of $100,000 to help us with our work uh, in the city. Um, and we work collaboratively with all the different uh, respective departments, including animal care and control, um, the park rangers, et cetera, in the city. But you can see how much we've increased uh, the workload as people are getting out and about and more animals are being discovered. Um, 2015, we've actually increased our uh, animals have been, been admitted by 69% from just over, um, oh, for a couple thousand to, you can see how many uh, we bring in now. Our helpline has now increased 140% since 2015, and we're providing more services, including training municipal staff, uh, park rangers, animal care and control people, so they are now operating underneath our licenses to help save wildlife in the city. We're here today to make a request for an increase in funding. Uh, you can see of $50,000 to reflect um, how much more work we've been doing with wildlife in the city and the community over the last seven years. Uh, we haven't received any increase in funding for the seven years, and um, we simply uh, need more funds to uh, continue supporting that sustainable funding. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Next, we'll go to Peggy Garrity from Edmonton Screen Industries Office. Thank you, Mayor Soe and members of council. Uh, my name is Peggy Garrity. I chair the board for Edmonton Screen Industries Office. And, Can you move uh, close to the mic if you don't mind, Peggy? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that please. better? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just today wanted to provide you with an update on the work that we have been doing and the exciting opportunities that we see ahead. Since we were formed in 2017, the ASIO has served the city and our screen industry partners as a catalyst and champion for growing this industry in Edmonton. We've put a strong foundation in place with a dedicated board of engaged volunteers and a small but energetic team led by our CEO, Tom Vinica. During the past year, we spent time assessing our progress to date, learning from and partnering with similar organizations, and developing a bold strategy to guide our actions over the next five years. We're proud of what we've accomplished in the past. We've been responsible stewards of the city's grants and leveraged those funds to recruit an incredibly talented team and to support creative and talented filmmakers and id interactive digital media developers to get their projects off the ground. But we're not settling for the approaches that we've used in the past. We're even more excited about where those new directions will take us. Next slide, please. Our new strategic plan clearly sets out the purpose of Edmonton Screen Industries Office, to be a daring partner that champions creativity powers the success of our screen industries, and drives pride in a radiant city. With that purpose at the heart of everything we do, we're dreaming big for the future. We're building a creative hub for screen industries in Edmonton that will be a magnet for creative talent, new productions, new games, and screen technologies. Our bold goal is to build a $100 million industry right here in Edmonton by the five, end of five years, and with the bold long-term goal of a $300 million industry, and we believe that's possible. Our request to you today is to renew our existing funding from the city, combined with a modest increase over the next four years, primarily to recognize our increasing costs and to get moving on our new strategic plans. With your ongoing investment and support, we'll build what we've already started and take the next bold steps to put Edmonton on the map as a center of gravity for screen industries. 
the city's plans for the future see Edmonton's creativity as a light to the world. We couldn't agree more. And our work will make sure that light shines even more brightly right here in Edmonton and around the world. And now I'll hand it over to Tom to provide a, a, bit mo a few more details. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Tom. Can we restart uh, his time, please? And next slide, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, as Peggy said, this year we began implementing our new strategy. Um, it is to create a center of gravity around creativity, to connect it to the community, and then to connect it to the world, um, gather people, uh, 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 or to collaborate with people and gather them together to push it forward, and then fuel that, uh, with that momentum with investment. Um, over the past year, we've done several proof of concepts to figure out the things uh, that we need in terms of uh, investment in order to, uh, to push this uh, strategy forward. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, this year, we hired some amazing individuals, including Dorian Rowe. Uh, Dorian was the, or led the Newfoundland Film Commission uh, from uh, about our size uh, to about $165 million uh, industry. And so he has experience, direct experience, doing this, accomplishing this, working with the provincial government and implementing tax credits. Um, next slide, please. As part of our commitment to the industry, we ran several proof of concepts also to explore how to effectively create a thriving, cultured, and, and creative city um, with a strong sense of community. We hosted fantastic, uh, a fantastic BIPOC, uh, BIPOC accelerator, which provided wonderful opportunities for our local creatives uh, in our city and open up uh, opportunity for them. We uh, invested resources around several local festivals and conferences, uh, such as Edmonton Direct, Edmonton Film Festival, uh, IQ, which brought people, producers in from around the world to see our city, uh, Edmonton Short Film Festival, and others. Uh, we've also uh, provided regular events uh, and learning opportunities for, uh, and networking for our community in order to bring them together and uh, 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 give them the skills that they need to be successful. Our new funding will also allow us to continue to do these opportunities. Um, next slide, please. This year we also went out to the world and shared the Edmonton story. Uh, we had meetings and hosted key events uh, with decision makers and markets around the world for both film and interactive digital media. These industries are based on personal relationships. We cannot succeed in these industries without being face-to-face -face, uh, with the world. These events raised the profile of Edmonton. We also brought producers to Edmonton on familiarization tours or fam tours uh, to show off our great city. And I can tell you that there are people who have never considered Edmonton before that are considering it now. Our new funding will also support this travel and uh, promotion of our wonderful city and the local creatives that we have. Next slide, please. Um, we also collaborated on several important strategic documents that will guide our industry uh, in the city and the surrounding region. The labor market survey, the esports strategy, animation VFX strategy, and real green initiatives are just a few. Collaborating on these documents not only gives us great information in to, uh, to, to use to build these industries, but it, it builds strong relationships with other organizations, cities, um, and regions, uh, and shows our desire and commitment to building these industries. Next slide, please. We will continue to build and invest in local talent and creating opportunity, uh, increasing access to technology, supporting in innovation, and finding ways to add important resources to our community. Um, here's some of the, we'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that this has happened uh, uh, for us so far. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Last of Us was here uh, a year ago, and uh, this is an example of service production. They came with $3 million they spent in, in roughly four days of shooting here in town. Uh, 1.2 spent on events. We can, by building this industry, uh, when film comes to town, they don't want to use their own, they don't want to bring people, they want to use the local people. And the more that we invest in this industry, the more of that $3 million we get into directly into our economy. It's, there's uh, 250 people on that crew. Um, and that's 250 more jobs, more people that have homes, families, and livelihoods here. Um, next slide, please. The, uh, uh, another example is Northern Gateway Films. Northern Gateway is a local uh, production company that uh, went from uh, two years ago, we invested in their first uh, film. 
Uh, this year they did two, and then in the coming year they have six to eight on their slate. That'll be six to ten million dollars worth of production. This is a perfect example of what we can do to help build production and uh, sustainable and ongoing production in our city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Only by Midnight is a very similar example on the interactive digital media side. They are a gaming company that about uh, a year and a half, two years ago, we invested it also in, in their, uh, uh, the production of their game. This gave them uh, uh, key first time cr uh, producer credits or uh, a first game shipped, which dramatically changes the game for them. Now they're working on second games and getting opportunities to ship another game. Um, and so we, uh, with the service package, we're coming for our operational funding for the, uh, for the coming years. This is, a, uh, this is not just a, an additional ask, this is our full uh, service, or sorry, operational funding. And, and uh, thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you so much, Tom. So that concludes the people that were on number panel five. But before we go to questions uh, of panel members, I just want to see the people that we missed if they're here. Uh, I see Herb uh, Fluelling is here. So uh, is Monica Figure Figura joining us from Edmonton Youth for Climate? Can you please come down? You'll be number seven here. And Herb, should, you should be number four, but you can stay there where you are. Uh, and uh, uh, Shifraz, are you back? No. How about uh, Christian Futang? No, okay. We'll go to uh, Herb first. Go ahead, please. Good day, Mayor Sohi, city councillors, fellow citizens. <clears throat> My name is Herb Fluelling. I'm the technical chair of the Aquatic Council of Edmonton. I would like to speak to the proposal to eliminate the 35 meter by 25 meter deep pool at Lewis Farms. My subject is saving Edmonton lives. This pool is designed to accommodate the sports of diving, artistic swimming, and water polo. Because of the fact that the population of Edmonton has doubled since 1977, when our only such pool was built at the Kinsmith Sports Centre. Currently, these sports do not have enough training time. Research has shown that the probability of developing cancer, cardiovascular disease, or diabetes can be reduced by 80% if one lives a lifestyle including regular, vigorous exercise following a nutritious diet and not smoking. This is the lifestyle of an aquatic athlete. No longer supporting aquatic sport training in Edmonton goes against the core principles in the City of Edmonton vision and mission statement. There are over 10,000 new children entering elementary school each year in Edmonton. The ability, the ability to swim 25 meters is recognized as sufficient to prevent oneself from drowning should they fall into a water hazard. The Red Cross Level 4 badge requires the 25 meter swim. After not building a single city swimming pool for 29 years until 2011, the City of Edmonton pools plus YMCA and private pools can only provide 3,000 children who can pass the Level 4 badge each year. This means that 70% of the 10,000 children will drown should they fall into a water hazard. The current estimate of Edmontonians who do drown each year is 15. Many of these are adults at, at a later time in their life. The new Lewis Farms Aquatic Center design will bring the number of Edmonton elementary school age children who can swim 25 meters up to 50% of the population of children this age. The elimination of the 35 by 25 meter deep pool is not practical. The $58 million saving is not there. The delay needed to redesign the pool and building would be about nine months, and the design and architectural work would cost about $5 million. This plus an additional 6% inflation cost on building materials and labor will bring the $310 million sport complex to $33,900,000. With an interest rate increase over the next few months of 1.25% to 6.25%, this will bring the cost of the redesigned aquatic complex to about $1.6 million more than the unchanged current original design with an on-time start. 
Even if magically there was no delay or design cost, the $58 million saving mortgage over 20 years is only $4.5 million per year, or about one quarter of 1% of the residential tax levy, or $10 per average residence per year. Finally, diving cannot survive without doubling their available training time, including 7.5 and 10 point and 10 point and 10 meter diving platforms. Platform diving represents half of the events in major diving competitions. We have a diver currently at the World Junior Championship diving representing, and she's the best in Canada. She represents Edmonton, and that's happening right now, a platform diver. As well, every time the Kinsman diving pool shuts down for maintenance, diving training stops. Every major city in Canada except one has at least two and up to four diving training centers. The Kinsman Sports Center is scheduled for a major refit where the diving pool would be shut down for more than one year, with, which will end up displacing our Olympic diver program completely. We'll have coaches leaving, divers leaving, and we'll never get started again. Although, the average per capita income in Edmonton is highest in, in all of Canada. Edmonton's tax rate is about average among Canadian city, cities. The city of Edmonton has just announced a $68 million surplus for 2022. An Ipsos Reid poll commissioned by ACE found that 81% of citizens would pay $4 per capita per year to upgrade new aquatic facilities to international standards in Edmonton. This adjusted for the time the poll was done equals the $4.5 million per year needed to build the deep pool for diving, artistic swimming, and water polo. In summary, by eliminating the 35 by 25 meter deep pool, no tax saving. We are uh, placing Edmonton children at risk of drowning. The numbers of aquatic athletic health style citizens will be reduced and the former Olympic diver producing sport will disappear in Edmonton. There are two bottom lines here. One, eliminating the deep pool will not save any money. Two, not building the full aquatic complex means the inability to serve the next generation of potential aquatic athletes with double our population. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will go to... There we go. Monica, nice to see you. Please go ahead. Good morning, Mayor, Sa Mayor Sohi and City Councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today on behalf of Edmonton Youth for Climate. My name is Monica Figueroa. I'm 19 years old. I'm a third year undergraduate student at the University of Alberta, and this is the third year I've interrupted a day of my education to hold you accountable for my future. Last time I was here, you all reassured me that climate action was your priority, but I'm frankly shocked and disappointed at the lack of funding for climate action in this new budget, and I'd like you to take it a little bit more seriously. Climate change matters to me because the future of all living beings on this planet depends on what we do or don't do right now. At least 10,000 species go extinct every year due to climate change. That's more than one every hour. Millions of people are being displaced due to climate-related impacts. Wildfires, droughts, and floods are becoming more pervasive and intense, affecting the most vulnerable people around the world. I'm scared of what kind of world I'm going to live in when I'm older. And I'm scared of what kind of world my children and grandchildren are going to have to live in. Climate change must sound distant to you, like it's happening in some faraway place, another country, another time, another people. Other more immediate issues require your attention and political will, like funding the new LRT lines or fixing the high-level bridge. The high-level bridge, by the way, requires repairs because we don't want it to collapse and fall. But let me break it to you. If we don't take action on climate change right now, our entire society is going to collapse and fall. Last summer, Edmonton Youth for Climate took the problem into our own hands and organized an art exhibition where Edmontonians could express their thoughts and feelings on climate change. Mayor Sohi, Councillor Wright, Councillor Salvador, and Councillor Tang attended the event. We wanted to raise awareness on what climate action matters to Edmontonians and show it to all of you so you could make decisions in council accordingly. The exhibition was later displayed for the month of October here at City Council. I want to take a few seconds from my presentation to read you a poem a few of us wrote for the exhibition. It is titled Climate Change. Heat dome, worried. I feel scared. I feel angry. 
I feel confused. The smell of the wildfire stirred me. The terror that has settled into my chest. Sky is orange. Air is thick. Hot days are scary. It makes me mad that we knew it coming 30, 40, 50 years ago. While the world is in ruins, I am comfortable. Climate change matters to Edmontonians, and it should matter to you too. Some of the actions outlined in the Edmonton Energy Transition Strategy that you're not currently funding, and that you have the power to fund and implement right now in the upcoming weeks, are the comprehensive bike plane, nature-based so climate solutions, and e-bus infrastructure and expansion. The city could raise revenue to implement these plans through various tactics, such as a ca carbon levy, as they do in Vancouver, a raise in property taxes, as done in Halifax, or implementing transport pricing, as done in New York, London, and Oslo. I dream of a better future for Edmonton, one where I can commute everywhere I need to go on my bike, one where communities in every neighborhood can grow their own food and are energy sufficient, one where the buildings in which I live and play and study and work and live don't emit thousands of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, one where we can take care of each other, the land, and the species that surround us. In a few weeks, you will get to vote on what kind of Edmonton my generation will live in. Make your actions reflect your words. It might be easy to talk the talk and climb it, but it is about time to start walking the walk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. I'll check once again before we go to questions if Shafaraz Kaba is joining us and if Chris Christian Fortang is joining us. No? Okay. All well, questions, colleagues. All right. Just give us a few seconds. Can we clear the... Rama, can we clear the deck, please? Here we go. All right. Questions. All right, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Salhi. Um, thank you all for your presentation. So my first question is going to Mia Clogry. So I don't know if Mia is here. I don't think, I don't see her name on this uh, is a number Maya. two. Number, oh, Maya. Maya, Maya, Maya? sorry okay, yeah. for my yeah. pronunciation. Yeah. Maya, uh, from the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. Yes. Uh, um, I don't think, I don't see Maya online. No, but uh, maybe I, let's see if anyone else is here from the Energy Transition. Uh, Peter M. Rongen is here from that same committee. If maybe you want to ask him, Peter, this same question. Uh, I, I could, but I know Peter is here too. P Peter, are you there? Peter M. Rongen? No. Nope. Yeah. <coughs> okay, then, then I move to yeah. uh, my next question, next question, and to Mr. Uh, Sangre Chris. Um, and specifically related to the five um, focus area you specific talk about how our city should be focused and, and to create that business friendly environment and then for the budget. Um, so what is specific the challenge in right now in our business community and in Edmonton and how this budget could reflect to address that challenge? Well, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, we specifically have not gone into any specific areas, but what I can say is that businesses over the last couple of years have had a very, very challenging time and have had to make very challenging uh, decisions regarding their businesses, their customers, and so forth. So in terms of, in terms of um, opportunities, the, the ask is given 
the increase in or the proposed increase in the budget for the status quo, are there difficult decisions that uh, administration and council can make? Meanwhile, if I look at one of the key tenants in our coat of arms here, one being progress, we've got to do better. It's been referenced previously how competitive investment attraction is. We've got to be not only uh, uh, competitive, but we need to be attractive. So any opportunity for us to optimize the budget, we should look at those. Okay, so, and also you mentioned some flexibility budget. Can you, can you explain that more a little bit and how that could be reflected in our budget deliberations? Yeah, in my remarks yesterday, Councillor, yeah. I, I referenced that perhaps there are certain things that could be treated as a priority, now other things being deferred or look for opportunities for cost avoidance. Certainly right now, uh, emergency crisis funding, walking over here from our office, the temperatures are cold. Are there opportunities for us to focus, you know, uh, on more crisis funding right now versus, um, you know, things that are not necessarily going to be built for a while? So there are issues for the here and now. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, my next question going to Mr. Tom Veneka. So hopefully I pronounce your last name right. Um, so specifically, uh, would like to talk about um, screen and film industrial uh, development in our city. And then, can you help me understand what is the role and for the province to play in this industrial development? The role for the, the yeah, province? For this, yeah. Uh, so the, 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 one of the big roles for the province is the tax credits. And so on the film and TV side, we have a tax credit in place. They're, they're you know, strategic investments. And so we, we intend uh, and we're, uh, you know, we, uh, Dorian Rowe, that's one of the, the benefits of Dorian is he's gone to, worked with the, his province uh, in the past on getting some of these strategic investments into the, into the industry. And so we'd like to, we will be working on that as well, uh, connecting with the province and, and, and getting uh, funding to do uh, some uh, infrastructure and strategic investments. Thank you, and uh, my time is out, even though I have more yeah. questions. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Rice, Councillor Nack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi, and again, thanks to everyone for taking time and, and being with us. Um, Ms., Mr. Vinica or, or Ms. Garrity, whoever wants to answer. Um, I just want to get a sense, I, I know essentially the way this budget is written, if, if nothing changes, you, you cease to exist upon the end, at the end of December, which is a odd uh, situation uh, and one we will hopefully address. Um, I want to get a sense of, uh, I know Calgary's film and TV industry is, is obviously really booming and they're seeing a lot there. Uh, do you have a sense of how much they invest in, in their city for that kind of work? I mean, which is now turned into a I mean, a massive industry for that for that city and for that region. Um, in terms of like a specific dollar, I I don't because of the nature of Calgary economic development. There's it's uh it, you know there's different departments. It's not it's not one budget that they would allocate specifically to it. But I can say that um, two things. One, it's it's a time. It takes time. And so for the last uh, 16 years, I, th I believe. Uh, They've had a film commissioner there that's been very, uh, very active and worked very hard to build that. And so they've had deliberate investment, um, you know, a, a, in a similar way to, uh, to our office down there for 16 years to build that industry. And so it, it does, it takes some time um, and it takes uh, um, a concerted effort and fuel. They, uh, I, it's not just the the people that are on the ground, but it's also the attraction. I mean, they bring in uh, producers and 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 show them what Calgary can do, and and uh, and so I, the same thing in Manitoba. Um, you know, I talked to the film commissioner there that built that industry, and uh, you know, it's it's the people that are there on the ground working. Uh, with a, a very deliberate attitude of building it, but then also going out and bringing, you know, dragging people in and saying, hey, this is our awesome city. This is what we have and this is what we can do. And so, uh, and then advocation, uh, advocating as well. So there's, there's, uh, 
Um, hope, hopefully, that kind of gives so you a bit of a sense of the we're, we're trying to follow a similar. We've started later than, than yep. Calgary, clearly. Yep. And we're not necessarily trying to copy them one for one. We're, we're looking at, uh, we're doing more maybe in the interactive media side than maybe they are, as an example. But yep. we, we can take things that they've done and if, as, assuming we continue and then potentially provide that additional funding, can sort of continue that snowball effect. That's really what you're going for, is that right? Correct, yeah, we, we need to be Edmonton. That's, we yeah. need to be who we are, um, but the model is the same, underlying model is that you have to have a very intentional work to make it happen. You have to have a great team to do it and, um, and, and, and then selling who you are and what you can deliver. Yeah, and, and I think the last comment is, you know, knowing how Calgary's done on the film and TV side and, and how big that industry has become, I mean, not only if we can even just get some of that spillover effect, but from the interactive side, it is an industry that, I mean, far surpasses film and TV now at this stage. And so there, it's, it's not like there's not a lot of potential to continue to grow uh, the financial benefit to the city, correct? That's correct. Yeah, both interactive and film and TV are industries that are booming right now. They're creative industries, and frankly, um, you know, this is the philosophy of Tom, but the creative industries are the things that we will, uh, that will be the most resilient industries for us. AI will take the other thinking yeah. jobs, and, uh, you know, the hydraulic ram took the working jobs, but this, this is what we have as humans, is to offer the world is creativity, and it's the most scalable thing that we can do. We don't need pipelines, we don't need anything else to ship it out, it goes straight out to the world. Uh, it's, yeah. Appreciate that. My last question, uh, either for Miss Anderson or, or Mr. Sunquist, uh, maybe I'll go Miss Anderson because you already got one. To, uh, uh, you know, you you provided that that feedback around the, the focus on core services and not not entering into the other jurisdictions, which which I continue to want to not do, <laughs> right? I, I I don't want to continue to fill in the gaps on things like housing. And yet, at the same time, we're, we're deal dealing with very severe consequences of, of inaction uh, or, or a lack of meaningful action. And so, looking for advice, I, and I know you know the chamber's been advocating. Like, I mean, I know we're all aligned in the advocacy to the order of government responsible for this. But I'm curious as to your thought around, you know, do we do we continue to sort of go to continue to do the work we need to do to help people in the interim, or or would it be the preference to say, no, we're going to stop? You know, and there are serious consequences of that inaction, and we'll just push hard on the province to fill in the gap, or to actually do what they need to do. And I know it's a tough question, but I just want to get your advice. The toughest question, yeah. uh, and it's it's really up to council to weigh that. Um, I guess the advice I would provide is that any gaps that are filled, of course, fill gaps, but they'll leave those gaps to remain. So the ultimate thing that needs to be done is that every order of government that has the responsibility for certain tasks needs to take that on and orders of government that do not have income redistribution power such as the municipal government should not be forced or compelled into that um, line of business thanks i'm, I'm out of time appreciate okay. it thank you constant that constant uh thank you mayor sohi um thank you to everyone who has come out uh today again um and I'll start with uh, Nick, Nick Lilly. Uh, I know this can be a pretty drawn out conversation, so if you can just give me a sense, that'll be really helpful. I'm curious about what kind of conversations you've had with the provincial government in terms of the COPTA program, the community organization property exemption regulation. Yeah, thanks for the question, Councillor. Uh, to be uh, direct about home ed specific engagement, it's been fairly limited at this point. Um, I know there are a lot of providers who are engaging in associations that are engaging on that, but there's been a significant turn within that ministry of late. And so I think that is something that we'll continue to look to do uh, in the years, I'm sorry, or months ahead. Okay, that's, uh, that's still helpful to know that, that you've had some, but, but, but limited. Um, yes, I wanted to... Uh, I have a bunch of questions for Peggy and Tom, but maybe I'll just direct it to Tom. Um, so the province also just released their eSports strategy. Um, do you foresee that strategy coming with any funding that could benefit your office potentially, given the alignment? So that uh, strategy was a collaboration between our office and uh, the other local uh, ABCs. 
uh, and calorie economic development. And so uh, we want to use that funding to, uh, sorry, that strategy to activate funding, uh, whether it's from the province or from other sources, uh, uh, private sources as well. Um, and so that, that was kind of the intent of that is to give a, um, give the industry a roadmap or to see the opportunity okay. and then and then be able to activate dollars. Um, and, I, and I think I didn't realize this before, but your operating funding is not embedded in the base budget this time. That's, yeah, and, that's correct. And so what have you been getting annually from the city? Uh, the most recent, uh, or, yeah, this past year was 1.2. Was our was our grant from the city? And how have you been leveraging those dollars uh, for for other funding? Uh, for other operational funding? Yeah. Um, or is that your only source? That is our primary source. We have been able to uh, access some grants from uh, the uh, from the province and uh, you know, from the feds, uh, depending on like you know, uh, kind of at an ad hoc basis. We haven't. There's not a ongoing. I see. Play. And. Um, if your office is no longer around, because you also have a fund specifically, who's going to take over that? Um, so it's just going to be left yeah. in the air? That would, that would revert to, uh, to get to the city. It would, it would be okay. up to you, the city to decide what would have to happen with that. But nobody, I mean, to answer your question, no one would be uh, running that. Right. Um, and uh, have what has been the conversation been like around self-sustainability of your office and and or has you know city funding always been part of the picture? Uh, so yeah, that's an important question. There's uh, um, these offices around the world. Film commissions are always funded by um, you know the, a government entity of some sort. Whether it's the um, you know in, in most cases it's the city that funds that. Uh, you know small countries um, or small provinces uh, might be a slightly different situation, but um, that's always uh, it's funded by the government, and so there's not. There's not a model for self-sufficiency in, in that regard. Okay. Um, and finally, do you, do you ever worry about your mandate being too broad and in danger of lacking focus? Uh, so over the last year and a half uh, since I've been here, that was one of the things that we focused on was we wanted to make sure that we um, understood exactly where the need was in these industries and we have refined that focus down. Um, I actually owned a, um, a virtual reality and IDM business before this, and we had well, two businesses, and one of those fits into our world and one of them doesn't. Uh, now, I think originally the, the both of those would have fit into our into the uh, ESIO's world. So we are working to try to refine that and make sure that it's that we have a clear path. We understand the need that we that exists and that we can solve it. Okay, thank you. And my last question is to Dale. Um, I understand our city has a three-person wildlife team that you intersect with quite a, quite a bit. Um, I'm curious, do you feel the volume of um, need that you're seeing on the, you know, on the ground literally every day with animals? Uh, are you feeling the impact of climate change? Uh, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, we've been around since 1989, so we've seen a lot of changes uh, in patterns with uh, wildlife in terms of the types and quantity of wildlife, so we, the wildlife that we admit to our wildlife hospital. Um, climate change uh, has uh, impacted us to some degree. Um, chiefly right now, we're dealing with a, uh, an avian influenza outbreak. Um, climate change has affected uh, migratory bird patterns in terms of when they're migrating. Uh, that time has changed as the climate has, has warmed. Um, birds are staying uh, longer before they head south uh, at uh, about uh, uh, a few days every decade. Great, great. That, that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I would uh, really humbly ask council members if they could leave probably 30 seconds at the end of their five minutes to uh, answer questions to the uh, to the panelists. So we remain within five minutes. Really, would really appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks again to all of our speakers for being here. I uh, <laughs> I'm going to go back to Edmonton Screen Industries uh, just for for one final piece of clarification. So. Uh, you have been receiving around 1.2 annually from the city. What is the, if you were to break out the amount for the base that you're asking for now versus that modest increase, can you just spell that out for me? It was unclear, sorry. In terms of the use of funds for that? Uh, it, in terms of the exact amount, yeah. Uh, 300, uh, 300 is the increase, uh, and that includes an accommodation for uh, inflation okay. you know, on our current funding as well as uh, some of the, the, those uh, proof of concepts that we talked about. Okay. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, and then, 
is is Harrison Moore still with us? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. I see. Um, yeah. So thanks for being with us, Harrison. Really, really thought your presentation was was quite interesting and. Um, hearing your perspective as a, a doctor at the U of A, uh, I feel like we don't often get that sort of public health perspective uh, when it comes to, to safe mobility. Um, what are you seeing in your line of work as a result of our, our lack of safe infrastructure? Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, so my work now, um, I work as a palliative care physician now, so I'm not as much on the front lines anymore. I used to do emergency work for early, um, but I, of course, have a number of colleagues who do work in the emergency rooms as uh, orthopedic surgery friends. And my one friend is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and it's, you hear it, you know, commonly about, um, especially, you know, young people, what's going to bring them to the ER, what's the major source of injury, um, you know, it's accident, accidents are a major one, um, so that's you look at you know traffic accidents be they pedestrians or cyclists um, and one of the studies i referenced there it's actually shown that building um, physical bike infrastructure improves road safety for all road users including pedestrians they've showed that having that physical infrastructure built out it actually leads to slower traffic speeds more careful driving so fewer collisions and collisions happening at lower speeds too um, so we know how big an impact, um, you know, a motor vehicle accident can have on a person, how much it can affect their lives and in, in tragic cases and, you know, end a person's life. Um, so it's, we know in terms of, you know, how you can really change a person's life, preventing these, these sort of injuries, you know, it never makes it, never makes the news, you know, the bad accident that didn't happen, but we know on, you know, healthcare level and on a person level, preventing these injuries, is, it's immensely important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that answer. Um, and maybe just with the remaining time I have, uh, is Juliana Weber still with us online? Okay, great. Um, yeah, just first of all, thanks, Juliana, Monica, uh, Jay, for, for being with us from uh, Edmonton Youth for Climate. Uh, I really value the perspective that you brought. I wanted to ask, you know, yesterday um, we heard some answers to questions around climate that there are huge economic benefits that can come with that. Um, but Juliana, can you, can you speak to the intersection of climate and equity? You, you briefly mentioned that during your presentation, but um, just looking for a little bit of elaboration, what exactly you meant there? Sorry. Oh, we cannot uh, hear you. Can't hear oh. you. Okay, wait. Go ahead. I Go ahead now. Um, so basically, like with equity, climate change is there's a lot of research that it's going to impact um, people who are marginalized. So that's like racialized people, uh, poor people um, and young people the most. So like if we look at internationally, southern or like uh, global south city or countries uh, such as like um, I think in Africa, there are some countries that are experiencing really bad droughts. And then earlier we know in Pakistan, there's like horrible floods. So these people are already in, uh, facing the impacts and um, having money is a way that people can cope with this. So uh, a lot of these people can't. And then in regards to our city, um, the same sort of thing will happen. So people such as houseless people, they will be impacted worse because heat waves, they won't have a place to go to get out of the heat. Um, and then also being able to get around the city. Like if you can't afford a car, uh, or don't want to drive or aren't old enough to drive. It's hard to get around. And so um, improving these services that help the most affected people um, will be beneficial for everyone in regards to equity. Uh, I hope that helped. That does. Thank you so much for that answer. I'm out of time. Thank you, Council Salvador. Councilor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Tanya the Riviere's on the line, is she not? I am, yes. Oh, hi. hi. Um, so you'd mentioned yesterday about um, the accessible housing um, isn't adequate enough. Um, from, from your review of the material in that, I think you'd mentioned to me that the, um, there is an acknowledgement, though, that we do need to do more. Um, and I'm just wondering um, if what's being proposed in some of the unfunded service packages does do enough for accessible housing. 
No, we don't believe it does. Uh, first, and I think in order for there to be change, there needs to be um, a will to build accessible housing. Um, ideally, we think there should be a coordinated effort by all levels of government. Uh, there could be value for municipalities and provinces to put pressure on federal government uh, to develop accessibility standards. Um, and maybe an example that's more tan local and tangible that could help uh, build more accessible housing is to mandate that in order for developers to be approved for a development permit, the dwelling needs to be visitable. This means a no-step entrance, wider doorways, and a bedroom and bathroom on the main floor. There's no extra cost for the developers to build visitable if it's born visitable. So we know there are barriers and uh, inequities to housing, um, but it's also important to take a step backwards and realize that today we are intentionally building barriers and inequity into our city and housing market. Every time a single family dwelling has the front step entrance, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, we know that there, uh, is a need to um, develop a process to decision making. Um, but we think there could be a greater value put on the voices uh, for those who are speaking to inform the data and not just value and act upon the statistical data alone. In this package, they um, it speaks mainly to affordable housing, um, but not accessible housing with the exception of the stat in there that expressed the, the need for it. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that uh, comment, Ben. Um, and uh, Gemma Dunn, are you on the line? I think you are. Yeah. Hi. You had um, um, talked about the CIOG um, should sort of keep pace with inflation. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, are you suggesting then that the, the amount of the grants should be increased or, or um, because I think you were talking about having an, ex, what is it, 4.1 million, I think you'd mentioned, or should it, should the amount of the grants be increased or should more uh, organizations be um, able to access the grant? The grant should be increased. So if we're keeping in line with inflation, then that allows organizations who already receive this funding to respond to the inflationary costs that they're dealing with on a daily basis. So instead of the max 16.5, then what would you recommend? Well, then, it w I mean, administration would have to look at that, but okay. we are recommending a 14.69% increase okay. um, based off StatsCan data and population growth. So um, because the last increase for CIOG was back in 2018, and that was just a 2% increase into the, the pot. And it didn't see any um, increases in the actual amounts that organisations were able to achieve. So I, I would say the administration would have to look at that, but it should be somewhere in line with current lines of inflation, so 6.9%, something like that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And my final question uh, for Mr. Vinica. Um, I was just interested in the post-secondary partnerships. Um, and I think the provincial government is also doing something um, with, with bursaries in that. I'm just wondering, what are you looking at for partnerships with the post-secondaries? Uh, yes, we, ha we have been having conversations with uh, post-secondaries like Norquest. Uh, recently, uh, I was talking with uh, McEwen as well. And, and um, really, all of them, it's, uh, we want to build a strong link in developing uh, the um, uh, the talent in these industries, and so that uh, the, I mean, post secondaries are uh, are an important part of that. Um, in, in in our plans coming forward too, um, we have we have plans around again around developing the infrastructure and, and people in the in the industry, and we and a partnership with with a post secondary of, um, of one or the other is is uh, super important in that plan. So a sort of a dedicated program. Oops, I'm out of time. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Jans. Thank you. Um, if I may go to um, uh, guest Anderson from UDI. Um, so I was thinking about what you were saying about productive investments. And as I read it, one of the most productive investments we can make is active transportation when it comes to our transportation systems. And I was, I, I was wondering if you could elaborate, has... UDI weighed in in the past in mode shift and around uh, 
uh, public transportation and uh, buses or LRT or say some of the potential for BRT or just in general about active transportation, walkability, et cetera. Pretty wide thank berth. So I'd like to hear your comment. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for that question, Councillor. Investments in mobility, um, whether it's for freight, for active uh, modes, or for commuting, for walking, any of that investment is a city shaper. So when you're thinking about how to build the city, how we move and how we grow and how we live are completely intertwined. So when you're thinking about areas where you can have direct impact on the economic prosperity and livability of the city, um, I would strongly encourage that you dive really deeply uh, into the transportation opportunities that you have um, across all sectors of the city in terms of spaces and across all types. And also consider emerging technologies, whether they're micro mobility options or um, new ways of getting around, um, autonomous, otherwise. Think about it all, because the way that you shape the city is through the way that we move. Has UDI done any, I, I, I think I, a UDI cousin in Ontario did a, uh, a study on lost productivity due to time and traffic. Um, and uh, it was in the billions. Like, I, I, would, I think it was like $20 billion. It was some enormous number. Um, has, uh, has UDI weighed in on, on that at all? And, and I'll go to the chamber on this comment too. Sure, we have not done a study. The short answer is no to the study, but absolutely yes to the, the, the studies done elsewhere in terms of lost productivity. I would also add that that lost productivity hurts those in the lowest income the most. Um, often people who have to travel the furthest lengths on the least affordable or the most affordable types of transportation are the most impacted. Right. And if I may, if I may go to the guest from the chamber, uh, uh, guest Sunquist, if you could elaborate on that just about, you know, as we're looking at a third of our budget going to going towards transportation type initiatives, um, where are the priorities the Chamber would like to see us invest? Well, I think uh, good collaboration uh, across the region is, is, is important. I think driving efficiencies in transportation is, is good. Uh, I'd, I'd echo Kaylin's comments on uh, the impacts of, um, of uh, the economic impacts to, the, to um, uh, different citizens in the, in the region. Uh, but priorities, the, the ease uh, and the efficiency of moving people and goods is paramount and is one of the key elements that makes uh, a, a municipality attractive and, uh, and having affordable, safe transit is, uh, is critical. Have you been involved with the Alberta's Calling campaign from the province of Alberta? We have not. Okay, yeah, the, the gist of what I saw in the ads is they're really trying to make the case that we have a labor shortage in Alberta, especially around certain skilled technical labor um, and as we're trying to attract those kinds of individuals to Edmonton and boost the economy, um, do we have any sort of a market analysis of like what mid, mid, mid to high software engineers and video games are looking for in terms of a place to raise a family and quality of life? Yeah, certainly the, the chamber has uh, uh, been engaged in, in those types of things. In terms of specific things, you look at the core uh, industries that uh, are um, uniquely uh, suitable for Edmonton, whether it's uh, the Edmonton region, whether it's uh, the new efforts around hydrogen, uh, IT, uh, health sciences, advanced manufacturing, uh, et cetera. Uh, being able to attract and retain people here is largely dependent on transit and transportation. So the importance of having a healthy economy relies on having a healthy airport. So all of these things, to Kaylin's point, are all intertwined. And, and I would like to just verify or correct a, a comment that provincial thing, we have been involved in that in, to, a, to a small degree. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, uh, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a quick question for Mr. Fluelling. Um, one of the things that you talked a lot about, I think, was the role that swimming plays um, in the life, it, it, as a lifelong skill. If you, as a young person, don't learn to swim before age 12, age 18, what's the likelihood that an uh, individual will um, learn that skill as an adult? If you wouldn't mind turning on your mic, thanks. It's, it's less likely. I mean, some countries, you can't get out of elementary school unless you have passed the level four. 
Italy, for example. Mm -hmm. And th that's what they believe is important. And uh, of course, those kids that get involved in competitive sport, uh, they'll stay in it for the rest of their life. I'm a competitive diver. I, can, I train twice a week. I also drive uh, sports cars. I work 60 hours a week and I'm a full-time coach. And uh, I'm 86 and I'm gonna be around for another 20 years. And that's an example, but wouldn't you like to have that? The other thing is, from a point of view of attracting people to come here, which I just heard, if you don't provide the things for the parents to come here, they're gonna ask for a higher salary, and that's not attractive. So that's my thoughts on that. Well, not just that, but you need to bring the whole family, right? It's not just the, the candidate, it's the, the family too. Right, Mr. Sundquist? Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I did have a question for you, um, and that was with respect to, um, uh, you know, I think your overall feedback on the budget. What would you have liked to see done differently? Well, I, I think it's important to note that we are not asking for zero, so let's be level set on that. Uh, we certainly understand the, the inflationary pressures and the difficult deliberations you'll be going through. But I think one of the key elements uh, you know, when we were facing potentially a 16% increase over four years is priority-based budgeting or zero-based budgeting. Let's pull things back by department and rebuild it based on identified priorities. Um, and, and I've heard that from a few people as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Anderson, um, you're online. Uh, I'll ask you um, what are, I think you had some really good sort of, I'm gonna say strategic direction in terms of what we should be looking at in this budget. Um, what are some tangible examples where you think we could do better or maybe trade off priorities? Well, I think I, I'm gonna echo my colleague, Mr. Sanquist here by saying that there are no easy answers in a $3.5 billion operating budget and $7.5 billion capital profile. But I would note that over the years, things are added, whether they're programs, their services, they are um, different priorities. And it's a lot harder uh, to start you know, pairing things back. So I do think it might be time, given the new environment that we're living in, instead of simply accepting that we're moving the past forward and adding on to actually take things back down um, to the basics to analyze what you would like to accomplish, what resources you have, and what trade-offs that you would like to make. Because I think that's why Edmontonians have, have elected you as a council is to really reflect those priorities and to be to be courageous to ask those tough questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, th that's all for my questions. Thank you, Councillor uh, Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, thank you so much. Um, my question is to Mr. Sunquist. Because I was a bit confused by one of your answers about, you know, investing in the crisis. Um, because then you, you, when you originally did your five-minute presentation, you talked about the city needs to focus on core, core service. So can you, can you square that with me? Because a lot of the crisis we're experiencing, especially in the downtown core, is related to mental health, addictions those kind of things. So how, how can you square that for me, just so I can better understand? Yeah, thank you, Councillor, for the question. And I, what I meant by that was I think there's a great opportunity for us to, as a, as a Chamber of Commerce representing business, to help uh, your build and strengthen the relationship with the province to build those bridges. Those things are gonna take some time, mm -hmm. but I think we can help play a part in that. Um, more specifically, uh, there are acute uh, needs right now, crisis uh, things, but there could, there will be a need for trade-offs. So I'm not saying spend more, I'm saying reallocate. Okay. And then another thing I was curious about is because when we talk about like getting down to core services, I think about some of the, like there's a lot of grants that we provide to businesses, which some would say are not really within that core mandate of the Municipal Government Act. Thoughts on that? Uh, can you provide a specific uh, well, example? Well, one that just comes to mind is the grant for the single-use item bylaw that was provided. Another one is the grant that's one of the unfunded service. Is it unfunded or funded? I can't remember. Service packages related specifically to um, business support for small for business for business. I'll speak to the uh, your your first point on the single-use uh, transition. Obviously. Businesses, particularly small businesses, have been impacted by 
the last couple of years and, and everything that we've lived through. And my understanding is those, those grants were for uh, a, a, an opportunity to drive two things. One, to stay on, on task on single, single use items, but to also help fund transition. The burdens b business have are employers they've had. Uh, they just needed a, a, a hand up. Yeah, I, I, get, I get that. I'm not saying that this isn't a merit conversation, but I'm, I'm again trying to like take to heart your comment about core services. Mm -hmm. And if, if we're going to say we need to focus on our core services, then some things that I would consider not core would be things that we do to prop up the business sector. So that's where I'm coming from. I would say that uh, there could have been uh, no need for the grant if you provided a little more runway for businesses to transition. So it comes down to comes down to balance between your timelines on transition uh, and the impact on business. Thank you. And then my last question is to Tanya with the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, I really. Uh, enjoyed your comment uh, and I think about housing we often focus on affordability but we forget about the other factors that go into core housing need like appropriate housing um, and I wanted to know has the accessibility advisory committee been engaged at all in the new housing strategy that's in the works that's supposed to be coming back in 2023 to council are you talking about the affordable housing the affordable yeah, well, it's talking about core housing need within that strategy and how we address core housing need because the presentation showed that 49,000 residents in Edmonton are going to be in core housing need, for example, and that included safe, affordable, and appropriate. So I just wanted to know if, if I, I can, I, I just wanted to know if, if you've had conversations with administration about accessibility's involvement in thinking about that accessibility and that appropriate factor around our housing strategy. We have had a lot of conversations with housing, but uh, I don't believe we've um, contributed it to that specific strategy as of yet. Okay, perfect. Well, I, I will follow up with the administration on that one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Cartmel. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, thanks to everyone for the presentations today. Um, I, too, am going to pick on Mr. Lundquist a little bit. We've this is the fifth panel now, and uh, and we've heard all kinds of submissions, that all worthy, all all have merit, all looking for some amount of support. All well, not all, but many that are trying to support people that are finding their way here, and and we're in this odd, I would say, my word, process where we're trying to solve all of this in the better part of two weeks. And you mentioned a couple of processes, a couple of, of budgeting processes or, or trade-off processes, one being zero-based budgeting, the other being priority-based budgeting. And both of those have been tried by city administration. I guess, first of all, are you familiar with, uh, that, or, or did you know that we've tried both of those processes at some point in the past? My understanding, Councillor, uh, and thank you for the question, is that it has been in discussion uh, at this table. Uh, and it's and we talked about priority based budgeting or prioritized based budgeting over the last couple of years but it's my understanding uh, and I'm, I'm checking this with you that uh, typically uh, there's more involvement with council in that process it's not necessarily just left to administration to do that prioritization but there's a more of an interactive process not sure if you share that understanding or not but well, as elected officials, it would make sense to me that uh, you're representing your constituents and their priorities. So I think that would be a collaborative uh, effort with management. We've tried some of these things in the past where, where council has simply issued an edict to, to, and most recently a couple of years ago with the Reimagine project, which was to say administration, figure it out, bring us back a savings of X, and then for whatever reason or through whatever process, uh, less palatable choices are provided to council. And that doesn't really work either, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, councillor, I don't want to dive into the administration uh, or guidance from uh, elected leaders, uh, so I would defer to uh, council on how you would want to engage with, uh, with uh, uh, administration. 
So on the zero-based budgeting process, that's a, that's a clean slate process, essentially start from scratch, clean right. sheet of paper. Um, are you aware of a process that uh, would essentially be a line-by-line -line examination of, of all of the lines of service that, that uh, the administration provides? You know, that, and you know, it was essentially a, a, an ongoing review process that talks to what is spent, how many resources are employed, what, what uh, outcomes are gained from those resources. Uh, are you familiar with the process and, and whether a process like that has been undertaken in other jurisdictions? Well, I would think that would be in the normal course of, of budgeting. There's going to be the, the core businesses, things like waste uh, management, uh, things like um, uh, transportation uh, and infrastructure maintenance. Those things are, are, are core to the administration. Um, but having, having the opportunity to uh, dial back and uh, look at each line item and the value for every dollar spend that should be done as the, uh, you know, on the normal course of, um, uh, of uh, budgeting and business and uh, taking into uh, uh, effect things like inflation and uh, the cost of delivery and so forth. But perhaps for more than two weeks, once every four years. I would leave that to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, it's my understanding that um, the chamber, the, the Chamber of Commerce, the, the members that guide it, uh, all come from industry. There's no city involvement in that. The city doesn't appoint a board. They don't appoint you. Uh, and similar for some of the other organizations in the city. Is that fair to say? That is correct. Uh, do you think there's a role for effectively external agencies like that, that that are not tied to city administration, that are not appointed by council to uh, participate in a conversation that would be an examination, like a, a, a thorough, in-depth uh, deliberate, not time-constrained examination of the city budget? Uh, I think that could be worthwhile. Uh, the the um, benefit of, a, of my role uh, and the fact that we don't receive civic dollars, it, it allows us to have thoughtful debate at these types of forums. And, um, and so I think any opportunity where we can represent the interests of um, represent the interests of the business community, uh, we can provide uh, a very um, a very uh, clear and unbiased view based on the feedback that we get from our membership in the broader business community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Wright, can you take the chair, please? Yeah. I have the chair. Yeah. So, Mr. Sunquest, first of all, I, I want to convey my uh, thank you to you for uh, assisting us in the advocacy that we are doing to the to the province. Really appreciate that on social issues. I want to acknowledge acknowledge that. Just want to follow up on Councillor Cartmel's line of questioning, um, digging deeper into uh, into the budget. Maybe two week process is not the sufficient process, but uh, our administration does look for efficiencies, and uh, and uh, one indication of that is the the surplus that uh, has been garnered part of 2022 budget, which will amount to close to $67 million, right? So that's one effort that they do. But I agree with you, and uh, this is something that we have to figure out with the administration. We do need to conduct more deeper dive into, uh, into the budget on a, on, a, on a regular, maybe more structured way than just two week process. So I agree with you and we will have to figure out a process with the administration on that because we have to reprioritize within the, uh, within the existing dollars investing on climate change, housing and other, other needs. So I agree with you on that, I want to do. But I do have a specific question for you on the economic growth. Uh, there are a couple of proposals from administration unfunded. One is the creation of the innovation fund to foster innovation and create jobs and help businesses grow. The other one is the opening up industrial land uh, for, uh, for opportunities within the city. Uh, you know, big industrial parcels of land or small ones. Just want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, would, would you be supportive of those kind of ideas to help spur economic growth and business growth? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on, the, on the first question relating to the Innovation Fund, the first thing that I would 
would look to is, is this a duplication of effort? Are there other sources of yeah. funds uh, av uh, available provincially, federally, et cetera? Yeah. Um, there have certainly been situations where we fragmented resources and not really had the commercialization outputs that, uh, that, we, would, that we would like. So that would be, I guess, the, the, the first question. And just a question of clarification on the industrial lands. Um, are you looking at monetizing those surplus industrial lands, uh, monetizing that through working with developers or doing that ca those capital projects independent of the private sector? The, uh, the proposal is to build some uh, infrastructure uh, that is public infrastructure, such as links to, uh, uh, to the roadway system, and then internal investments will be done by the developers who own the landowners. It's more of an enabling infrastructure that will allow us to open up, you know, quite a bit industrial land that we can attract investment into the city. Well, I think being a catalyst for further yeah. investment is a is a very uh, good thing. And if if uh, you're contributing surplus lands in partnership with the private sector, that's probably a fairly good model to, to pursue. Yeah. Um, I'm not a, I, I'm not sure um, the the municipality should be taking on excessive risk. No, by, it's, by. it's not city developing the land. It's more about building the public infrastructure uh, component to uh, leverage and uh, facilitate that growth. Yeah, I think the, you know, having those shovel-ready projects yeah. are very, very helpful. Oh. And, uh, and uh, one of the competitive advantages I think we can undertake uh, in the region is to, and, and I think the, the city has done great work in red tape reduction, yeah. But you've heard me talk about the, the phrase time to vertical, and that is when can I get, as, a, as an investor, how quickly can I get my capital to work? Yeah. And, and so if, if municipal governments can play a, a strong catalytic or catalyst role to provide that confidence in the investment community to spur, uh, spur development, I think those are all good things. And, yeah. and that, that infrastructure is, uh, is a, a, an expensive but a very important part of um, creating that, uh, that demand. Yeah. On that red tape reduction and facilitation of business growth and making it easier for people to bus do business, you know, uh, uh, the air products uh, uh, is a good example. Uh, the rezoning was done in, I think, 75 days. Development permit was issued in 36 days. And air products at an international stage at COP27 actually acknowledged the city's efforts to the international community. That was the first in the world for them to have their project approved that quickly by a municipality. So that really goes to the, uh, the work that administration is, uh, is doing. And thank you so, so much for acknowledging that. Could, could, I'll take the chair back. And that concludes the questions to uh, the panelists. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your contributions. And now we're going to go into our uh, next panel. So we're halfway through. Yes? Yes? We have 10 panels. We've done five panels. And uh, we're halfway through. And uh, I just want to remind council members that we have a long way to go yet on this, right? So, uh, okay, I'll read the names. Marcel Hukalak, Edmonton River Valley Conservation Coalition, joining us in person. Marcel, are you here? Okay, you'll be number one. Mubarak Ahmed, Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat of Edmonton, joining us remotely. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Gingras, on behalf of Martin Garber Conrad, Edmonton Community Development Company. Karen, she is there. Eric Gormley. Eric Gormley from Edmonton River Valley Conservation Coalition. Um, I am here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we. Okay, well, you're uh, joining, uh, using Rocky's laptop. All right. Um, okay. Yeah. See you. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, Julian. Main, Art, you're here. Thank you. Uh, Reg Joseph, please come down, Reg. You'll be number six. Andrew Senia, 
the uh, Canadian good morning, everyone joining you remotely. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Fol Foley? Foley? Ryan? Ryan Foley? Not yet. Darlene Malen Malenko. Malenko, sorry. Darlene Malenko from ATU. Darlene, are you here? In person, please come down. You'll be number nine. Jeff Deplak, Alberta Water Polo Association, remotely. Jeff, are you there? Jeff Dep Deptak. There you are. Uh, Mark Senior, joining remotely. Mark Senior. Nope. Zach Ramji, joining remotely. Zach Ramji. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. I'm here. Thank you. Sharif Haji from Africa Center, joining remotely. Sharif, are you there? Sharif, no. Russell Cobb, Edmonton Heritage Council, in person. Russell, please come down. You'll be number 14. Crystal Ling, in person. Crystal, Crystal Ling. Or joining virtually, Crystal Ling. Nope. Chris Chang Ian Phillips, in person. There you are, you'll be number 16. Ying Yi Fu? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. You'll be number 17. Thank you for joining us. Willem Lengen, Lengenberg, Marathon Ski. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You'll be number 18. Paula Findlay, Do North Events, number 19. Paula, are you there? Paula Findlay, no. I see Sharif joining us. Sharif, you'll be number 13. Yeah. And George Del Bello, Edmonton Master Swim Club. George, Hi there. are George you there? Is here. All Hi right, there. thank you so much. Okay, we will start with Marshall Huklak. Am I on? Yes, you are. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you, and uh, yeah, my presentation's up, good, thank you. Hi, I'm Marcel Huklak. I am a settler on these lands. My pronouns are he, him. I am a transportation engineer with 30 years experience in both the public and private sectors. And I'm here today representing the Edmonton River Valley Conservation Coalition. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, that slide up there is a quote from a 2015 report from the uh, Edmonton Transit Advisory Board. Um, and what it essentially boils down to is that the um, BRT gets a bigger bang for its buck than the LRT. Your LRT right now is the biggest item in your budget uh, and you can get a bigger reach by taking that money and using it to implement BRT roughly about a three to one uh, rate uh, for the same length of uh, line you can get about three, three uh, BRTs, three BRT lines for one LRT line. And um, at a risk of uh, quoting another speaker who was here yesterday, uh, Carrier Diot, uh, he talked about you uh, in your distinguishing between wants and needs. Uh, Carrie and I might disagree on what a want and need is here, but um, what I would say is our need here is for a fantastic transit system. Our want is the LRT, and maybe instead what we really need is BRT. Next slide, please. Twenty-five minutes. So yeah. Um, the next two slides here are just an example that I want to walk you through of, of how we could um, look at our budget, and maybe again uh, applying that lens of want and need. Um, so it's a tale of two bridges. Uh, this is uh, the the first bridge is the one that you can see in the rendering is the Hundred Street pedestrian uh, bridge from your website. It's an envisioned bridge, bridge, and again we could ask ourselves, is this a want or a need? The 
need here really is to connect pedestrians from one side of the road to the other. The want is a bridge. Is that the only way we can connect these pedestrians across the road? And that's where the second bridge comes in, the invisible bridge. And that rendering in the top right hand corner, uh, it's hard to make out here, but the construction of the Tawatina Bridge is underway in that rendering. And of course it exists today, it's not in operation, but hopefully it will be. And there's a possibility for us to say the, the reason we have this bridge is we don't want to interrupt the flow of traffic on McDougal Hill, but we could take that flow of traffic, and again, it's, that's a want, a flow of cars. What we need is a flow of people into the downtown, and we can do that through the LRT bridge that we've just built. We don't need to have McDougal Hill anymore. So if we reduce McDougal, uh, take McDougal Hill out or make it bus only as an option, we can have pedestrians cross that grade and save somewhere in the order of 10 to $30 million on that bridge uh, that cost figure is made up by me because I wasn't able to determine in your budget how much this bridge costs. It's lumped in with a bunch of other things, so I really don't know how much it costs. So uh, one other thing I want to say about this slide too is that um, there we have an opportunity to do a prototype or an experiment where we could actually try closing McDougal Hill or Gerson Hill, if that's the one we want to close, or something like that, and um, open the when the LRT opens, and we have a chance to try it and see what happens. And we can still leave the the asphalt there. If it fails, we can go back and and open up the road again. If it works, then we can move on and restore some of our river valley. Next slide, please. This is just another example of a bridge that could be closed, and it's it's down in the bottom right hand corner, the low level bridge. Again, with the, for the same reasoning, you could think of closing this because you have the Talpatina Bridge uh, open and uh, uh, take advantage of another bridge going out of our river valley or possibly keeping two of the lanes open for a bus only bridge and the other others move on. Um, the other bridge gets taken out. Finally, uh, I'll move on to the last slide. Thank you. Um, so what uh, ERVCC is looking at here is uh, we're saying we think we need to uh, fund a better bus system and a more livable, sustainable, and better carbon performing Edmonton. And we need to unfund the LRT and the 100 Street Bridge. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we will go to Mubarak Ahmed. Uh, good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, uh, respected mayor and city councillors, and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to allow me to speak. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, funding for the South Haven Cemetery expansion. Uh, I am representing the uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim community uh, here in Edmonton. Our community presently owns 50 cemetery lots in South Haven Cemetery. Over the last few years, we have been in regular contact with a couple of uh, City of Edmonton employees in the Cemetery Client Services and Administration. And they have been extremely helpful to us in keeping us informed as we have been inquiring and communicating with them about what are the opportunities to purchase additional lots and are there any future cemetery expansion plans which would include lots built specifically for the Muslim uh, communities of Edmonton. And for your information, it is highly preferred and customary for Muslims to have their graves oriented in a specific direction, which of course is towards Mecca. And our current 50 lots at South Haven Cemetery are oriented to our needs. About a year ago, uh, we were delighted to learn that such an expansion was being proposed for South Haven Cemetery. The supervisor of cemetery sales and operations was very kind enough to show us these plans, these proposed plans for South Haven Cemetery in December of last year in a meeting at City Hall. 
When we followed up with her in June of 2022, we were advised that the City of Edmonton Cemeteries has submitted the preliminary business cases and supporting information related to our development and service delivery needs for both South Haven and Northern Light Cemeteries. And this included the Muslim expansion areas at South Haven Cemetery and the supporting roads and drainage and infrastructure. We were very hopeful that this expansion, including the Muslim expansion areas at South Haven Cemetery would be included in the next budget cycle. Sadly, we learned on October 28th that the budget for this expansion was not included for the proposed uh, funding. As I mentioned earlier, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community presently owns only 50 lots at South Haven Cemetery. Of course, this will not meet our future needs. We are a growing community and just like the rest of Canadian society, we have many aging members. Uh, the last two years have been especially difficult with the loss of several of our community members. And in addition, our members have been planning for the future and thus all our 50 lots have been reserved by them. So our situation now is that we are in an urgent and pressing need for additional cemetery lots built for the Muslim community. We were extremely hopeful that the proposed Muslim expansion areas at South Haven Cemetery would meet our needs for many years into the future. My humble plea to the city council is that the funding be restored and included for the South Haven Cemetery expansion, including the Muslim expansion area. Our community would be extremely grateful uh, for this consideration and for a positive outcome. Thank you for taking the time to listening to our request. Thank you so much for joining us. Next, we will go to Karen Gingras. Good morning. Thank you very much, Mayor Sohi, and uh, great to see everybody back this morning. Um, just want to say that, yes, it is, uh, it is a cumbersome process, but yesterday when we were, Ken Chapman and I were chatting, um, he mentioned it's the democratic process, and I want to thank you all for that. It is um, something we should all be proud of, even though it tires us all out. So um, I'm the executive director at the Edmonton Community Development Company. We are investing in affordable housing and economic development in Edmonton communities. Could we go to the next slide, please? So um, the ECDC actually has been a concept since 1990s in, um, in Edmonton, and it only recently got started, 2018 was when our first um, executive director was contracted. And it has a broad mandate. Um, and um, what I would say um, lacked a focus uh, in the first few years. And so um, we are focusing now on development. Um, but we take a different approach to that development in that um, it's resident informed. And so if we could go to the next slide, I'll explain what that actually means. So resident informed means that we are actually checking in and finding out what we should be doing. And so in this instance, um, I, when I first joined ECDC in 2000, um, the fall of 2018, um, my role was uh, to converse and to find out what's going on, what's in the heart of the matters of community members in the first two communities that we're serving, which is the Alberta Avenue District and Macaulay. And no matter who I spoke with, residents and business owners in Macaulay all told me that changing the ownership of the um, Piazza, the Little Italy strip mall, would reduce crime and disorder in the community. And so if we could go to the next slide, I'll talk about that. So ECDC organized a group of local leaders, incorporated the only real estate investment co-op in all of Canada, which was a good thing and a bad thing, and found 91 members and investors in short time of six weeks, most from Macaulay. 
And we raised $1.2 million out of that community. And with the assistance of the Social Enterprise Fund, we were able to get a loan and we finally did what the community asked for. We purchased that strip mall as the Macaulay Development Co-op. We all took the leap together, 91 people. So another example of what we could be doing um, and um, taking advice from our residents. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Many residents in Macaulay and Alberta Avenue shared their brief moments of panic, um, frustration, fear with us. And they asked that we buy up all the derelict properties in Macaulay and Alberta Avenue and redevelop the properties um, into a housing for sale because they wanted families to move back. And so they felt um, that the only way to do that was to build some housing that was affordably priced and would have families move back and buy and live in their communities. If we go to the next slide, please. So we started creating a database. This map that I show you is, is a really cool map. It's through EpiCollect. And these are all of the properties that we have found from residents telling us and AHS health orders in, um, as you can see, North Central Edmonton all the way up to the Yellowhead. We have 225 properties. I know the city has almost double that. So we set out a goal. We said, okay, let's, let's try to help. And um, we enlisted uh, lawyers. Uh, we enlisted a realtor. Um, we did an unusual call. We uh, called out to um, builders and said, we want you to build homes at $139 a square foot. Um, and um, gee, we only got really one that could actually do that. So we contracted him. But then we sat down with another builder and went line by line with that builder. And they too came up. It was a little bit more, but we got some higher end finishings out of the deal. So we bought 10 problem properties. We got a loan to be able to actually do the purchases and the construction. So we carried all the risk, which to many builders is attractive. Wow, this time goes so quickly, doesn't am, it now? I know it does, <laughs> and, I, and unfortunately I have to stop you here because uh, I need to be fair to everyone uh, uh, with five minute allocation. And uh, next we will go to uh, Eric Gormley. Hi. Um, good morning, Mayor and City Council. Uh, I would like you to unfund $3 million for river crossing. Uh, my name is Eric Gormley representing ERVCC. Our work is advocating for the river valley and natural spaces. The river valley and ravine system is the biggest and most important feature of the city. Since the early 1900s, the city has placed special emphasis on its river valley and ravine system and is deeply involved in planning, acquisition, development, and system management. This system runs the length of the city and includes 20 parks and a coordinated network of pathways and wildlife corridors. It is a major part of the city's identity. It is valued for restoration and enhancement. It speaks to Edmonton's unique geography, climate, history, and culture and provides ecological functions such as carbon sequestration, water retention, landscape shading, et cetera, that support a thriving city. These are the words of administration who recommend that $10 million be spent for acquisition of River Valley land. We support this budget item. Next slide, please. Paradoxically, administration is also asking for $3 million to advance river crossing plan so that River Valley open space in Rossdale might be sold and developed. These requests are at cross purposes. Next slide, please. In the 1970s, the city wanted to turn River Valley communities, including Rossdale, into parkland. 
Over the decades, the city had stitched together a continuous band of riverside and ravine lands, and it wanted to add to this legacy. At the time, though, these lower middle class valley neighborhoods were a sort of affordable housing, and public opinion was strong enough to thwart the city's plan. Next slide, please. Though the valley communities were saved as villages in the park, the city still ended up in possession of 15 to 20 acres of open space in Rossdale. Now, most of this is being earmarked for residential and commercial development. Next slide, please. River crossing development in Rossdale is more an urban vision rather than a village in the park. It's a way to densify Edmonton, not an unwise goal, but it's important to pick the right places to infill. The quarters, Blatchford, and exhibition grounds are better long-term options. The continuity of parkland along the river and ravines is the key feature of Edmonton's valley system. A city of a million people with a regional wildlife corridor running through it is rare. A continuous landscape helps mitigate the effects of climate change. Rossdale lands are part of this continuity. Next slide, please. Another layer of value is added to Rossdale's open space when one considers its past. Rossdale Flats is the birthplace of Edmonton and the Alberta Métis Nation. Next slide, please. First Nations peoples have camped on the flats forever. The Indigenous Cemetery in Rossdale, dating back to the early 1800s, is a testament to the First Nations connection to this part of the city. In August, City Council passed a motion to involve First Nations in any plans for future development of Rossdale. Reimagining Rossdale Flats from an Indigenous perspective might also lead to a partnership with the federal government who are willing to create a national urban park in Edmonton. And last slide, please. All this is to say, we know the value of River Valley land. The city has rarely, if ever, sold River Valley land once it was acquired, although significant amounts have been lost to transportation and utility ventures. Reserving River Valley and Ravine land has never been a poor choice. Every generation finds something new to value in natural spaces. In conclusion, it seems premature for the city to devote $3 million to advance river crossing, a project that involves the sale of River Valley land that forms a key part of the city's geographical and historical identity, especially when Indigenous involvement in planning this area has not yet started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Next, we will go to Julianne Maine. Yes. Please go ahead. Go ahead, please. Please go ahead with the video. Short video. Here we go. Since 1996, Arts Habitat has been a proud leader in building, managing, and advocating for art space in Edmonton. Through our direct service agreement signed with the City of Edmonton in 2020, we will continue pursuing the strategic goal of creating sustainable space for the arts. Our vision is for dynamic, sustainable, and entrepreneurial artistic communities to thrive in the City of Edmonton. We partner with the City of Edmonton and other provincial and nonprofit arts organizations across Canada to build upon our expertise and proficiency in offering information to the arts community in our city. We support art spaces that are welcoming, safe, and respectful of all. With an engaged board of community professionals and experienced staff, Arts Habitat is proud to be Edmonton's only nonprofit invested in creating an arts infrastructure foundation. We own and operate Arts Hub 118, a diverse artists live work cooperative, and McLuhan House serves the literary community. This allows us to provide advice, consultation, and recommendations to city council and administration, arts organizations, individual artists, developers, and other property stakeholders and partners. 
We are providing leadership and collaboration on current projects, such as the rehabilitation of the city-owned Ortona Armory, consulting partner with the Orange Hub, or the ongoing engagement of our Indigenous Voices Circle. We remain dedicated to ensuring art spaces and experiences that are welcoming, safe, and respectful for all Edmontonians. We are currently gathering comprehensive data that will form the direction and recommendations of Edmonton's first cultural infrastructure plan. We are excited to be part of the decision-making process for Edmonton's art space development and to continue creating a long-term sustainable impact for the betterment of all Edmontonians. Good morning, Mayor Sohi and Councillors. My name is Julian Main. I'm the Executive Director of Arts Habitat Edmonton. Our board and staff applaud City's commitment to the ongoing development of arts and culture infrastructure with the continued funding to Arts Habitat in this budget. City Councils past and present have recognized arts and culture carries a substantial return on investment. It drives economic growth, brings millions of dollars into our economy, and creates quality jobs and the quality of life. I'd like to highlight four opportunities. First, we are pleased to report that Arts Habitat's collaboration with the city on the Ortona project allowed for a joint application to Canada Cultural Spaces program, leveraging $1.7 million for this exciting arts and heritage project. We look forward to opening the doors in 2024 on this amazing heritage building that will serve Edmonton's creative workforce. Second, Arts Habitat is in persistent conversation with the private developers and commercial property owners attempting to leverage these resources. Market conditions make it very challenging to provide affordable space and still meet the investor needs for commercial rates of return. P3 development has the potential to be a source for social purpose real estate, but requires effective incentives such as zoning, adjustments, community amenities, and property tax incentives. For example, Toronto's Creative Facilities Property Tax subclass supports the sustainability and the growth of creative enterprises. Third, we need to seriously review any surplus city-owned facility to take full benefit of those resources that sit dark. This is an easy win-win, and we are here to collaborate with the city. Fourth, we are the designated lead organization for developing Edmonton's first cultural infrastructure plan. In collaboration with the Heritage Council and Arts Council as outlined in the award-winning Connections and Exchanges Arts and Culture Plan. This work will identify the inventory, the needs, and the gaps in our city's arts and cultural infrastructure, providing recommendations, best practices, mapping, and strategies for the years ahead. Ongoing consultations with Indigenous artists and underserved or marginalized communities are prioritized in the Cultural Infrastructure Plan. To quote Mayor Sohi, arts and heritage have a power to transform lives. It, like no other force in our civic life, they create meaningful connections and exchanges that fuel the direction of positive change. Providing affordable space is the foundation. I'm sorry. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, okay, next we'll go to Raj Joseph. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, honored uh, councillors for allowing me to address you today. Uh, my name is Raj Joseph. I lead a nonprofit organization called Health Cities, and we're here seeking renewal of the grant fund uh, for Health Cities that expires at the end of this calendar year. We're focused on leveraging the assets we have in health to drive better health outcomes and economic growth in the health sector. We operate at the intersection of data, economic growth, and the social determinants of health. We provided all of you an email package with support letters from our collaborators, which includes local companies, multinationals, post-secondary institutions, and our social services agencies. The opportunity before us is, is quite interesting in health. The biggest challenge we have locally and nationally, for that matter, is for small and medium enterprises to be able to test, try, and validate their innovations in live clinical settings. Without this piece, companies often move to other jurisdictions, resulting in a loss of those innovations to our residents and the tax base for those that those companies would provide. 
Health Cities has created commercial pathways in several healthcare streams, which include home health care, long term care, First Nations care, and primary care. And the need for this is growing. Data from Canadian Venture Capital Association uh, shows that in the last two years, $150 million worth of financings has gone into health tech companies in Alberta. Our region is actually one of the fastest growing regions for health tech in Canada. As you know, we're currently in a healthcare crisis, and many of our innovators have the solutions that we could deploy right here. With respect to return on investment, for the uh, $985,000 that uh, the city has provided annually, uh, we have brought in an additional $4 million in cash and $6 million in in-kind contributions to our ecosystem. And those numbers are increasing. I'd like to give you just a few examples of some of the projects that we've, uh, we've encompassed over the last few years. On the economic growth side, we have an example of screening of our First Nations children just outside of Edmonton in Alexis and Paul First Nation. The technology is the University of Alberta Artificial Intelligence Technology from Meadow AI. What gets me really excited about this project is not only did we deploy interesting technology developed locally right here, but we've also built community capacity in our First Nations communities to both treat and serve their own, uh, their own members. Uh, but what's also interesting is, is that that data that we generated enabled Meadow AI to be able to secure not only FDA approval, but CE mark approval in Europe. And so now they are meeting global markets right here from Edmonton. The next opportunity is data. One of the biggest assets we have is our health data. Not to sell this data, but to attract innovators to our region to co-develop solutions to chronic challenges like diabetes and social challenges like the opioid crisis. In collaboration with the Ministry of Health, the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta, we generated the first synthetic data set in Canada. This has been recognized nationally by the Canadian Institute for Health Informatics, and this Edmonton project has put our city on the map and is setting a template of how to do this work nationally. On the social services side, given these times, we all lean on our social service agencies heavily. There is both an opportunity and a desire from our Edmonton-based social services agencies to use their data better to serve their clients, drive decision-making, and inform funders as to where dollars will have the biggest impact. Health Cities is proud to be working alongside a consortium of seven social service sector um, organizations, including the Bissell Center, Boyle Street, C5, and CMHC. We're able to leverage our health data experience to impact social services data and the social determinants of health. We are bringing a business and innovation lens to social services. I welcome an opportunity to work with our council to ensure that the work that we're doing connects with the council's vision and the city administration to meet their objectives. And lastly, with respect to post-secondary institutions, we're actively working with uh, 11 post-secondaries, connecting them to SMEs for an international um, opportunity with uh, licenses to um, uh, for uh, augmented and virtual reality. So last, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, the, um, the city has taken a leadership position in Canada by engaging health at a municipal level. If the city feels that hosting this unique table does not fit with all its other priorities, I ask that council consider an orderly mechanism to alter the relationship so we don't lose the potential funding opportunities Sorry, Raj. that we have. Time is up. Thank you. All right, next we go to Andrew. Senia. Good morning, Mayor Sohi and Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all on this cold day in Edmonton uh, and to speak on behalf of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and to provide input on the 2023-2026 service plans and budgets. The CFIB represents 95,000 independently owned and operated businesses across Canada, 9,300 in Alberta and 1,800 in Edmonton. As a nonpartisan organization, our members set a policy direction gathered through surveys, making us leaders in the understanding of small business issues. CFIB's latest surveys uh, results show small businesses in the city have not fully recovered from the pandemic and face an uphill battle. According to our data, 73% 
of Edmonton businesses are still carrying pandemic-related debt, while only 33% are making normal sales. Furthermore, the typical Edmonton business is carrying almost $65,000 in debt because of the pandemic and are expected to take approximately two years to fully pay it off. For small businesses in the city, property taxes are cited as the most harmful to the operation of their business after utility and insurance costs, according to our most recent survey. Property taxes are profit insensitive for small businesses, meaning that businesses must pay them whether or not they're bringing in any revenue. According to CFIB's own research, Edmonton's property tax fairness ratio sits at 1.96%, meaning that non-residential properties make up 23% of the property tax assessment base, but contribute to 46% of the property tax share. We also recognize and appreciate the work done by council and administration over the pandemic years to alleviate the cost for businesses. Like the option to reduce business license fee payments from 50% and the economic recovery grant. However, at a time when inflation is high and economic recovery is not a reality, businesses are seeking cost relief. And the proposed 39.7% annual property tax increase over the next four years will have a negative impact on these businesses. We ask the City of Edmonton to find ways to alleviate costs for these small businesses. We also come here today with a couple of asks of, for city to, cap, to consider. Uh, these include building upon the city's red tape reduction efforts, a construction mitigation policy, and a shop local campaign. As a result of the pandemic and the will of council, the city has made significant strides in reducing red tape. For small businesses, red tape not only includes all the paperwork and rules they must follow, but also the level of customer service provided by governments. Not being able to get answers quickly from government websites or call centers can be equally frustrating and even costly for small business owners. We commend the City of Edmonton for launching the one-on-one -on -one support program for small businesses, the Permit and Licensing Improvement Initiative, removing parking minimums, and the discounted fee for a two-year business license. We call on the city to continue these red tape reduction initiatives and services that help the small business community every day. The City of Edmonton has also committed to invest significant dollars in public infrastructure projects over the next four years. These large infrastructure projects can be disruptive and in some cases be costly enough to shut down local businesses. That is why the CFIB was disappointed to see Councillor Knack's financial assistance for economic loss due to major construction draft policy fail to pass at Council even though it was supported during the Executive Committee on March 25th. Now it is our ask that during these budget deliberations, administration and council will allocate funds to incorporate a construction mitigation policy in the budget that will have a real impact on small business owners struggling with disruptions caused by construction. We recognize municipalities are faced with tough decisions and small businesses also acknowledge that the Alberta government has a role to play in helping municipalities. CFIB survey results from October, 2022 show that 72% of Alberta small businesses say it is important for the Alberta government to assist with municipal issues such as affordable housing, property damage from crime and construction mitigation. We're eager to see how the Minister of Municipal Affairs will work with council to ensure that more money stays locally. To conclude, Edmonton businesses need help from everyday Edmontonians at council more than ever. The holiday shopping season is critical for small businesses with retailers often sharing that the six final weeks of the year represent up to 40% of their annual sales. With the many pressures facing small businesses this year from inflation to supply chain challenges, interest rates and pandemic related debts, we ask Sorry, council to Andrew. social media platforms to rally Edmontonians. Got to it, shop thank you. Okay. All right, next we go to Darlene Maleko from ATU. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor Soe and Councillors. I'm Darlene Maleko, Executive Board Representative with ATU 569. I've had the opportunity to advocate for workers and for better transit in our communities for almost 17 years. Thank you for this opportunity to address you on the important initiatives in this year's budget. President Bradshaw has already presented you 
uh, presented to you about the various concerns the union has in this budget, I'd like to take this opportunity to underscore and remind you of the importance of these items for ETS, for the City of Edmonton, for transit users, and for your workers. You've heard our union on the matter of the Regional Transit Initiative many times. The bullet point addition is this. The 13 million cash ask fails to deliver any value to the city. No new service for a full 1% tax levy. The initiative fails to include all regional partners. The commission has failed to develop any ridership models and therefore doesn't even know what service to provide. The initiative fails to protect the partners from the inevitable liabilities, backloading them onto the municipalities, meaning the partners forfeit direct control but maintain a substantial risk. The commission fails to provide any detailed outline of what phase two will look like or what it will cost. It fails to deliver any savings as promised and will continue to cost more. This initiative is a failure from start to finish. Meanwhile, the interwoven regional system we already have is successful everywhere the commission fails. It includes all the major players. It is flexible, it costs less. It uses existing infrastructure like the LRT and acts on known data. Last week's inauguration of phase four of the ARC card regional fare system is a great example of how we can have a complex regional transit system by working together without costly commissions and CEOs. What ETS needs is more service hours, but we need more buses to perform the service, and of course we need that new garage to house the buses and maintain them. Funding this important component now is a major step forward towards achieving the brilliant goals of city plan. It takes three to five years from scratch to opening. The time is to start is now. The homeless crisis is not Edmonton's alone to solve, but we need to act in to impose order on the transit system to, system to ensure riders, staff, and the homeless people themselves are safe and that they feel safe. More transit peace officers is our best first step. These highly skilled and trained peace officers work in the community outreach teams and on the TCATs and on the entire system to bring support, safety, and order. But they're burning out. Every single day is traumatic. Excessive overtime is fatiguing them. Recent additions to the corps are appreciated, but they only serve to underscore the importance of having a robust and well-stocked corps. The proposal to add 48 more TPOs is welcome and critically important. Temporary workers doing permanent work is a failure in employment practice. Workers are onboarded to clean buses and LRT cars on a 11-month contract and then they're laid off for three weeks and they're hired back on a new 11-month contract. This pra practice is an end run around the collective agreement to deny these workers the health benefits and pensions they need to support their families and to plan for the future. Many of these people are new Canadians arrived here in the hopes that they will have a better life and a better future for their children, only to discover that they're second-class citizens. Please act now to stop this abusive practice. In 1978, uh, Edmonton led the pack of mid-sized Canadian cities by building an LRT system the others could only emulate. Today, we're falling behind. These 1978 L light rail transit vehicles are nearing twice their life expectancy. It's a tribute indeed to the teams at the LRT division that have kept those cars on the tracks and kept them safe. But they can't work their magic forever and the cost of rebuilding them will exceed the cost of replacing them. It's time for new replacement LRVs. Mayor Soe and councillors, here are some, these are some of the things that will help bring better, more inclusive, vibrant, and climate resilience to the city. They are the foundation of the legacy that we all want to leave behind for our generations to come. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Darlene. Next, we will go to Jeff Daptak, Alberta Water Polo Association, joining remotely. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, my name is Jeff Daptak. I am on the board of directors with the Alberta Water Polo Association. Uh, and I'm also the father of two 
water polo athletes here in the city of Edmonton. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you. And I'd like to acknowledge the difficult task you have ahead of you balancing the needs of the citizens of Edmonton while also being fiscally responsible to the taxpayers. Uh, I'm going to talk today against the proposed changes to the Lewis Farms uh, Rec Center. Uh, obviously, we're halfway done, so you've already heard a few people have discussed this, and you're going to hear a few more after me. Uh, these are all athletes, their parents, their people who are involved in these aquatic sports, and they all have very valid, important arguments. So for my limited five minutes, uh, I want to talk about equity in sport. I know this is important to the city of Edmonton. In 2019, uh, during the diversity and inclusion framework that the city of Edmonton created, uh, equity was one of the pillars of inclusion. Uh, and this goes hand in hand with uh, the government of Canada, who in 2018 announced a target for gender equity in sport at every level by 2035. And something um, us in water polo are very proud of is that uh, Edmonton and Alberta, we lead all other provinces in Canada in gender equity in our sport. 42% uh, of water polo athletes in the province are female, which is, uh, it's an outstanding number and something, like I said, we should be proud of. However, it's not perfect. There's obviously more work to be done and as a community, there's difficulties in having this work completed. Uh, I think the benefits to sports, to organized sports is known by most people, uh, but I did wanna bring some statistics around the benefits to sports, organized sports for girls. And this is from a, a study by the Women in Sport Foundation about female high school students. Female high school athletes are 92% less likely to become involved with drugs and 80% less likely to have an unwanted teenage pregnancy. As it stands right now in Canada, one third of Canadian girls drop out of all organized sports during adolescence. And this is a higher number than, than male athletes. As a city, we have a responsibility to try to remove the barriers and encourage more females in sports. I think for water polo and a lot of aquatic sports in the city, the biggest barrier <clears throat> is access to time and space in the city swimming pools. And I shouldn't just say time and space, time and appropriate space in swimming pools. A lot of the aquatic sports you've heard talk before me, uh, they all have specific requirements for pools and these will not be met with the proposed changes to the Lewis Farms Rec Center. I think the changes are focusing on uh, community usage, which is excellent. It's very important in all our recreation facilities to acknowledge that. But I think in the design, we must not forget sports group usage as well. The increase in mental and physical health in our population due to organized sports is unimaginable and immense. And in conclusion today, I just want to acknowledge that although uh, Edmonton is a bit of a hockey town, myself included, I like hockey, I like the Oilers, um, sometimes aquatic sports are viewed as, as they might be a little bit fringe, but that's not the case. If you look anywhere else in Canada or many other places in Canada and across the world, water polo and the other aquatic sports are very popular. As a matter of fact, uh, in 1900 at the Olympiad in Paris, Water polo was the very first Olympic team sport. It's something very important to us and it's, it's a sport that can have immense growth in our city and immense benefits to our population if we just had a little more space. So thank you very much for your time and I will be available for any questions at the end yep. of this. Thank you so much, Jeff. Next we go to Zach Ramji. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me, Mayor Sohi? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, thank you. So good morning, Mayor Sohi, uh, city councillors, guests in the council chambers today, and guests uh, watching online. My name is Zach Ramji. I'm the Vice President of Corporate Services uh, here at Civita. It's a pleasure to be speaking before you today, and thank you for your time. So 
Civita is the second largest housing management body in Alberta. Uh, we are the largest, of, of course, in Edmonton. And we've been serving Edmontonians for 50 plus years in affordable housing. More than 13,000 Edmontonians live in our homes. Our tenants present a diverse mix of people. I'm sure you're aware the demand for affordable homes is high in Edmonton, just like it is in every major Canadian city. Uh, indeed, we believe that everybody deserves a home that they can afford. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what's our request today? If I can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so our request today uh, is to uh, ask for a grant to offset the municipal property taxes. Indeed, um, we are faced with tremendous inflationary costs and uh, we have tremendous um, uh, demand on our demand maintenance as well as operating expenses. For these units, which are up to 896 near market homes, uh, we don't charge market rates. Indeed, we charge 80% of market. And I would argue that we would charge less than 80% for these 896 homes. So where are these homes located? Uh, these homes are located right here in Edmonton in the wards under Councillors Rutherford, Councillor Knack, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Principe, Councillor Tang, and Councillor Wright. The majority of these homes are one and two bedroom apartments. In 2022, Civita paid just over a million dollars in municipal property taxes on these properties, and they account for 20% of our revenues. Again, we're asking for a grant in the exact amount to offset these municipal property taxes. Next slide, please. So where would the grant money go? As a fiscally responsible council, you deserve to know the answer to that question. We will reinvest these funds for the benefit of residents, for the benefit of Edmontonians who work hard to pay their rent. We will reinvest these funds through in repairs, upgrades to flooring, kitchen cabinets, painting, and the like for our homes. We'd also like to reinvest this, this, uh, this grant in heating and ventilation systems to help make homes more comfortable and also mitigate any climate change impacts that may happen on our, on our tenants. This is a reinvestment in existing affordable housing units we own in Edmonton. More importantly, this is a time when it is, it is needed most. As I said before, we are facing extremely high inflationary expenses to uh, repair these units. Uh, we are all aware of the demand for quality affordable housing is high. It's high in Edmonton, and as I mentioned before, it's high in most major Canadian cities. So these funds are an investment in Edmontonians who deserve quality affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zach. Next, we will go to Sharif Haji. Sharif, are you there? I saw him earlier. No. Sharif is not here. Russell Cobb is next. Good morning. My name is Russell Cobb. <clears throat> I'm associate professor in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta. Don't worry, I am not going to lecture you about some arcane topic, but rather talk to you about the importance of public history as practiced by Edmonton Heritage Council and more specifically by Edmonton City as a Museum Project. I'm gonna read a quote to you by the writer, the writer Joan Didion. A place belongs forever to whoever claims it hardest, remembers it most obsessively, and wrenches it from itself, shapes it, renders it, and loves it so radically that he remakes it in his own image. I'm a transplant from the United States, and it really took me years before I was even willing to claim Edmonton as my home, much less remember it obsessively or love it radically. Like a lot of academics, I didn't really choose Edmonton, but rather landed here after finishing my PhD in 2007. 
I had never actually been to Canada before taking a job at the U of A. And so as a sprawling newcomer, as a newcomer to the city in 2008, I wondered about this strange place whipped by minus 30 degree wind chills and sprawling into the prairies. What was its identity? What was its image? How to render it, shape it? Edmonton, I thought mistakenly, had no identity. And so I felt like I was in a sort of purgatory as a newcomer. But this changed in 2015 when I discovered Edmonton City as a museum project. Now, ECAMP has no physical space, but I think it does something very important, which is that it cultivates a way of seeing the city. The work of ECAMP promotes living history, not just a series of monuments and old buildings, but rather communicating what does it mean, how does one foster a sense of place. It's a mode of discovering lost connections, hitting hidden meanings and thrilling surprises. Did you know that there used to be parcels of hogs who fed off scraps thrown down the hill from the Hotel McDonald? And that those hogs provided food to a village of people who lived in the rough down there? They often sold folk, folk art to well-to-do Edmontonians. And those, that folk art was made from scraps of trash. Well, I didn't know that either. But learning that uh, helped me rethink the identity of Edmonton and its river valley. I mean, we still have, we may not have parcels of pigs in the river valley, but we still have people without shelter there. And we definitely still have a problem with garbage. So doing the hard work of digging through the archives and researching these kind of past stories uh, is, is important work. It helps us understand the way things are the way they are right now. It's vital work in a city that often to, repeats its past mistakes. And as a sort of public historian, I find that writing this work is, is a real privilege. But writing history should not be only for the privileged. It should be, we need to find ways to fund marginalized voices, bring um, writers out into the fore that, that may not, th whose voices may not have been heard in the past. Um, one more, since I have a, another minute, I'll give you another anecdote. Uh, did you know that there was a thriving soul food and jazz club where the law courts now stand? That was Hattie's Harlem Chicken Inn. And it was a contact zone between Edmonton's black population and other people, providing a safe haven for black culture to survive and thrive in downtown in a time when de facto segregation was the rule here. The proprietor served up the city's best fried chicken to mayors, city council members, the Harlem Globetrotters, and even Louis Armstrong. Now when she died, Hattie Melton had only a small death notice in the Edmonton Journal. Ecamp, with its vir virtual exhibits, stories, and podcasts, tell these stories, the stories that have been almost forgotten. Researching the history of Hattie's Harlem Chicken Inn has led me to new perspectives, new ideas, and perhaps more importantly, new connections for research and community members. Ecamp is not a physical space, but rather a tool, if properly funded, can help Edmontonians remember their city, render their city, and yes, even love it radically. Thank you. Thank you so much, Russell. So we are close to noon. We will stop here and we'll uh, resume back at 1 p.m. with Chris Chang Yen Philip, then Ying Yi Fu, Willem Langenberg, and I saw Paula Paula Finley probably there, and George Del Bello. Then we will run back to the list for the people that we have missed. I'll call if Ryan Rowe is here. I don't know. Mark Senior. Is Ryan Rowe poster here? No. Mark Senior. No. Then we'll come back to Sharif Haji. So Sharif will be the last one because uh, the way the process works, that if you miss your turn, then you go, to the, go to the back of the queue for that panel. Okay. All right, we'll be back at 1 p.m. Until then, we are on recess.
All right, I would like to call this meeting back to order. And we have quorum. And we will go to our next speaker, Crystal Ling. Please go ahead, you have five minutes to make your presentation. Crystal Ling, are you there? Well, we'll come back to Crystal. Next, uh, we will go to Chris Chang E. Phillips. Chris Chang E. Phillips. Oh, right here, you're in person. Hello. Oh, I should notice that. <laughs> yes, he is in person. I should be able to read that. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Chris Chang and Phillips. I'm a previous historian laureate for the city, a journalist. I'm currently doing a master's in history at the U of A. I'm speaking today with my private citizen hat on about two items, heritage and climate action. I feel like I could sum up what I'm here to talk to you about today uh, by telling you that one of the best parts of my day, almost every day, is biking to campus. I live in Old Strathcona, and I feel so proud and happy to bike to the university, uh, partly because it feels great even when your eyelashes are frosted over, um, partly because when I get to campus to work on my thesis, I get to continue the work I was doing as historian laureate, sharing stories about humans in the land and trying to knit us a little closer to it. I was born at the Miz. I took the number nine to go to high school at Vic. Edmonton is a place that I love, but I feel like a lot of us here get stuck in a perpetual now. It can be hard for us to get a deep appreciation for how rich our past is. And the current 10-year Arts and Heritage Plan is a good roadmap for fostering that. I, I'm glad that this operating budget allocates money to implement it. I'd like to encourage you to take another look at the full funding request from the Edmonton Heritage Council. Um, to support what my fellow panelists here said, the Edmonton Heritage Council is a trusted, helpful community partner doing good work on their own like the eCamp stories and also catalyzing important community projects. I've been lucky enough to work on projects that EHC has funded, like an Edmonton Chinatown Stories project that sprawled across radio and podcasts and beautiful panels of artwork. They supported two seasons of my local history podcasts, which were listened to over 15,000 times. Their money goes far. The EHC's request for a funding increase this cycle would go towards grants supporting indigenous cultural resurgence and equity-seeking communities, pay for more program partnerships on exhibits and podcasts and digital heritage platforms, it's a reasonable ask from an organization that's helping the city meet its own 10-year plan. And crucially to me, it's an organization with low friction grant applications and reporting. Both can be really intimidating. So I think this is worth the investment. Okay, the other reason I love biking to campus is that it gives me something to do every day to build a livable future. I was in Calgary in 2013, the summer that their downtown was half underwater. I was in Churchill Square in 2016 for the pancake breakfast, supporting people who had to flee Fort McMurray because of the fires. I've been reporting on the climate crisis in our province for over a decade, and I don't have to tell you that this is not a distant future possibility. It's here. Right now, drought is hitting the farmers we rely on to feed ourselves in the city, and our community is already paying a lot to respond to increasingly extreme disasters every year. So. I biked campus and it was a financial stretch for us, but my husband and I took advantage of that federal grant. We got an electric car this year and we pay for green energy at home. That's why I was happy to see the city declare a climate emergency and invest in projects like Blatchford. I think the city of Edmonton's carbon budget is a good concept. It makes sense as a city with a high per capita GDP and above average carbon emissions to do our fair share between now and 2050 to get to the global emission reduction targets that'll give us a good shot at a livable planet. And that is why I was so disturbed to read what's actually in this carbon budget. First, ashamed that we are on track to blow through that budget in the next 15 years. Second, incredulous that there are projects that would get us closer to meeting those targets that are unfunded in this capital and operating budget. District energy, energy transition implementation, full funding of active transportation, they won't get us all the way, but they're achievable and they're within the city's control. They should be considered the bare minimum we can do to get us on the right path. Leaving these projects unfunded and hoping funding will show up later is worse than being penny wise and pound foolish. It's cowardly and it's short-sighted. The climate crisis endangers every other item in this budget. The hour is already very late. People in the city want to make ambitious choices. If you offer a solar program, an e-bike program, we will snap it up. If you build and maintain bike lanes, we will use them. Happy to report the funicular was, was working yesterday. Bike lanes cleared almost the whole way. 
And we'll be glad that we have those safe options because we've seen too many ghost bikes put up because the city's been so slow to build safe and logical bike corridors separated from heavy vehicles. Every Edmontonian deserves safe active transportation options, not just people in the city center. We are showing up, we need your support. Yes, we need support from all levels of government, but if the city council doesn't fund big transformational climate action, it will have less credibility to ask others to do the same or to ask partners to invest in that work. So to sum up, please allow me to add my voice to the folks saying, please invest in the unfunded budget request that will have a big impact on our carbon emissions. Keep investing in public and active transportation and climate resilience projects. Support the work that will fulfill our arts and heritage plan and show Edmontonians that this council cares about our heritage and creating a livable future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, before I go to our next speaker, I would like to welcome uh, Mayo Kimen School, grade six class. They are here with their teacher, uh, Mrs. Con Conquer, and they are represented by Councillor Tang, Ward, Gary Eo. Thank you so much for coming. Hey, right. nice to nice to see you all. We are talking about. Uh, uh, what are we going to do over the next four years, allocating resources to uh, build a better city, how we build uh, playgrounds, pools, rec centers, roads, bike lanes, uh, how we build our city to be more climate resilient, and how we build more affordable housing for people to have a safe place to call home. So all those things we'll be discussing over the next few weeks. And uh, we are today we are hearing from members of the public about their views on uh, on the budget. And thank you so much uh, for joining us. And you're welcome to stay as long as you want to. Okay. All right. Now we go to our next speaker, um, Ying Ifu. Hey. All right. Hello. My good afternoon, Mayor Sohi and fellow councillors, and welcome to the Grade Six students here. My name is Ying Ifu. I am a professional, uh, professional engineer, and most importantly, I am also a mom, a parent to a 15-year-old young man born with physical and medical disabilities. I am, we are the resident of a CPW Newark, and I'm here to represent my son and the families uh, for a little bit to request that you re continue to provide funding support for the Little Bits uh, Therapeutic Association. So my young son who is living with disabilities wanted me to deliver this to you. In his word, that's what he said. I feel invisible. Please see me and include me. I want this city to be mine as well as everybody else who live with disabilities and no disabilities and all kinds of abilities. That's it, that is his words. So in this presentation, you will get the opportunity to read the impact of the little bits of programs. Um, if you will uh, pull out a presentation that uh, actually my son prepared for the city uh, for little bits, therapeutic association, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. This is prepared by my 15 year old who has very challenging um, physical and medical uh, disabilities. It took him about two months to do this. So in this presentation, you get the opportunity to read the impacts of Little Bits programs and many families living with disabilities. I will not have time to share all the stories here, but I would like you to take your time later on to listen to their voices and their hearts. So Little Bits and the White Mountain Equine Center is a magical place for a lot of the participants living with disabilities and their families. And you can see that for, for our wonderful river, river um, outdoor in the killer centers, and this is our White Mutt Equine Center that we came to very much love. So I'm gonna share a story of one of our families. This is Rachel. Rachel is an adult and she has been riding with Little Bits for 15 years. As you can see, a lot of places, there aren't that many places, I would, I would say that there aren't that many places that we can, people with disability can call their community. And this is our community. And this is, not a, this is a community, not just for children, 
or adults, but it's a place for everybody. You will see kids as young as three years old riding and somebody as, as a wonderful, beautiful seniors, 65 years old, participating in the horseback riding th therapy. Next slide. This is my child. This is my 15 year old child. And I'm going to share a little bit of his story. So a little bit, of course, it is a part of our family community. It's probably the strongest community we have over the five years. A lot of our participants took probably waited between two to four years to get onto the programs because the demand is so high. And that is a very, very special reason. It's because anybody that get onto the program never leaves because it's such a great place. If we get a chance, we will. my son would ride every single day because this is his safe haven. This is a place where little bits will welcome our family with open hearts and they'll believe that anybody, even with disabilities, has potentials. And they have this patience and they respect our son's desire to learn and not just to learn, but to learn at his own pace. Okay. So way back when he was 10 years old, grade five, just like any, all the kids sitting there, he started riding at little bits. He had three or four volunteers guarding him because he wasn't able to walk properly. Today he's 15 and he's been riding on his own independently without anybody with, with pride. So this is our son's journey at a little bit. Before he even got to the horse, it actually took him four years to build up his courage to get onto the horse because of all the anxieties and the physical abilities. So it took him four years to get onto a horse. Every year we'll go to Hawaii Ma Equine Center and look at the horses and look at the volunteers and look at everybody that rode on the horse. It took us four years. Every year we inch closer. And that is his words every year. He said, mom, dad, I'm working on my courage because I want to get onto that horse. So it took him four years to work on his courage. And he told us at a young age, at grade five and grade six, and he said, it is a little boy saying, I want to be the knight and a hero riding on the horses. And then today he is, he proved that he's a hero to himself mm -hmm. where he can with little bits helps and all the volunteers, they have tons and tons of volunteers that help him, that he's yeah. able to do things independently. Thank you. So, I, so I, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, oh, thank I, you. No, love hearing the uh, the story. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that uh, you taking time and uh, and sharing your son's courage and success. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, next, I will go to uh, uh, Willem Langer Langerberg. Yes. Langenberg. Langenberg. Go ahead, please. Yes. I'm Willem Langenberg. I'm president of Marathon Skating International and the founder of the Silver Skate Festival. Uh, two years ago, I, uh, I reported on some dangerous conditions on, on Shared Pass. This is when uh, I was cycling down to Horlack Park. It's been for 50 years, it's been one of my favorite places in the city. And uh, I crashed. And you can see two years ago, the, the road was clear, but the bicycle pass wasn't. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, now it's, it's much better. Here close to my home on 115th Street, uh, the, the bike pass is cleared. And uh, so I, I could uh, go to Horlack Park. Next slide, please. So Horlack Park, uh, there's a plan to rehabilitate Horlack Park. The city is planning to spend 127 million on rehabilitation of a natural park. <clears throat> the park will be closed for three years. Is this really necessary? Do upgrades such as paving the roads, replacing sewer lines and upgrading washroom cost 127 million? Could these upgrades be done cheaper? Maybe for 7 million? Uh, our, our civil engineer, Brian Johnson, will be talking about the, the engineering aspect of this. The city would save 120 million and could keep the park open. 
Next slide, please. So this is uh, the, my favorite part. This was in November 18th, uh, and it was after two weeks of below zero weather, there was 20 centimeter thick ice. But see, do you see something strange? Well, there is no track, no uh, school tracks being prepared uh, and nothing done on the ice. The city didn't do anything. Next slide, please. Well, a week before that, we had been skating already for a week on Big Lake. That was 20, on that moment, on November 12th, was 25 centimeters thick ice. So we, uh, we had a fun one hour challenge. Uh, next one, please. Lake Louise, uh, can you start uh, the, the video? Next, next slide, please. I guess this video doesn't work. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, there it goes. And next slide, please. Uh, no, well, you have to go back. But but anyway, we had uh, uh, Adele. Can you go back one slide? Adele uh, Baldi. He uh, he was testing the ice here, and he did a salto on the ice. There was ten centimeters thick ice. It's unfortunate that the video doesn't work, but uh, believe me, he did a salto on the ice. And uh, so anyway, so next next slide, please. Uh, so uh, a modest investment of only $150,000 would buy a Zamboni, a good Zamboni. And the Zamboni can go on the ice when it's 25 centimeters thick. It could go on the ice now. But instead, the city just waits till there is 43 centimeters of ice to have a, 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 this heavy watering truck. And uh, the, the Edmonton Speed Skating Club during the Silver Skate Festival has, with their Zamboni, they have shown that you can make really good ice. And uh, they, we have had our members from all over the world for, in our organization, we have members uh, internationally, so they uh, it blows them away when they skate uh, at, at our like park. It's really it's the world's best one kilometer uh, speed skating track, and and the world record, the ladies' world record uh, outdoors for the hour record is was set in the park. So next one, please. So doing this, we would save water. The Zamboni is so much more effective, uh, and, and and we would save fuel and manpower, and this is in accordance with Edmonton's climate change adoption and resilience strategy. So next one, please. This is, in conclusion, the, the city could save 120 million and keep the park open by altering the upgrade plans. A lot of investment of 150,000 would buy a Zamboni, resulting in savings in water, fuel, and manpower costs. And this is in accordance with the uh, climate change adoption and resilience strategy. And so uh, we could just decide to not do it, but maybe another option is to, uh, to defer the project, defer it for four years, and uh, we would be able to build all these swimming pools that uh, are urgently needed. Uh, I mean, it's it's such a strange idea if, in, in our neighborhood, if, if there was a sewer line that needed to re be replaced, the road get closed, but not the whole neighborhood uh, is, is, is going to be closed. So uh, why do we do that with the park? It's one of the favorite places of, of the whole city. And uh, so are we really, we are winter city. We are closing the winter Dang. city. We are closing winter wonderland for three years. Edmonton is proud to be a winter city. Well, it's by closing the park. Thank they show you, Willem. Really Will Thank, Thank you, Willem. Thank you so much. And uh, next we will go to Paula Findlay. Yes, hello. Go ahead. Sorry, I was having technical difficulties earlier for the check-in, but I'm I'm all good to go now. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Paula Findlay. I am a professional triathlete and Olympian, born and raised in Edmonton. I am thrilled to be here to support the three-year vision of hosting the PTO Canadian Open Triathlon in 2023 and 2024, and the Multi-Sport World Championships in 2025. Um, I am an athlete board member with the Professional Triathlete Organization, which is an athlete-owned entity of professional triathletes who have come together to promote and contribute to the triathlon community worldwide. 
We've implemented policies in our sports such as maternity leave policies and equality and prize money amongst men and women. In 2022, Edmonton hosted the inaugural PTO Canadian Open Championships. I was lucky to compete in the professional women's event in front of my home crowd and finished in second place. From an athlete perspective and from, from what I've heard from all of my peers, it was one of the most exciting, challenging, and interesting long distance triathlon courses we've ever experienced. Climbing in and out of the river valley several times each lap created an extremely dynamic course that really showcased Edmonton in a beautiful way. With a TV broadcast reaching millions of people worldwide, I was extremely proud to call Edmonton home. Triathlon has a rich history in Edmonton. As an 11 year old, I remember watching my sporting heroes like Simon Whitfield race around Horlack Park. And that sparked my dream to someday race for Canada and become an Olympian. That legacy continues to this day, thanks to the hard work of the organizing committees, the support from the city of Edmonton and the amazing volunteers who come back year after year. The events are run flawlessly, and from an athlete perspective, it's an incredibly impressive and professional race experience. What makes the PTO triathlon event so unique is the format of professional athletes and age group athletes racing on the same course on the same weekend. This doesn't happen in other sports and really creates a sense of connection and relatability, racing the exact same course as some of the fastest, fastest athletes on the planet and bringing in athletes from all over the world. It also brings out big crowds for the professional races, which is really fun for us as everyone who has finished the age group race stays out and cheers for us and creates a really exciting atmosphere. My hope is that with the continued legacy of host, hosting world-class triathlon events in the city of Edmonton, other young athletes can watch us race around the city and can inspire an active lifestyle, maybe an Olympic dream like it did for me 21 years ago. This booming sport is an incredible opportunity to showcase our city. Triathlon, triathlon is really a sport for all ages across many different distances, and it's approachable and welcoming even for true beginners. Um, when you think of triathlon in Canada, um, Edmonton is the first city that comes to mind for most people, and I really hope it can continue this way for years to come. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm actually calling in from a race where I'm competing on Sunday, but I really am excited to come back to Edmonton next year and for years to come to race in front of a home crowd. So thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for joining us and good luck on, uh, on Sunday and, uh, and thank, we're, we're very, very proud of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And next we will go to uh, George Del Bella, Bello, sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my name is George Dalbello. I am here on behalf of the Edmonton Masters Swim Club. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We've been around since 1980. Uh, typically every year we have about 100 members, sometimes up to 150 members. And what we do is we offer year round swimming, uh, master swimming, competitive swimming, and non competitive swimming for adults uh, 18 plus. Uh, we have members that are uh, setting world masters records for age group 100, uh, 95 to 100. So uh, what we do is we offer master swimming programming at uh, city-owned aquatics facilities. And um, we're, we're very concerned as a club about the Lewis Estates uh, plan to reduce from a 53 meter pool to a 25 meter pool. Um, we don't think it's the right time that uh, that this should be done. And ultimately we don't think it's an economical decision for the city. Um, just a, a few more things about us. We, we are um, a recipient of the community grant, community investment operating grant. And we actually use that city money specifically to offer noon hour swimming for seniors that uh, cannot drive to the pool during nighttime. Uh, our practices at uh, Kinsman are typically 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. That's the only time that the city has afforded us. Uh, the city has uh, policies that are in place regarding high performance teams. And uh, despite the fact that we do have a competitive side, the city has deemed us non-competitive, which uh, affects our ability to get pool space. Um, I think uh, it was mentioned yesterday, only 4% of city aquatic space time on any given week is actually available for groups like us. Um, that leaves us with basically no time um, to, to actually have our practices. Uh, so 
Um, one of the things that we like to do is, is offer for seniors, and, and we think that's an important step. Um, ultimately, uh, our position on, on the Lewis St Estates Rec Center is that um, just like any one in 50, one in 100 year facility that you're building, uh, this needs to stand the test of time, not just now, but 50 years from now, we don't wanna have a facility that's overcrowded. Uh, ultimately, the same reason uh, that we build LRT over 170th Street, we want to build facilities that have an enduring legacy and enduring capacity for growth, especially in the West End, which is an area of the city that will continue to grow long term into the future. Um, so if you were to try to take a 25 meter pool and build it to a 53 meter pool in the future, you're just gonna be adding huge costs later, or you have to buy new land, you have to buy a new facility somewhere else. Um, it, it's just not feasible, considering that the city's taken this project to this level with this amount of design and engineering in place. Um, so for us, and, and especially given the city plan, we feel this is one of the last opportunities that we have as an aquatics community, as a master swim club, to have a facility that like this. Um, so what's so nice about this facility as proposed, it's a FINA proposed, um, FINA technical specifications facility. That means we can host events. Um, to give you an example, we've hosted events, our club hosted an event at Kinsman about 10 years ago called Masters Nationals. Uh, that's a national event. It brings together about a thousand people from all across Canada, all age groups, all economic walks of life, all socioeconomic positions, and we compete uh, and, you know, we do lane swimming, we compete in races. Um, we haven't been able to host that event in a long time because of uh, capacity limitations in the city's pool system. If we were to have this Lewis Estates, uh, we could definitely host that event. And actually, Swimming Canada wants us to host it. We just haven't been able to find a way to make that happen. Um, if I could speak uh, very briefly too, from my own experience, I used to be a lifeguard. I used to teach adult swimming lessons. I used to coach swim teams. Um, and I have seen our team bring in new Canadians. Uh, in fact, our city is a, a huge target for new Canadians coming to Canada for the first time. Swimming is a life skill that ultimately, I think every new Canadian that doesn't know how to swim should learn how to swim. Um, swimming lesson space has been affected by the lack of capacity in the city system. Um, our ability to offer services to new Canadians is ultimately gonna be limited by this as well. Um, as a club, we bring together people of all socioeconomic walks of life. I think that that creates a huge sense of community and you've heard from some of the clubs that are part of that community. Um, so it, it is in a way it is an existential threat for our, our club if we cannot continue to have um, aquatic space offered within the city. Certainly Lewis Estates is the best available option on the table right now for, for the aquatics community. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you so much, uh, George. So that concludes the list, but I'm gonna go back to the list for people who were not present, see if they are here now. Ryan Paul, Ryan Paul, are you there? No, Mark, sir. Mr. Mark Senior, uh, Mark Senior, I, please go I'm ahead. Here, thank you. Please go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good day, Mayor Sowey and Councillors. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you. I really appreciate it. I'm going to speak today in favor of implementing the city's bike plan, uh, specifically the approach recommended by the Urban Planning Committee to rapidly build out a network of connecting routes throughout the city in the the budget period 2023 to 26. Um, in 2019, Edmonton declared a climate emergency, and I think that was the right move then. Um, the addition of a carbon budget to this year's budget is an excellent move to really meaningfully and measurably addressing that emergency. Um, some other measures going on, like electrifying city vehicles, these are nice, but they're mostly symbolic actions if they keep the basic model of people moving through the city in heavy individual motor vehicles. Right, we can't get there without significant modal shift to active transport. Um, the recent and some upcoming changes to zoning, uh, removing single family zoning, allowing more mixed uses, uh, removing parking minimums, these are really strong moves that I think have the potential to get as much closer to our climate goals than things like changing the fuel that we put in our vehicles. Um, like the strongest 
transportation plan is really your land use plan. Um, and this will also has the potential to shape the city into a more equitable one, right? Where we can age in place, where we can keep our local support networks throughout our lives. Uh, but again, we can't get there without a modal shift away from driving. Uh, the 15 minute city model has targets for the sorts of services accessible in a five minute walk, a 15 minute walk, which is essentially equivalent to a five minute bike ride or transit ride and a 15 minute bike or transit ride. Um, but this all breaks if you can't ride 15 minutes in any one direction without encountering the obstacle of an unsafe road crossing. And the bike plan that the planning committee is recommended implementing would go a long way towards addressing that. Um, finally, I just want to say from a personal perspective, an important factor that guided our choice of where to live in Ward Métis was the area's ease of use in getting around without driving, mainly on foot and on bicycles. And this works well enough for us confident adults, but um, my daughter does not have the degree of confidence on a bike that I do. And so she doesn't get the same freedom of movement that a bicycle really has the potential to, to grant her, to unlock for her. Um, and I would love to live in a city where that can come true, right? Where all ages and all abilities uh, can be empowered to move with greater mobility and independence through active transportation. Um, and if the bike plan is funded, I think that can come true. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, now we next go to Sharif Haji. Hi, um, Mayor Sahi, uh, City Councilors. Um, thank you for the opportunity, and I'm sorry I missed the first uh, opportunity. Um, triple tasking with some of the work, uh, but I appreciate your uh, perseverance throughout yesterday and, and, and today, continuing to this public hearing, really appreciate it. I sent letters to uh, all council members and, um, and the mayor, and this is in relation to the African uh, Multicultural Center. Thank you for those who uh, responded, um, despite being very busy with this uh, budget deliberations and public hearing. And uh, for those who didn't respond, I totally understand. It's, 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 it's a time that you can't get through your emails. Um, but what I said in the letter is, is basically uh, the city of Edmonton uh, in similar kind of exercise in 2019, I talked to this council in the chamber asking the allocation of funding to move the, the capital project, the Wellington capital project uh, to move forward. In 2019, December, it was supplementary budget discussion that uh, amount of funding was moved to 2022, 2026. I knew that we would lose time in the process. By this time, we would have been ready with the schematic design stage, but that didn't happen. I don't want to uh, uh, go back and talk much about that because I have been back and forth in the, in the city council to discuss and update the city council in terms of the work that we have done since then. But one thing that I wanted to highlight is uh, that, uh, that this is a council that, and we really, really appreciate your commitment to diversity and inclusion, your commitment to anti-racism, and making the, your first inaugural, putting out anti-racism strategy, proclaiming and witnessing to be part of the global stage in terms of uh, uh, recognition of the decade for people of African descent. What that means is that it's a decade that's dedicated on recognition, um, justice and development. So your proclamation on that, that included anti-Black racism action plan will mean recognizing the contributions um, and the black, the, 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 the black communities and the African descent group communities in Edmonton being a fabric of this society. What it means in the, in the proclamation is that's recognizing the justices that you have to make when it comes to budget deliberations and what comes to resource allocations. But what it means, uh, the recognition, what, what it means, the declaration is also development, development in the areas of social participation, development in the areas of economic participation of African descent communities of Edmontonians. So my ask is, I was disappointed to not have a service package included in the budget. And my ask is an amendment to be made and make sure that uh, the strategy phase of that project to be included in this budget. This is 
uh, what will put Edmonton, not today, but you're making a commitment for Edmonton in the next uh, 100 years to come. So my ask and my request to the council, and one more time, is to take into consideration and look into the budget that you make today with the lenses of a black Edmontonian and see what you have allocated in terms of this community when it comes to the capital uh, budget deliberations and allocations for the capital project. And I thank you for all the hard work that you do throughout these deliberations. And I wish you all the best for the rest of the discussion on this uh, 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 capital uh, budget 2022-2026. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharif. Uh, next, I will check if Crystal Ling is here. Crystal Ling. One, two, three. I'm here. I'm here. Here you are. Here. I was just about to. Oh. Okay. All right. You have five minutes, Crystal. All right. Go um, ahead. I'm okay. I'm here to uh, urge you to fund the budget plan for this bu budget. I wish I could be there in person, but right now I'm at work and. Google Meet isn't allowed at work because I work for the government. Um, but basically, I just want to say that I see both sides of the issue because I have a car and I also have bicycles. But bicycle is my preferred mode of transportation, and I'll put more kilometers on my bike than I do on my car, actually. And I'll use it to go everywhere Ooh. in the city all year round. Um, like even today, I biked to work. It was a 30 minute commute from. Parkview to just northwest of Mayfield, which is an industrial area. So there aren't very many, actually there are no bike lanes going here. I was going with traffic and it can be kind of scary sometimes. Um, usually motorists are pretty good, but especially now in the winter, it can be hard to um, get to where you need to go safely. Um, so I pretty much use my bicycle for everything, whether it's work or fun. Like earlier this week, I went to the skating oval in Victoria Park, and that was good. The bike paths were, were the bike paths were nice and clear, um, and I'll do errands like getting groceries. And even last night, I went down to the city hall for the uh, hearings, but they went overboard, so I had to go back home. But the bike paths were really nice going to city hall. Um, but like I said, going to work, um, especially outside of the city core, there isn't any bike infrastructure, um, and it makes it really unsafe, I feel like. Like even yesterday, I was biking on the road, and a pedestrian told me, good luck, um, because he could see it was dark, and even though I was wearing my high-vis vest and had my lights on, it, it's pretty scary out there on the road. Um, and sometimes drivers will yell at you to get off the road or ride on the sidewalk, but I know you're not supposed to ride on the sidewalk, so I don't do that. Um, and even, like I was saying before, winter can just be really hard to get to where you need to go. Um, the side streets I usually use in the summer, I can't use them because the roads aren't clear, so I don't feel so safe over there. Um, and yeah, I try to ride a safe distance from the cars, but I'm afraid someday I might get doored or a driver won't be checking and then I'll get hurt or will get hurt. So basically I'm urging you to fund the bike plan and support active transportation. I don't want to be on the road. I'd rather be on a bike path or a multi-use path. And I did contact my counselors about this, like counselors Mack and Hamilton, and they seem supportive of the bike plan, but also unsure of when it's going to happen and where the money's going to be. Um, so that's about it. I just want active transportation to be funded and funded right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Crystal, for joining us. Sorry we couldn't accommodate you last night, uh, but really appreciate that you were able to join us today. All right, so that concludes the presentations from uh, uh, panel number six. Now we go to questions to uh, members of the panel. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks very much. Um, you know, it's just wonderful to hear from so, so many Edmontonians and, and I do appreciate all of the presentations that were made uh, today. Uh, maybe just starting with you, Ms. Gingras, just wondering, um, 
Was there anything else you wished to add <laughs> to the end of your presentation? Well, it might be helpful to add what I was asking for. <laughs> Go figure. Um, so um, the Edmonton Community Foundation has graciously um, provided us with um, a four-year commitment for funding, uh, totaling a million dollars. And um, my request to um, council was to, um, actually it wasn't even to meet that, it was to um, um, uh, provide us with um, ongoing operational funding um, over three years. Um, at a decreasing amount because I, um, based on my cash flow of projections, I believe we'll have enough um, return from our existing developments um, that will allow us to do what we need to do, which is add um, people to our um, very small organization. We have two full-time and Two part time. Great. <laughs> well, just just in the interest of time. Sorry, I apologize. Um, I assume that we will have that in in writing. And just wondering as well. I you know I really appreciate um, your intention to to become self sufficient and to to sort of decrease off of the city operating grant. And is that something that that you would be comfortable reporting back to us on in, in a year's time even? Oh, absolutely. Great. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I'd love to share what we're doing. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just for Mr. Ramji, if you're still there, Zach, are you still there? Yes, I am. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for joining us and sticking with us. Uh, you know, I really appreciated you highlighting what what the property tax um, uh, reimbursement program would allow uh, your organization to do. So I just I really wanted to emphasize that point that that you were a nonprofit. Um, you would be reinvesting this funding into the properties, which, which al would ultimately allow you to keep rents low. You wouldn't have to increase rents to meet the maintenance needs um, at your buildings. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct, absolutely, because we want to maintain uh, the current rental structure that we have. We uh, are trying to avoid increasing rents, and so this grant would allow us to reinvest uh, into our uh, operating maintenance and uh, capital maintenance as well. Perfect. Correct. Great. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think I think those were all the questions I had, but again, really appreciated all of the presentations today. Thank, thank you, you Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Jans. Thank you very much. My first question is for guest Ahmad. Are they still with us? Uh, Mubarak Ahmad? Yes, right? I'm, I'm yeah. still here. I had a question. One thing that comes up about cemeteries is the high carbon emissions of cemeteries, enormous amounts of uh, uh, concrete and, and other, other uh, pieces going into that. Um, am I to understand, though, that a, uh, a proper Muslim funeral or cemetery involves minimal carbon emissions because it is a, uh, an, an, uh, the body is uh, covered in a cloth and and uh, uh, in interred that way. Am I am I correct in that understanding? Well, at South Haven Cemetery, we are still required to use that concrete box, which the city provides. So it's no different, really, than any other burial from that perspective. Interesting. Okay. Well, maybe that's a point to follow up on um, later on. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask, is uh, guest Joseph still here from Health City? Yes. Uh, a question about, um, again, this is a very compelling case. Something that we heard from speakers this morning is we should render unto the province that which is the province's and maybe something like this should be an area of provincial investment. Could you, could you elaborate on that? <clears throat> yes, absolutely, Councillor. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, you're very correct. Uh, as health is a provincial jurisdiction, uh, we've been working very closely with the province. And what I wasn't able to sort of mention because I ran out of time <laughs> was that uh, we're actually working on an agreement with the province of Alberta and the federal government uh, for $5 million worth of additional funding to come in for the projects that we're doing uh, to help our local companies uh, scale within the system. So, so would that be contingent matching funding from the city? They're looking for, for the city to, to provide the, the base operating so that they can then provide uh, the additional programming funding. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, 
and if I can go to guest uh, Maleko, um, so we hear about if we invest in regional transit, we will see potentially this future uptick in ridership. If we invest in frequency, we'll, we will see potentially this uptick squared or centupled. If we invest in transit safety, we'll see improvements as well. I just was wondering if you can help of all the, I put this to another speaker last night, of all the investments we can make in transit, which ones are the most important to increase ridership? Safety, for sure. I think that if we um, increase the safety in our transit system, we would have an increase in riders. I hear in the news all the time that people aren't taking the transit systems. They're afraid to go on the LRT because it is unsafe and they are, they've are they chosen to um, take another mode of transportation to their work or, or school. Okay, interesting. And um, if City Council was to only commit to the first phase of the regional transit model, um, would that assuage some of your concerns? No. I, it would not. I don't think that it's a good plan at all. And um, it has too many um, liabilities. And uh, as we, the further we go into it, the more those liabilities increase. Um, you know, we splitting of assets, um, legal. There's just no. There's there's just no reason to fund a, a, a regional transit system when we already have a regional transit system in place. Um, for example, Strathcona and St. Albert have their own systems that are regional, completely regional transit. Uh, Fort Saskatchewan, Leduc, and Spruce Grove um, have contracts with Edmonton. Uh, the partnership we have with the airport is in place. There's no need to fund a second, that, like give money to a third party to fund something we already have or could do. I mean, I'm not saying we can't do things better. There's always room for improvement, but the things that we, but to give money to a third party makes no sense at all when we have other needs. So if we were to take that 13 million and not put it towards regional phase one, where would you want to see it reinvested in, in, in Edmonton? The money could be f better spent funding TPOs to make, uh, to bring order and safety to our system. Just thirteen million into we're already uh, no, spending. Well, we're already there's, spending eight million there. There's there a, there's um, there, the increasing services. There's there's um, you know um, we need a we need a barn. We need a barn and uh, like I said. Sorry, in our, I'm out of time. Sorry. But sorry. sorry. Next we go to Councillor Rutherford. Thank you. <clears throat> My question is to, to Marcel Hukalek. Hukalek. And I, I've heard this a few times in other panels, and unfortunately, you know, with five minutes and there was other speakers I had questions to, I never got to this question. Because I'm, I'm kind of a little bit concerned about this narrative that's circulating right now about bus rapid versus LRT, and that it's an either-or conversation rather than a both-and, because our mass transit like our, our mass transit plan and city plan says we need both. And I, I'm just, I'm trying to understand why we wouldn't want both and, like why is it either, why are we, why are we switching to either or? Um, basically the BRT has similar benefits, similar performance to the LRT, but is much cheaper to implement. So uh, but, you could- But is it all around? Cause like I'll give an example. The metro line going into Castle Downs and eventually to St. Albert is there's no there would be no road in which bus could rapidly go that way. So if you're switching to bus rapid over, you're either going to reconfigure the roads for major major dollars to have bus rapid go in that direction, or you're not going to have mass transit to that quadrant of the city. Um, if you can build an LRT in that direction, you can build a BRT in that direction. So the uh, question either or, I think that's not true. You can build the, the BRT in there. Uh, it's again, not exclusive. Uh, and, and the BRT would be cheaper. It's a road technology to build versus the rail technology that uh, is just by experience much, much exp more expensive. 
Okay, because I'm, I'm really trying to understand this because I'm, I'm really, like I know there's a paradigm shift here and I'm genuinely asking this because I don't, like I'm again going to focus on the, the one that isn't even, that's been promised to community since 1970 and now we're changing the conversation to maybe not even having a line go that way. It's concerning to me. But if you're looking at that way, there is a concept plan for that, the metro line. But if you were to switch that to bus rapid, you would literally have to build a road. You would have to build a road straight through those neighborhoods the way that the LRT line would be going. So how would that be any more eco-friendly or cost effective? Again, by experience, uh, if you look at the LRT costs and you look at bus rapid costs, these are experiences around the world, it's a, roughly a one third cost for BRT for the same length. But so, that's if there's already an existing road infrastructure, correct, or not? No, this is brand new BRT. Uh, the the construction uh, is is just less expensive. Um, I'd like to um, may, maybe uh, to reframe this to, this answer a little bit. I showed the um, Edmonton Transit Advisory Board quote sort of telling you that BRT is more effective. The other thing that um, might be a bit of a surprise to you, in 1995, I worked in Edmonton's Transportation Master Plan. My supervisor at the time brought forward a plan to stop LRT and give BRT, get, get BRT going. And it was the only thing council changed in it. This is not a new idea to Edmonton. Mm -hmm. It's been around before and the fundamental reason is we can get bigger bang for the buck with BRT. No, I appreciate, I appreciate understanding that. Um, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Cardinal. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, oh, the temptation. Uh, to, um, first of all, to Paula Finley, I just would like to ask you a couple more questions if she's still here. I'm not sure if she's still connected with us. I'm still here. Hi. I'm about to go for a drive, but I'm still here. <laughs> we'll let you get. We'll get you to get that run going in a minute. I. Uh, so I'm just curious. We have a long history of triathlon in Edmonton, and I'm and I'm wondering if it was that early history that got you involved in the sport and, and inspired you to compete. Yeah, it definitely was. I like I said, I remember watching the World Cup triathlon back in 2001. I think it was. I would have been 11 at the time. And Simon Whitfield had just won the gold medal yeah. at the City Olympics. So I watched him race. I was swimming with the Keanu Swim Club soon after that. And I really never thought I'd be, like, good enough to be an Olympic athlete. But it definitely made me aware of the sport, whereas I didn't really know what triathlon was before that. So um, certainly was, uh, like, a Kickstarter, I guess, to get me into, into the sport and get me running and uh, ultimately become an Olympian uh, 10 years later. And that, you're, you're unique in that you made it all the way to the Olympics, but you're not unique in Edmonton. There's quite a thriving triathlon community here. True? Yeah, so the Edmonton Triathlon Academy exists now. It didn't when I started. So I was swimming with the swim club, running with the Edmonton Thunder Track Club, and then putting the three sports together. But now there is the luxury or the um, added advantage of having the triathlon academy there. So young kids can start at a younger age and kind of specialize their skills when they're younger. Um, that's not completely necessary, as I showed, but it definitely is nice and um, just makes kids more aware of the sport, which I think is really cool. And uh, to keep having the race every year, I think is critical in that because you can watch the world's best athletes race in our hometown and in young kids' hometowns, and that ultimately is what inspires people to get into it. And uh, the legacy lives on in that with the Coronation Rec Centre, we'll have, uh, I think, the only training centre in North America where triathletes can compete in all three sports or train in all three sports in one indoor facility. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's correct. The, that's definitely necessary in Edmonton as the winter months are very long. Um, I sort of made it work by running a lot of track, competing on the, or right, riding the trainer a lot, and then swimming at the Kinsman. But to have all three in one venue is really cool and unique. And uh, that pool is beautiful, a 50 meter pool. You can't find those very often in other cities. So for Edmonton to have two is really amazing. And then the velodrome and the track all in one facility is definitely like a triathlon hotspot. And we'll just continue to contribute to Edmonton's, um, you know, known on 
the, in the country as a, the triathlon mecca. Yeah, and around the world, I'd say. Uh, so thank you, and good luck this weekend. It's, uh, it's great to hear from you. Uh, Thanks, Jim. Uh, to Mr. Joseph, just quickly, uh, uh, Councillor Jan has asked a couple questions about um, Health City and some of the, the initiatives you have going. Has there been uh, a conversation around your table uh, around moving to self-sustainability and what that would look like and, and perhaps timelines uh, around that uh, possibility? Yeah, I think that um, the self-sustainability portion of it uh, may be a different conversation. I think that there's different pools of funding that we can... Uh, we can have support where Health Cities is going. I think uh, on a self stability side, we would be really industry funded, and I think that there's some challenges with that in terms of where we're trying to do, in terms of driving outcomes in social services and, and in health. But alternative funding paths, absolutely. And, and happy to have those conversations. Yeah, yeah, and I think we should have those conversations because it's my understanding that, you know, the, the scope of your work is kind of moved beyond just the borders of the city. It's, it's more regional and even more national and international, is that true? Uh, I think the, the potential for impact is there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the activities that we're doing right here in Edmonton uh, actually holds for models across Canada. So the potential impact and for Edmonton to actually drive those models across Canada is there. Um, but um, to receive uh, provincial and federal funding, they are looking for impact beyond just Edmonton. And so we, we've been looking at partnering with other organizations as well. And I have only have 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Joseph, but I'm uh, just curious if there's been a shift in focus to more digital health and, and more of that um, uh, synthetic data sets and those kinds of things. Yeah, for absolutely, and, and uh, for two reasons. One, just because that's where growth opportunity lies for us. It also addresses our challenges in terms of rural care and so forth. And lastly, that's where we have a lot of our strengths. Great, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your presentations. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Cardinal. Well, folks, I got to leave. I got to head over to the legislature. To uh, I've been invited to be listened to the throne speech, and I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Councilor Wright for the next few hours. Okay. Bye. I'll do my best. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. So up next, we have Ashley Southdoor. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to start with with Karen Gingras. I, I just need a few pieces of clarification. Um, so I understand you're looking for ongoing operational funding for three years from the city. Um, and I apologize if I missed this, but the exact amount yep. would be? It's, um, I think it was 750. Okay. Uh, great. And then what conversations have been had with administration on this? I'm just wondering, um, yeah, I guess I'm wondering why it wasn't included as an, an unfunded uh, profile or yeah, service package actually. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> um, we put together a report um, for city admin and they took that report and edited it and um, edited out our request for funding saying that um, wasn't their role to ask for funding. So um, that I think would be why it wasn't included. Um, but I am, uh, I, yeah, I was a bit surprised, but um, that was the explanation I received. Okay, okay. no, I, I appreciate some of the background there and some of the clarity and um, yeah, rationale for why we're, why we're seeing it now. Okay, and then I'm going to jump to Marcel as well. Um, yeah, find, finding the conversation around LRT, BRT really interesting and, you know, recognizing that a lot of our, our current LRT projects are already underway. Um, I'm looking at some of the unfunded work for BRT planning and design. Uh, is that, I guess, is that what you are advocating for? Um, <laughs> would it be to get started on the groundwork that's necessary to ultimately have a BRT, a functional BRT system in Edmonton? Um, as a group, ERVCC has not uh, discussed sort of exactly where to go, but I think you're in the right ballpark wanting to accelerate the BRT uh, going and to, to stop the uh, uh, LRT. So uh, moving that funding over at a minimum, yeah. Okay, okay, that's helpful. 
Um, and then I would just maybe zoom back a little bit and ask for your perspective as a transportation engineer. Uh, you know, what other transit related profiles are you interested in seeing move forward? Sorry, I didn't quite catch what up. What other transportation related profiles are you interested in seeing move forward? When we look at sort of a multimodal transportation network in the city. Right, yeah. Um, you know, basically, you want to take care of your your vulnerable, your most uh, disadvantaged citizens, so uh, pedestrians, um, transit users, uh, cyclists. Uh, usually, because of the speed of those modes are the slowest. Uh, so, what you can do to encourage them and and their their modes that uh, don't have the privilege of usually uh, wealth that comes with car ownership. So, uh, they're they're the ones that are the most disadvantaged and need the most help. Great, thank you. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you very much for everyone's uh, input. Um, I'll start, just a final few questions for Karen. Um, so if I'm clear, you currently have 10 properties that you're, you're redeveloping, and, but you're also looking to, uh, to acquire 22. Is that correct? Why not, why not finish the redevelopment of those 10 get yourselves to a financially stable point by selling them um, before kind of moving on to that next phase? Um, that's actually what we're doing. Okay. Is because um, we do not have the um, loan amount, loan oh. balance left to actually do purchases. Oh, from, from SDF. Right, and that okay. doesn't come from our mm -hmm. operation money. That is strictly from our own financing our own arrangements, so we are managing it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, and what is your plan if you don't receive this funding? If we don't receive the funding, then um, we're going to um, have to slow down uh, and just focus on what I'm able to do. <laughs> fair, no, fair enough, <clears throat> thank you. Um, to Julian, um, question about Arts Habitat. <clears throat> So for the cultural infrastructure plan, this was identified in 2018, connection exchanges. But at the time, there, there was no resource, there's no funding attached to implement that. Is that, is that my, is my understanding correct? Uh, Arts Habitat has been funded since 96 through the Edmonton Arts Council. And um, uh, the Edmonton Arts Council, uh, and, and we left that funding, it was coming through the Edmonton Arts Council in, 20, in 2020. So we have a direct service agreement now with the city. Um, uh, in the 2018 budget, the Arts Council received funding to do the execution of the connections and exchanges, but we received no increase to do the work we have to do in that. So that's why this increase is coming now the, in the, this cycle. The, there is no increase to what we're requesting at this point. This is just continuing on with the same funding that we have received through many, many years. I see, but it's just a different uh, fiscal relationship, essentially, rather than through it Arts is Council. Exactly, you're going, yeah. okay. the, the funding would go through the Edmonton Arts Council funding, and then they would fund us. We were embedded in there. And in 2020, we came out and now have a direct service agreement with the city. Mm -hmm. I had a number of written questions for you, and I pre really appreciate the detailed responses. Um, so I'm not going to rehash those, but I think I just just one more thing I wanted to uh, just to clarify then. So because of your f change in the fiscal relationship, um, is that why you don't have a 2021 annual report, for example? No, there is a 2021 oh, annual report. Oh, there is. Yeah, oh, oh, sure, okay, of course, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't find it um, oh, on the website. I do apologize. It's been provided to administration. Oh, I see, but, um, it's, but it's, it's, it will be published. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering for Chris, Jane Phillips, uh, I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on the low friction, low barrier aspect to, to the Heritage Council granting program, because it's not often when a, ben when a grant beneficiary come forward and talk about that. Yeah, I've worked as a grant writer for CJSR. Um, I'm a master's student, so I've applied for grants there, and I've applied for grants as an artist too, so with many hats, I've applied for grants, and. Um, the, just the process to get a grant application together can be really intimidating, especially for first-time applicants. Um, it, just 
having to put together a budget for the first time and feel the confidence to feel like you can make that kind of request um, can be intimidating. And EHC, I find their their, their process, um, it, it is reasonable, the amount that they ask. They ask for like accountability, for sure. You have to do a reporting so, on what you actually spent it on, but it's reasonable. So why is that important, say, for equity-seeking groups? If you are um, from a group that has like a marginalized community and you haven't felt the, the confidence before to apply for a grant, EHC is a good first time um, grant funder, I would think, um, because they, they offer good workshops and they, they give you the support. They'll hold your hand through the process. Yeah. And I understand it's, full, it's, it's, it's often highly subscribed, uh, but really helps you unlock a lot of that potential. Yes. Just a quick clarification with Reg. Uh, you said uh, you are accessing five million from the provincial government, but re would that would require still significant city f matching funding. Is that right? <coughs> Yeah, so just one clarification, it's five million combined with the province oh, and the federal government. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and then what they're looking for is that operational funding from the city so that we can keep operating to Whatever get those Whatever it funds. is right now. Okay, Correct. gotcha, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Ramji, my first question is for you. Are you still online? Yes, I am. Hi there. Uh, Hi. So I, I'm just curious about the mixed income housing. What is your occupancy rate of the at market or near market units? Yeah, uh, so I can go based on the experience that we have in a, in a, a London Dairy uh, project. That's a 240 unit uh, building. Uh, so what we found is that uh, in both cases, uh, sorry, in all cases, the both the near market and in markets, uh, there's demand for them, but the, the biggest demand is in the near market as well as the deep subsidy. Uh, that's where we are finding um, us uh, to be, wh where we have the biggest uh, demand. Uh, but that said, uh, I believe out of the 240 units, uh, and I think this, this was of yesterday, we have 15 vacant units left. And of those 15 units, the majority are market. Uh, but again, uh, we, we believe that in the next two months, those market units will, will also be filled up. So there is a lot of demand, but again, I, I, I want to reiterate that the biggest demand is in the affordable segment of our housing and, and the deep discount segment of our housing. Yeah, that is my understanding as well. And and uh, yeah. th and that's why I'd like to see those units occupied um, because we do uh, have a need for it out there. Absolutely. And uh, we, we, we reserve the, uh, some of the larger units for our, uh, our customers and tenants who are who need affordable housing and uh, those five, four, three bedroom units that were snapped up right away. Right. Again, this is based on my understanding and experience at our London Dairy facility. Right. Uh, the near market uh, housing stock that I talked about earlier this morning uh, is mostly one and two bedrooms. But again, we are we having we're having a lot of demand in that segment as well, mm -hmm. uh, and we want to hold the line on the affordable component of the rentals and and enable in, in order to, to enable us to hold the line. We would have to, um, you know, uh, get some kind of a funding for the maintenance uh, of those units because they do need to be updated in some, in many cases. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer, okay. uh, Mr. Main. Uh, my next questions are for you. So you had mentioned Arts Hub, One Eighteen, McEwen House. Uh, are those owned by the city? No, they're owned by us, um, uh, by Arts Habitat. They're owned by Arts Habitat, but they're being operated by funding through the city? They're, they're self-sustaining. Uh, Arts Habitat, Ar Arts Hub 118, uh, we lease to a housing cooperative, uh, the Arts Hub 118 Housing Cooperative. Um, and through that, they pay the mortgage on that and, and operations and okay. so on and so forth. So we own that, but we lease it. Right. Um, a McLuhan House uh, we own, uh, and it was purchased by the assistance of the city. Uh, the down payment, but we hold the mortgage on that. Okay, so Ortona and Orange Hub are o city Orange assets. Hub, of course, is city-owned, and uh, and we're working with a management agreement just on the spaces in that building that are dealing with arts and culture, uh, because it's a multifaceted building. Mm -hmm. uh, Ortona, uh, did you ask about Ortona? Yes. Yes, yes sorry. Uh, Ortona, we have not signed a lease for. So the intent is that we would sign a management lease next year once the budget is all sorted out. Okay, um, and then in your report it, it mentions affordable rates. 
so there must be revenue coming in because in in our what we see here there's nothing for revenue so uh, on our tuna yes or, yes yes there will be uh, revenue coming in from from rental rates or from usage rates in either rental or leasing or what have you okay yeah so the yeah, the information that we've received we don't see any oh okay any yeah. uh, indication that there will be revenue Okay. Uh, can you explain how um, in 2023 the request is for 60,000 and then 2024 653,000? What's why is there such a big jump from? Oh, sure. Uh, the the intent is that the um, uh, the operations the building will open. I, construction wise, they're still not completely sure, but the rehabilitation should be done by second quarter of 2024. So the 60,000 is just setting up to get us into that. And then the actual uh, uh, full amount is realized in the 2024. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, oh, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Cartmel, with Councillor Hamilton gone, can you take the chair while I ask my questions? I can indeed, I have the chair. Thank you. Okay, I better leave the mic on if I wanna ask. Um, uh, Ms. Maleko, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you're looking for, for or recommending 48 TPOs to provide safety in that. How many do we have right now? 90. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so if we're paying them over time, I'm guessing at at least time and a half, if not double time, um, we'd end up saving money, wouldn't we? Well, we're losing TPOs. I mean, it's they're over. They're stressed out. They're taking time off. They cannot. They can't keep up at that rate. Like we knew, we need more TPOs. So yeah. So if if we have those extras, that takes the stress off right. the ones yes. that are currently. Yes. We don't have to pay overtime. We're saving money on those costs. Exactly, um, and we can fund our um, teams more efficiently, like the the TCAT teams and the. Um, the other team? The COT? The COT, the COT team, okay. right. Okay. That's what it's called. All right, awesome. Um, so that makes sense to me. Um, and then you'd also mentioned about we haven't had service hour increases in how many years? I believe it's eight years. Wow, okay. That might explain a few things out in some of the uh, newer developed areas then. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, and... Yeah, I think that was all that I have. Oh, the 11 month contracts. Um, I think when Mr. Bradshaw was here yesterday, that was clarified that we, that your work, city administration is working with getting that resolved, right? Yes, okay. we're working on it. Okay, good stuff, thank you. Um, Mr. Joseph, you said something um, about the city's annual investment. So what's, our, what's the city's return on that investment? <laughs> Uh, good question. So the annual investment is uh, 985000 from the city. And uh, over the four years, uh, we've 10x that in terms of returns brought back. Four million in cash and six million uh, in kind contribution. Okay. And that's returned back to the city or that's kept within? Re returned help? back to uh, the organizations and companies that we're trying to support. Okay. Okay. So not a not direct, to the city not directly. a direct return, no. but but helping our community. Correct. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I was also wondering about: um, so Have you reached out at all? Um, with such a good return on investment, I guess. Have you reached out to the uh, venture capital markets to assist at all? Uh, yeah. Sure. So uh, the venture capital markets are. Uh, investing in our companies okay. and so what what the venture capital markets are saying is that with the work that we're doing we are de-risking companies okay. making them more investable and hence we've actually seen uh, a significant increase in the amount of investments going into health tech companies in our region okay perfect thank you um, and um, oh mr. Ahmed you're still there Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, can you, can you reach out to me to give me a little bit more information on this and exactly, well, I guess I'll just ask you, how much were you looking for um, with the we city for We would probably the buy about 100 lots. 100 lots? 
And what was the main obstacle that? The main obstacle is basically, well, the cemetery expansion was not funded. So that's the first step. Okay. And, and, and we are basically running out of lots for our members. Okay. Okay, and how much was the expansion that the city was looking at? I'm sorry, I don't have- I, 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 Yeah, I, I, I only was visually sh shown the plan uh, in the Muslim expansion area, there were more, much more than 100 lots. From what I recall. Okay. But the department would have those details. Okay, I'll check in with an admin about that. Thank you very much. Um, okay. And I had one more. No, that's it. That's all. Thank you. I'll take the chair back. Return the chair. Thank you. And then we go to Councillor Rice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my course, first question is going to Mr. Andrew Senia, are you still there? Hi, Councillor, still here. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so you mentioned a few re uh, ask and to support the small business and in Edmonton. And then from your perspective, what is specific uh, money, like finance request and is then re to be reflected in this budget? So we don't have a specific uh, financial ask, Councillor. It's just to continue to reinvest in the red tape reduction strategy that uh, Council has already undertaken. Um, and to to reignite Councillor Knack's um, construction mitigation policy. Uh, so there is no specific dollar amount that we have, uh, but it's just a couple of things for Council to consider um, in the future. Okay, uh, so that's first for First clarification, the next one is you talk about the launch some 101 program. And can you describe that a little bit more? Uh, Councillor, that is a program offered by uh, administration. Uh, I have not personally used it. Uh, it's the support team that um, uh, that, it, that exists within the city of Edmonton. Um, and I think uh, administration would be better um, uh, okay. pressed to ask the question, uh, to answer your question, sorry. Okay, wonderful. And so, and if you don't mind, after I follow up with administration, and then can you reach out to me? And then I would like to talk about this program a little bit more. For sure, absolutely, Councillor. Uh, more than willing to do that, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So my uh, next question is going to Ms. Melako. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for uh, many good points and regarding our ETS services, uh, specifically for the safety. So, in, uh, um, because right now the public transit safety and uh, is a big concern and for riders, and how we can address this, and I believe our city did lots and lots of work. And then from your perspective, do you think if we implement something uh, from a technical perspective, for example, like fill, get, and so you only pay it, then you could get into the uh, public transit, would that work? Can you, can you repeat that question? Uh, the question is about from technical perspective, if city implement uh, the tight-click strategy, for example, and install the fear of the fear gate, and then mm -hmm. fear gate, and then do you think that tight-click tool will help to improve the transit safety? Um, I'm not sure about fear gates. Um, I think that you know I've seen them in other cities. I haven't. I have no experience with them, so I'm not really sure if the that would bring um, safe. It would improve the safety. Um, I you know I was in Vancouver yesterday and I saw homeless um, uh, you know people in the transit system there as well, and safety is a concern there, and they do have those those safety gates. So I'm just not sure. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And for my last question is going to Mr. Remedy. Are you still there? Is this about Harlech Park? Uh, no, Zach, Zach Remedy. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm here, Councillor. Uh, thank you. And so my question is about, do you have the specific data to demonstrate 
the por the ratio about between affordable portion and the max value portion in your property uh, unions. Yeah, we, we have the data. Uh, so if I can understand your question right, uh, Councillor, uh, you're asking that the, the difference of delta between what the market uh, the, rate will be ratio, and what we charge? Yeah. The ratio, and because you talk, yes. about, talk about a specific tax relief, and then I would like to get the ratio and from the uh, affordable housing unions you provided, like, or I can ask how many percentage of the total unions in your property? And for I, I can provide that to you. Did you want me to re, uh, respond to you at a later time, uh, Councillor? Oh, sure. You can respond to me and in writing as well, and then I will appreciate that information. Right. Uh, and just uh, at the top of my head, we do charge, like I said, about 80% or even less of market uh, on, on all the near market rentals. But I'll give you that information uh, in, in writing at a later time. And uh, if you have further questions, please do not hesitate to let me know. Okay. Thank you. That's Thank my you. question. <laughs> Thank you very much. We, <laughs> we didn't want the school to leave without uh, acknowledging you and saying hello. So do we have the rest of them coming back? <laughs> well, while they gather them, uh, maybe we will um, close that panel then. I think we've heard from, we've had all of our questions answered. So thank you very much to everybody that has come today. Appreciate uh, you partaking in democracy. Thank you very much, Karen. And all right, um, so we have with us today uh, Mrs. Anderson's class from the Oakham School, grade sixes, and your counselor is Counselor Karen Tang from Ward Gary Hill. So welcome everyone. And you had a chance there to listen in on, we were asking some questions of the public who've come to give their uh, give their feedback to us on how we can approach our our four-year budget that we're looking at doing, how that's going to impact uh, your generation and future generations as well. So um, we talked today about swimming pools and triathlons and buses and safety. So lots of good stuff to talk about in the next few weeks. So thanks for coming. And you can stay as long as you want. Bye. Okay, so we will go ahead with panel number seven now. Uh, Juan Vargas Alba, Paths for People. Juan, okay. And if you just want to follow Rama here, she'll get you seated. Uh, Jason Wang, Paths for People. And Stephen Rake, Paths for People. Uh, Rain Paul with the Edmonton Water Polo Community. Okay, Rain, thank you. Uh, Gary St. Amand with Bissell Center. Uh, I think calling in remote. Gary, are you there? Okay, we'll come back. Adam Carrier, remote. Marianne Holm, remote. Dickie Dukamba. With Canuva, Canuva, just take yourselves off mute if you're there and let us know. Brian Torrance in person. Michael Barnard from the EFCL. Yep. I'm Remote. Here. Thanks, Michael. Um, Alex Peritsu from Downtown Recovery Coalition, remote. Yep, I'm here. Yep, perfect. And Anand Pai with NAOP. Hello. Hello. Yvonne Hooper. 
Yvonne. Hi, I see you there. Sylvia Taylor with Contemporary Showcase Edmonton Society. Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Taylor Soroka with Jasper Place Wellness Center. Hello, I'm here, but I am just going into the throne speech, so I think I need to be moved to another panel if possible. Okay, well, the clerk's office will take care of that, and Thank they'll call and coordinate. You. Thank you. Enjoy the throne speech. Uh, Kevin Campbell with Little Bits Therapeutic Association. Rob Appleyard with Brentwood Community Development Group, remote. Oh, that's not remote. <laughs> Welcome. And Chris Keeler, remote. Yep, so I'm here. Perfect. And Cam McDonald, Right at Home Housing Society, remote. Yes, I'm here. Good Cam. afternoon. Thank you. And Omar Yacoub with the Islamic Family and Social Services Association, coming remote. Present. Hello. And Zoe Sloan with the Edmonton Ski Club in person. That's you, Zoe? Okay, thanks. All right. So I guess we will start with uh, our representation from Paths for People. Uh, Juan Vargas. Thank you, Council. $1.3 billion. That's how much damage was done after one hailstorm in Calgary in 2020. One hailstorm. But the $1.3 billion doesn't tell you the whole story. It doesn't capture the damage done to families who had to put their lives on hold to deal with the destruction. It doesn't tell you about the families who now live in the fear of dark summer skies, many of them new immigrants or low income. And it certainly doesn't tell you that even today, there is still much left to repair, two years later. Last year, you and hundreds of thousands of Edmontonians had to navigate 35 degree weather on June nights and constant freeze and rain in December. This weather, with this frequency, is absolutely new, and it's only getting worse. What did we lose? During the heat dome, we lost over 60 people, many of them unhoused, many of them seniors, many of them both. During that first week in December, when people were expecting the beauty of holiday snowfall, they got vehicle pileups, head trauma, and the fear that maybe this is what Edmonton winters look like now. This is what one degree of warming looks like. Another strain on our emergency services, early deaths, unlivable conditions. These costs also pile up. All these stories have a dollar amount that is high above a billion. When the city declared a climate emergency, we expected these costs to be in the distant future. But these stories tell us that the climate emergency is here now, and it is costing us much more than just money. When it comes to reducing emissions and building a resilient city, inaction brings the highest cost. If we fail to respond to this challenge appropriately, then the money will be the least of our problems. Which is why I was surprised when the commitments that will guarantee us a fighting chance in the city were all presented as unfunded in the draft budget. So I'm here today to ask you to move to fund the projects needed to rapidly reduce emissions and make Edmonton truly multimodal. This budget is hard, I believe you. But unless you choose to act now, I can guarantee you that every budget from here on out will be much harder. So here's what I'm asking you to do. First, I'm asking you to move to implement all the recommendations from the Energy Transition and Climate Resiliency Committee. That includes investing in energy retrofits, rapidly decreasing one of our largest sources of emissions, while ensuring that people pay less for utilities and have safe and affordable shelter from extreme weather. It also means investing in the district energy strategy and to fight for a vision of a city that can respond to the shocks coming in a rapidly changing world. Second, I implore you to revisit and rethink how much we choose to spend on large roadway projects. We should not be asking if we can afford 100 kilometers of active infrastructure when we moved fast to approve over a billion dollars for 15 kilometers of highway. And last, but certainly not least, you must vote to make public transit and active transportation the most attractive option in the city and decrease our dependence on cars. That includes funding the expansion of the bike network. I sat before many of you in September to share this same message, but let me remind you what some other people spoke about. Many spoke about how scary it is to move in the city as a cyclist, highlighting a consistent fear of being driven off the road or being yelled at by passing drivers. The solution is an expanded bike network. 
Some spoke about how affordable it was to access all their needs while being able to travel with their families safely. The solution was an expanded network. And since then, Password People has engaged with hundreds of Edmontonians about this topic, and people clearly tell us the solution is an expanded network. So here I have only a fraction of the letters you all would have received asking you to act on climate, asking you to fix missing sidewalks and links, asking you to make the city accessible for those who can't or won't drive. I may be one person up here, but I'm joined by the thousands of people with similar stories, thousands who want a safer trip to work, thousands who want more leisure time with their family. The message is clear, and the engagement points to a resounding yes for investment on these items. Council, I've shared with you so many numbers <laughs> throughout this speech, but right now there's only one that matters, 13. Your votes are what separates us from being a city that is paying millions to fight climate change or a city that is paying billions because it did not do enough. I ask you to vote for a city we can live in four years from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. For my children, for your children, for their grandchildren, vote wisely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so now we will go to Mr. Wang. Hi there. Thank you, Councillor Wright. <clears throat> My name is Jason Wong, and I am speaking as the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Pets for People. Just to let you know, I've lived across Edmonton in Mayfield, Mill Woods, Heritage Valley, and various parts in the core. My academic background is in engineering, engin uh, energy, and climate modeling, and my professional work has been in climate policy. I'm here to urge you to allocate funding for the city's bike plan. This work will enhance transportation options across the city, ensuring more Edmontonians have access to safe, accessible infrastructure for commuting and recreation. In my presentation, I'm going to be sharing many numbers and I'm very happy to follow up with you afterwards with these details. Funding active transportation through the bike plan is a great investment. It is financially efficient and there's great public support across the country and specifically also in Edmonton. Active transportation is also one of the most visible areas a city can invest into climate action. So I'm gonna bombard you with a lot of numbers now. <laughs> in 2020, a Clean Energy Canada and Abacus data poll of 1,800 Canadians weighted by region, age, gender, education level, uh, yeah, weighted by those things, in, in that poll, 92% of them supported or would accept infrastructure spending for space for walking and cycling without fear of vehicles. In our own city, Paths for People over the last couple of months has been undertaking polling of youth opinions, and by youth we mean 30 years and under, in our initiative called Where To Next. We received responses in survey form from 130 uh, youth as young as four years old, and they lived in every part of the city plan's um, uh, designated districts. We intentionally went out to neighborhoods like Castle Downs and Tewilliger to seek uh, input from those outside of the core. The key things we heard from these youth, they love active transportation and they love transit, but they need safe infrastructure and their destinations to be close to where they live. So some of the key highlights from their responses, 55% of them said that they prefer to bike or bus to their destinations, and only 15% said they prefer to be in a car either driving or as a passenger. That's almost four times as many preferring bike or busing. Over 83% of them said that having 15 minute districts are the most important motivators for them to walk or roll, and 78% of them said that calmer or safer routes with less traffic would motivate them to bike, scooter, or skateboard. The four main reasons they cited in supporting projects like active transportation and building a more accessible city were at 76%, more, vibra more vibrant and livable communities, at 75%, environmental sustainability, at 68%, easier to be physically active, at 60%, more equitable and accessible. So, I think clearly investing in the city plan is investing in Edmonton's future. 
Whereas 77% of can adult Canadians in 2016's uh, census results said that they rely solely on vehicles for commuting, like cars for commuting, only 9% uh, of youth rely on vehicles for commuting. So they're already, uh, they're, they're already trying to use this infrastructure as much as they can. And between 2005 and 2015, daily bike trips uh, in Edmonton increased 100% to 50, almost 55,000 daily trips. And this was before we started building any of our great infrastructure uh, in the city. We also, of course, know from many studies that building out safe, inf safe infrastructure, especially filling in missing links, brings out people in an ampl amplifying way, that it's nonlinear, that, that missing links, uh, filling them really brings out more and more and more people. So I think, yeah, clearly, Youth love what's in the city plan and what's in the bike plan. Implementing the bike plan is a great first step and specific actionable item towards reaching the objectives in the city plan. It comes at a great financial cost, like uh, the, the great fina financial uh, <laughs> sums. And I wanna thank you for your time and your hard work in making tough decisions in the city. There are many competing interests, but I think I've made the case that uh, we talked to many youth across the city. Um, we asked them many different types of questions and overwhelmingly, they wanna see the bike plan implemented and their streets to be uh, safer and more accessible and more vibrant. I'm happy Thank to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Wraith. Hello everyone, my name is Stephen Rates, and I'm here in my capacity as uh, Chair of Paths for People. I volunteered with this organization over the past four years alongside our membership of over 1,600 folks across Edmonton to advocate for safer, more livable streets. And I'll also note I'm skipping my municipal law class right now and we're covering my favorite case which is about snow clearing. Um, and so I'm a little distraught, but this is really important. Uh, on a cold winter day like today, I think you can still feel the sting of Mordecai Rickler's famous jab, if Canada were a house, Edmonton is the boiler room. When we look at our streets, uh, we know there's a depressingly true rationale for that jab. Our streets are currently not as safe or livable as we need them to be. They are ligaments of asphalt, either jammed full of cars or eerily desolate, and they provide limited space for people getting around actively. In the kind of Edmonton that we're looking to build, as presented within city plan, we have transportation options, great streets, sidewalks, crosswalks, cycling infrastructure throughout our neighborhoods. We have 15 minute communities where our streets support multimodal transportation and thereby more equitable access to parts of our city. Now, Rome was not built in a day and the vision we have for Edmonton set within the city plan will not be implemented within one budget cycle. What we can do right now is start to take some of those first steps by directing our investments within this budget to support those larger goals. I am not a complainer, so I'm going to acknowledge that this budget does get some things right by investing in streetscape projects, by investing in neighborhood renewal, and by fixing some missing links, allocating some funding to that. But what we need to recognize is that we are still spending about a quarter of our entire capital budget on roads, and this pales in comparison to the under about 5% of that budget uh, being set aside for active transportation infrastructure. We're not gonna get those numbers to be equal because active transportation infrastructure is less expensive to build than roads, but we should be getting those numbers to be closer. Currently, we are not investing in moving forward implementation of major cross city active transportation improvements that are currently being designed. We are also not setting aside, setting aside funding to implement the bike plan we just spent years engaging on we need to set aside funding for the bike plan so that we can implement those district connectors in a coordinated way across the city to really open up this transportation option for more and more Edmontonians. This work also greatly supports our community tra energy transition strategy and supports reaching our targets within the carpet budget and some of our regional planning goals as well. In your deliberations, if you see a project that conflicts with or doesn't align with the goals of city plan, we should be reorienting that funding and spending it on these aforementioned projects. 
Regardless of the work that's coming forward, we need to find a way to fund some of this work. It supports so many of our city building goals. And I'll just quickly remind you all also that uh, we can also take a lot of uh, basically free city building action in the near future with setting strong vision within our district plans and moving forward with the zoning bylaw renewal uh, initiative. Uh, but that's a story for another day. So focus at the task at hand and please find ways to fund those aforementioned projects. Uh, Paths for People greatly appreciates the opportunity to present today and we would look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will go next to Paul, or sorry, Rain Paul online. Or no, right here. Sorry. Hi, counselors. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rain Paul. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the former general manager and head coach of the Edmonton Water Polo Club. I'm here today to primarily speak about the importance of Lewis Farms, but also the impact that the CIOG grant has on our city. I was born and raised here in Edmonton, and my sister and I have had aquatics make a, a significant impact in, the, in our lives, um, throughout our lives. Uh, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to represent our country on the national level. Uh, water polo offered us university funding opportunities, and in 2021, I gathered with my friends and family to watch Kindred compete at the Tokyo Games. She was the only aquatic athlete from Edmonton there and made history as Edmonton's first uh, water polo Olympian. Sport made us who we are, and its significant impact has inspired us to take on leadership roles in the aquatic community. Uh, many, many alumni have similar experiences than we do, and they're coaches, volunteers, um, and board members today. Um, as you've heard, there's been many speakers highlighting the importance of water polo or aquatics in our community. It supports youth, it creates a sense of belonging, and for many it can be a place of refuge. The reality is that Edmonton is significantly under-resourced when it comes to aquatic access. For both public and user groups, the Kinsman Sports Centre has been a beautiful world-class facility. It was built in 1976 when the population was roughly 462,000 people. For the past 46 years, it's been the facility and the home for many aquatic clubs. Um, I'm sure you're aware, but Edmonton's population is currently greater than 1.5 million. That's more than three times the population it was when the Kinsman was built. Since opening the Kinsman, no additional high-performance aquatic space has been built in Edmonton. This has put an incredible strain on the Kinsman community and the aquatic groups, where teams must now often train to after 10 or 10.30 p.m. at night, Sport teams are unable to meet the training demands of their long-term athletic development, which puts them at a disadvantage. And many clubs have needed to cap their programming, which means that not all Canadians and not all Edmontonians have access to aquatic sport. The reality is that athletes today face, face fewer fi uh, facility resources than athletes did in the past. The recent closures of Edmonton pools has further added to this strain, showing how important Nate and Skona were to our community. Lewis Farms Recreation Centre is something that is long overdue in our city. Um, while Edmonton has built some beautiful aquatic facilities over the past 10 years, these spaces have not been accessible or suitable to our aquatic user groups. The pattern that we see in Edmonton is this. When a recreation centre um, goes over budget due to budgetary issues or delays in building, it is the aquatic plans that are always cut. Terwilliger lost 43% of their swimming lanes, Commonwealth 33%, the Meadow 16%, and now City Council is suggesting Lewis Farm loses 71% of their pool access. Let me repeat that. The current proposal would mean 71% of the access at Lewis Farms would be lost after we closed two pools since 2020. Equity inclusion is a pillar for our city. Female participation in aquatic sports is much higher than in most others. Not to mention that accessibility in aquatics to our para, disabled, and senior communities is incredible. For decades, female athletes have needed to fight and advocate for equality and inclusion. Today, City Council has the opportunity to join that fight and directly impact and support the advancement of females in sport. Furthermore, when we discuss equity, we must consider equity across all sports. Aquatic faces significant barriers in Edmonton and is disproportionately impacted by financial barriers and cuts. I urge you to think about the long-term impacts that your decision regarding Lewis Farms will have in Edmonton. Consider the opportunities that this facility would offer for more than 50 years. We're not talking about thousands of athletes today, we're talking about hundreds of thousands over the next decade. Um, sorry, a few decades. Reductions to Lewis Farm would mean that Edmonton will not see another FINA regulation facility in our lifetime. 
Recently, I read a quote that you see the impact of sport by the number of people who stay involved after they've stopped playing. We see just that here today in Edmonton. Dozens of aquatic representatives have shown up to speak yesterday, today, and tomorrow. They've written letters, they've completed surveys. Our, yesterday, um, our youth rallied yesterday outside in the cold to show you how much this means to them. I respect that these decisions are not easy, but please build the aquatic facility that you have already approved and that our community needs and has been planning for. Consider the long-term impact that it will have on our youth, the millions of dollars that having two huge um, high-performance facilities in Edmonton would offer. Consider that further delays will only add to the cost and please plan for the future. Um, Councillor Stevenson, I know last night you asked about some facilities built in um, neighboring cities. All of those were public facilities, either fully funded by the cities or partially funded. And another thing I've noted is every time a student um, class comes in, when you welcome them, you say we're talking about pools. It's the first or second thing that is always, always said, which means you know it's important. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Gary St. Amand with uh, Bissell Centre, are you online yet? No? Adam Carrier, Marianne Holm, Dickie Ducumba, in here yet? No? Oh, Brian Torrance. Okay, then we'll go to Michael Barnard with EFCL remotely. All right. Hello, councillors, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, a survey conducted earlier this year by the City of Edmonton reveals 75% of Edmontonians think we need to take immediate action on climate change. This suggests investments curb to curb climate change are some of the least controversial proposals in today's polarized environment. The EFCL and our members recognize the incredible volume of change required to achieve our climate goals. We recognize the backdrop of competing investments and priorities. Still, it is clear to us that the proposed capital and operating budgets do not meaningfully address the urgency of this crisis. The most recent report from the International Panel on Climate Change reveals that no part of the world is safe from climate impacts and that the most vulnerable in society are on the front lines of the climate crisis. Climate-related investments don't have to mean sacrifice. We should look to investments in climate infrastructure as an opportunity to transform our city into one that puts public health, social equity, and a thriving public sphere first. Edmonton can be a place where walkability and efficient public transportation make getting around easier. Public spaces can become the center of our urban life, where we gather and engage in local recreation and exercise that doesn't require a lengthy, expensive commute. Investments in climate-related infrastructure will improve Edmonton's culture and lifestyle, but these investments are also the only fiscally responsible course. In 2021, severe weather cost Canadians more than $2 billion in insured damages. In 2017, the Fort McMurray wildfires cost $3 billion in insured damages. And by 2030, the average losses from disasters is forecast to reach $14 billion per year Canada-wide. Even if we're extremely lucky and don't face the level of extreme weather seen elsewhere in Canada, we all pay for the cost through rising premiums and increased government spending required to repair the damages. The cost will obviously be far less if we act now to mitigate the impacts than if we wait to pay a much higher bill later. And none of this even speaks to the human suffering. The science is clear. To avoid catastrophic scenarios, we must end our dangerous addiction to fossil fuels, and we must do so in a way that invests in new infrastructure and provides employment to dispossessed workers from affected industries. In light of this, the EFCL calls on Council to strongly consider the opportunity to make strides on the energy transition strategy. There are many unfunded service packages in the capital budget that align with this. In particular, the unfunded package for mass transit implementation, including bus rapid transit on page 671 of the proposed capital budget, represents the minimum required commitment to supplement the LRT to create a usable transit system and is an essential part of achieving our energy transition goals. Emissions associated with transportation currently make up a third of carbon emissions citywide. In addition to supporting mass transit implementation, we sent a letter of support to the Urban Planning Committee in September for the accelerated bike plan implementation found on page 673 of the capital budget. Many Edmontonians want more options to get around the city, whether because they cannot afford to drive or they want to live more sustainable lives. 
Providing efficient mass public transit and bike lane infrastructure creates choices and reduces the cost to maintain and replace more than 10,000 lane kilometers of roadway. The replacement cost of Edmonton's roads is roughly $10 billion and is 62 times greater than the replacement cost of its buses, making bus rapid transit an obvious choice for funding. The EFCL also encourages funding for the Urban Farms and Gardens Initiative on page 86 of the proposed operating budget. Edmonton has three times the number of community gardens than any other city in Canada, in part due to the 48 gardens operated by community leagues. Growing food locally lowers emissions, increases public health, saves money on healthcare costs, and increases food security, all while providing local recreation and fostering community. Community leagues are acting on climate change every day by educating residents, installing solar systems, and lowering energy consumption at community halls. They protect Edmonton's urban forest and provide access to locally grown food. The EFCL and community leagues will continue to work with the city of Edmonton to mobilize Edmonton's neighborhoods. We will continue to apply for funding from all levels of government for projects that reduce emissions, create employment, and maximize investments in Edmonton public spaces. Edmonton needs to rethink how we move into a future with good air quality, effective transportation, and vibrant public spaces for residents to enjoy. The EFCL will do everything we can to make that happen, and we hope that this council shares those goals and will put forth the required investments to achieve them. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Um, next, we will move to Ms. Uh, Haritsu. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay, awesome. I just talking? know that um, the time on the clock is not working as it was in the past. So I just, I noticed it with Michael's presentation and just wanted to flag that. But thank you very much. I'm going to start. Oh, um, just before thank you, Mayor and Edmonton City Council. Uh, this is a really hard few days of budget. Voicemail. Bob, oh, that would be great. Thank you. Is just someone else could go on mute? Yeah, can we? Mute that person, thank you. Cool, can I start my time from the beginning? Yeah, go ahead and we'll restart the timer. Thank awesome, you. thank you so much. I know it's been a hard few days and I just wanna echo sentiments of appreciation for your time and attention to this budget. Uh, my name is Alex Ritzio. I'm pleased to chair the Downtown Recovery Coalition. The DRC is a group of both for-profit and not-for-profit business and community leaders dedicated to ensuring our downtown sees a sustained economic recovery post-pandemic. We're focused on advocating for safety and security, infrastructure and cleanliness, and transformative projects that impact our downtown positively and create vibrancy. I don't want to reiterate the dire needs our core has, as you, along uh, with the entire city administration, know very well the issues our business, investors, and residents are facing downtown. I want to thank you for funding the downtown vibrancy and for your focus and attention to Chinatown, an important partner in our downtown recovery work. Downtown is the largest tax base in the city. It accounts for 10% of the city's tax base in 1% of the area. We all know downtown is underserved relative to other areas of the city and has suffered a huge setback through the pandemic, jeopardizing our economic growth as a city. City investments in safety, cleanliness, maintenance, and transformational projects downtown have led in the past to huge impacts in terms of private investment, new jobs, and new tax base assessments. The budget includes some additional staffing for downtown, funding and maintenance coordination, money for vibrancy grants, as well as continuing CRL investments, and the new money made available because of private invest investment downtown since the arena. This is a good start, but more prioritization of downtown is going to be required to kick off more private investment, including crisis diversion. In particular, we'd like to see the CRL policy more specified. So right now it states funding is applicable to green and walkable initiatives. It's a little vague in terms of investment. So we'd like this council to ask for more opportunity in the policy draft for residential development of downtown because residential development is the next transformational opportunity for our core. We see cities embracing this across Canada and our city plan emphasizes 15 minute communities and we haven't seen that come to life in downtown yet. Emphasizing residential growth will be a game changer for the heartbeat of our city. All in all, we ask that you keep downtown's tax base, tax base in mind while debating new spending. We cannot risk this tax base and future investment into it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And next we'll move on to Mr. Pai, remote as well. Thanks very much and, uh, and thank you for the time. Uh, 
My name is Anand Pai, and I'm the executive director at NAOP Edmonton, where uh, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association. Uh, so uh, we wanted to to uh, talk a little bit about uh, about the budget and and just uh, just point out that that for us uh, in commercial real estate and the businesses that pay about fifty percent of the overall uh, taxes in in the city, property taxes. Uh, the focus for us is really on return on investment. And the, the reason for that is because business uh, property taxes are two and a half times uh, greater than residential property taxes. And so when we see, uh, you know, the average price of a, of a house being referenced in, in budget documents, that doesn't really take into account both that business uh, taxes are higher, but also assessments are, are usually much higher as well the density in employment areas is is really quite a lot higher so you might have a hundred million dollar building in downtown edmonton that's using uh that's using only about 100 uh feet of, of frontage and so uh so services are uh are much cheaper it's much cheaper to service those areas in terms of basic you know kind of cleanliness and maintenance costs so what we see then is that is that even in a suburban setting, a uh, sandwich shop might have to put aside uh, thirty thousand dollars a year for uh, property taxes, uh, and we hear from folks in in the retail sector saying that uh, saying that those companies are uh, are really challenged by property tax increases. We see logistics facilities uh, advertising that their taxes are a million dollars a year or or more uh, cheaper just outside the city than just inside the city. Uh, and now because we're developing uh, on the on the outskirts of the city uh, for new logistics facilities and, and things, uh, that difference is really stark because we're just seeing it on one side or the other of, of 41st Avenue. And so I worry a little bit that we're gonna kill the golden goose on, uh, on some of these employment areas if we don't focus on a return on investment and how, uh, and how we can, uh, Really focus our our investments on uh, on areas that are going to create new property taxes, new jobs, and new investment in the city. Uh, but uh, when I see that uh, that my time isn't going, so I'll just keep talking till uh, till you stop me. Then, uh, but but I but I wanted to offer some uh, some uh, you know kind of specific ways because I heard it in in the conversation and councils having with. All the speaker over the last, all the speakers over the last two days that uh, that that we're looking for kind of specifics, and so I think that there are opportunities uh, to uh, follow up on the productivity audit uh, from 2020, uh, which uh, which showed you know quite a, a large increase in in supervisory positions, uh, while frontline services decreased over the period from 2017 to 2020. This showed a 21 percent increase in supervisory roles over that period. There's an opportunity to look into lines of business, and NAOP's uh, been uh, vocal about uh, about things like land development, uh, where there's where there's hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, of value which the city is stewarding right now, uh, and I think there's an opportunity there to say, you know, where are our priorities? Is it in uh, is it in competing with uh, with private business, or is it uh, is it in other areas, as well as uh, we have members all the time because of the industry that we're in uh, who mentioned to us that there are opportunities to look at uh, capital projects and comparing them to how the private sector would build them uh, or how they're being built in other municipalities. It, it, it strikes me that we're looking at at, uh, uh, at a rec center that's you know uh, in the West End that's worth $100 million more than the last rec center that we built, uh, more, than, more than 150, I think. Uh, a million dollars more, and I think there are opportunities to take a look at all of these areas and and see where there are, uh, where there are savings that we could uh, translate into our new priorities. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And for those online, we'll try to keep that timer pinned then to the the main screen if you couldn't see it before. So um, next we will go to Yvonne Hooper. Yvonne, are you there? You were here. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Sorry. Okay, and can you see the timer then? 
the, the five minute no. timer? Not really. Okay, then I, I would suggest maybe if you could just sort of keep track of that time yourself, then that would be great. Okay, no, okay. no worries. Okay, thank um, you. Th thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to ask the council until the various issues at the zoo are resolved, which I know that you are dealing with a few of them at the moment, and I'm very grateful, if you could not give them any more millions of dollars. Um, there's already been about 110 million over the past decade and still very important issues haven't been resolved. And in a climate crisis, obviously it's on everybody's mind. I've been listening for the past few hours, um, as well as various sports and recreation and everything else. And I think um, for a country such as Canada and Alberta, obviously then the wildlife man spoke earlier, um, wildlife are at the heart of everything really, as well as people. You know, the wildlife need their infrastructure, their climate, their mental health suffers in the wrong environment. And I think we've seen, um, certainly globally, Edmonton Zoo hasn't got the best reputation. Um, there's been videos of distressed animals. There's um, obviously a lot of controversy over one animal who has absolutely no habitat whatsoever, despite the 110 million. So the council has done a great job, bearing in mind they've only been there a year. They've already got the first ever independent review properly done. So I say thank you for that. But as again, in a climate crisis, if you've got, if my figures are right here, you've got 350 animals in between 45 and 100 acres, depending, um, you know who whose figures are right one of those animals alone needs 40 acres 365 days a year which they're not getting so maybe the resources at the moment um it was heartening to hear the wildlife man talk about all the education um that they're doing and i think for children and we've heard the youth speak they're so concerned with doing the right thing by the wildlife, by the biodiversity, perhaps money could be reallocated to supporting a more climate friendly way of supporting wildlife moving forward and maybe just have the species in the right places on Earth. So species like red pandas um, that do well in the particular climate, fantastic. You know, that can be world class. But also, there's been so many major achievements with other animals around the world. Perhaps it's the right time to let other places use their expertise for some of the animals. And then the 10 million wouldn't be needed, which could go to the swimming pools, the sports, um, all the other very important causes. And I thought it was actually heartwarming, the lady talking about her disabled son in the horse riding. Um, you know, the children have had it so hard with the pandemic. I'm a mum of two children. The anxiety in the schools is, is huge. They need their education more than ever. And I would just ask the council going forward, and that's, you know, getting the basics right was what probably one of the first ladies in the last few hours said. And I think that it all comes down to that in the climate crisis is getting the basics right. And I think probably that is going forward would be a lovely thing if the council would sort out once and for all the controversy surrounding the zoo before any more millions go into it. Um, that's all I've got to say really. And I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Hooper. And next Thank we'll you. move on to Sylvia Taylor. Sylvia, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you. And good afternoon, councillors. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on the importance of funding the Community Investment Operating Grants. And thank you also for the care you are taking in listening to all of these presentations. My name is Sylvia Taylor, and I am the chair of the Contemporary Showcase Edmonton Society. Our organization is part of a national organization that presents educational student music festivals 
focused solely on the presentation and exploration of Canadian contemporary classical music. These festivals are held across Canada, close to Canada Music Week, which was last week. Our festival was presented the weekend of November 18 to 20, and our gala concert was this past Friday. Due to this timing, I was unable to create or submit any impact statement videos in time for this presentation today. Our students prepare Canadian music for presentation in a performance setting and receive a critique from a clinician, including some active work at their instrument. Students not only learn about their music, but other music presented in their classes, and they develop the confidence to perform in public settings. Our organization also presents a program to introduce music students to composing and to develop their compositional skills. Some students from this program have gone on to write for organizations such as the Edmonton Symphony, as well as take advanced studies in composition at undergraduate and graduate levels. We also commission Canadian composers to write music specifically for our students. And this past year, we commissioned the internationally renowned Edmonton composer, John Astacio, Order of Canada, who created a wonderful composition for intermediate level piano students. 2022 was our 29th annual festival and approximately 150 students took part in our programs. I would like to mention that the Canadian classical music culture is a thriving community with many multicultural and indigenous influences often included. Influences that have been present for well over a hundred years in the Canadian music repertoire. Our festival is open to students of any age, level, race, or gender preference. Our facilities always provide physical accessibility. We have been receiving and very much appreciating financial assistance from the City of Edmonton since 2016. This year, we received a CIOG grant of $887. This is a significant source of income for our organization, as our annual expenses are approximately $8,000. In 2022, we began a bursary program offering free attendance to students of the Yona Sistema program, a music and life assistance program offered by the Edmonton Symphony Society to inner city schools. We used one third of our city of Edmonton funding to make this training available to them. Josette Justo Valdez, the resident conductor of the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra sent this note for me to read today. Students from Yona Sistema had the great pleasure of partaking in the composition program with Contemporary Showcase Edmonton. High school students from Yona were invited to join the program at no cost to them or to Yona Sistema. These students were offered weekly composition lessons for a month, the chance to explore their musical ideas and the opportunity to make connections with composers in the community. This has been an exciting experience for our students and as, as it provides them the opportunity to deepen their musical knowledge and enrich their creativity. We could see the spark in Elliot's eyes when he described what inspired him to write his piece, Close, and how the process happened. This was very inspiring for the rest of the students. We are grateful to our friends at Contemporary Showcase Edmonton and look forward to continuing our relationship with them. Showcase Edmonton conducts surveys, a survey directly after our programs, which were very recent, from approximately 30 responses to date, 97% responded that the festival adjudications were a positive experience. I would like to share a quote from the survey. One of the best adjudications processes my daughter has been a part of. Advice was given, was engaging and age appropriate, and clinician made it fun to perform and learn. We are obviously a small droplet in your budget pool, but I do feel we are an important service to Edmonton's quality of life community programs. The funding has been vital to our success. We urge you to strongly consider maintaining it, and we hope the grants remain under the jurisdiction of the city as moving its management to Edmonton Sports Council would restrict our eligibility as a multicultural community program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. Um, and now we'll move on to um, if Taylor Soroka is online. No, oh, Kevin Campbell. Okay, I think we have uh, Rob Appleyard here in person. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Appleyard, Executive Director of the Brentwood Community Development Group, one of our city's not-for-profit affordable rental housing providers. I thank you for the opportunity to address Council today. I'd like to uh, address the capital budget by starting with some history. 
In January of 94, the federal government canceled long-term investments into affordable housing with the lack of investment over that 25-year period. We saw very little affordable rental housing built. And the housing that did exist in Alberta reached an astonishing $1 billion in deferred maintenance. Then in 2017, our federal government announced the National Housing Strategy and with it, co-investment fund, the Innovation Fund, and three rounds of the Rapid Housing Initiative. In 2019, City Council approved a reasonably funded capital budget to support the Affordable Housing Investment Program. On November 1st, 2021, the provincial government announced the Stronger Foundations Program, and for the first time in Alberta's history, we had the alignment of all three programs, not only allowing, but encouraging a housing operator to access other orders of government funding. In fact, the federal and provincial programs both require municipal involvement. They won't fund a project for which there isn't a clear need and that doesn't have support from the municipality. This means the municipality is driving the bus and needs to be the first one to sign up to a project before a provider like myself can bring in money from the province and the federal governments. Getting that money is a competitive process. In stronger foundations, I'm competing with Calgary, Red Deer, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge and every county in the province. For the National Housing Strategy, I'm competing with Toronto, Vancouver, Hamilton, Montreal, Ottawa, Quebec City, Calgary, Winnipeg, Regina, Saskatoon, and every northern community in the country. Very few people have ever been involved in developing uh, multifamily property. It's a long process from land selection to community engagement to rezoning to design, permits, construction, and ultimately occupancy. It's a minimum of three years. When you're uh, an affordable housing rental provider, you need to add grant writing, application, and follow-up to that process, so it can easily expand to five years. So the, for the first time in Edmonton's history, we have all three orders of government lined up ready to help. Considering it's only been a year, I doubt many projects have had the chance to refocus and take advantage of this opportune time. I know my next project was hoping to be at the application point with affordable housing investment program a year from now. I provided the housing history recap so Council will know just how unique this moment in history is. Which is why I was shocked to see the 70% cut in the capital budget for affordable housing. A tremendous amount of work has gone into rolling out these programs and the federal and provincial programs are actively allocating their funds to projects. If approved, Council's 70% reduction in capital will send a message about the priority of affordable housing to the federal government the provincial government, and worst of all, the impoverished citizens of Edmonton. If the city can't demonstrate financial interest in new projects, the housing providers, like Brentwood, won't be able to secure provincial or federal program dollars to be spent on projects in Edmonton. Considering this is a four-year budget and providers need two years ramp-up time, you're really putting the city in a position where affordable rental housing will be on a hold for a minimum of six years. There is a once in a century opportunity in front of council to fund affordable rental housing that might not be there six years from now, once program money is allocated and building costs have increased. Please reconsider the capital allocations so that we don't miss the opportunity to add this much needed form of infrastructure to our city. I'd also like to address the operational budget. At this time last year, most of the affordable rental housing providers spoke to council about one of our biggest per unit costs, property tax. As not-for-profits, the money to pay property tax comes from one of two places, government grants or the rent the tenant pays. Considering that all tenants in affordable rental housing are below the core needs income threshold, which means all tenants are receiving government assistance, which can vary from full support like Alberta Works to contemporary support like carbon tax rebate or Canada Child Benefit. It seems counterintuitive to me as a taxpayer to pay the additional taxes so the government can increase the amount paid in social programs so this tenant can cover the rent amount so the provider can pay property taxes. So I'd like to refer Council to page 98 of the operational budget, which contains the unfunded affordable housing grant program. If you put this money back in the hands of providers, it will only, uh, only break the cycle above, but you'll see the benefits throughout the affordable housing infrastructure, from more units to fixing deferred maintenance to new programs. I can't speak to what other providers will do, but I can tell you what I would be able to do. If I received a fully, full property tax grant on just one of my properties, I'd be able to add rent geared to income subsidies to 60 more units the day the grant goes into place. That's without swinging a hammer, without pursuing zoning or permits, without buying more land. Funding this initiative is the quickest, most impactful thing you could do today to support your existing affordable rental housing providers, enabling them to better support the impoverished in our city. 
thank you for your time. And thank you very much. Um, next, we'll move on back online to Chris Keeler. Are you there, Chris? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I am uh, Chris Keeler. I'm a member of the Beverly Heights Community League, and I'm here today to speak in support of community leagues and the EFCL. I lived most of my life in the West End of Edmonton until I met my current love in 2011. I did not know and soon learned is that our community has a rich history filled with interesting characters and community leaders who rallied together and formed a proud community league to support programs and services for its citizens. I felt it firsthand when I attended my first Beverly Heights Variety Show. This annual community fundraising event is hosted totally by community volunteers and brings in hundreds of fans while raising funds to support community league programs. I'm amazed how this one program unites our community and brings together over 100 volunteers every year to produce a show that has become our source of pride and identity. But our community is in transition. Our Beverly Miners hockey, baseball, and soccer programs are no more, and we're in transition as older neighbors move on and new families move in. The roots and connections that existed in the past are eroding. We need to build new connections and redefine ourselves. It is only with a strong community league acting as the conduit do I believe we will succeed. Our community hall and rinks serve as our hub, but they're also expensive to operate and maintain. As volunteers, we rely on the EFCL resources for everything from board member training to facility management support. Some of our league initiatives include the Abundant Community Edmonton program, and developing a community garden. But we're also working towards advancing the sense of community safety, well-being, and inclusiveness by formally engaging our diverse mix of community members who live in the high density Northeast area of our community. Building connected, inclusive communities is the city's vision, but it'll be impossible to achieve without a strong community league, the EFCL, and your continued financial support. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will now move on to Cam McDonald from Right at Home Housing Society online as well. Mr. McDonald. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi. I'm, Go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about a couple of issues today um, related to, to affordable housing. Um, I think on the operating budget, uh, I, I'd like to speak to I think it's on page 98 and it's the unfund, unfunded uh, tax rebate. Uh, and uh, I just like to comment that uh, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of uh, housing units that have had tax exemptions previously that are possibly going to lose those exemptions. And these are, these are targeted towards families with, and households with the lowest incomes in Edmonton. So I, I'm hoping that uh, council will, will find it in their will to uh, actually fund this tax rebate program. It will have a tremendous positive impact on families living in poverty. It will also enable our organization to uh, maintain adequately low, low rents and not push that rent increase onto the backs of families and individuals with very low income and we'll be able to continue to properly maintain our homes as well for those individuals and families. Also, I think it's important that uh, City Council consider uh, funding in the capital budget, the 140 million for affordable housing development. Um, I think that uh, quite often the, the municipal money, the city money is often the first in and it's the equity and the partnership that helps leverage other orders of government to come to the table, which helps us to be able to create new affordable housing units. So uh, those are the two uh, parts of the budget that I uh, have spoken about, and uh, that's all I have to say on, on the matter, and I'm open to answering any questions. Thank you. And thank you very much. And next we'll move on to Omar Yacoub with the Islamic Family and Social Services Association. Here. 
Can you see me? Hear me? We can see you and hear you. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I serve the team in Islamic Family, a holistic social change organization that works to address belonging, mental wellness, and food income security. Presently, we're working with CMHC and the city to develop a shovel-ready affordable housing project aimed at larger and extended families. This segment, larger and extended families, faces the longest wait list period of any group, three years or more to find adequate housing. The wait list speaks not only to the need for more affordable housing, but also taking an anti-racist, human-centered, and data-driven approach to building housing. We need to diversify who we work with to build that housing so that we can better meet and reflect the needs of Edmontonians. A large part of the housing problem is money, but we must also ask ourselves, why does the housing we're building not reflect the needs of the people who it's intended for? Why might people prefer living in the River Valley over a converted hotel? And why don't we build housing for the population segments who are spending years on waiting lists? I urge council to be bold with affordable housing, to fund the 140 million in capital for affordable housing, and to think about how to not only build housing, but to build the right type of housing. Thank you. And thank you very much for that short presentation. <laughs> um, that gives us time uh, to move on to Zoe Sloan with the Edmonton Ski Club in person. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so Edmonton Ski Club was founded in 1911 uh, and it's Canada's oldest operating ski area. Over this time, the organization has weathered and adjusted operations while remaining a true gem in the heart of the city and in our river valley, which is one of Edmonton's biggest tourism, economic and environmental draws. Our current volunteer board of directors and staff have a vision to be Edmonton's most accessible location for year-round outdoor recreation and to become a world-class destination in our city. <clears throat> Since restarting operations three years ago, we've set out to create a vision and expanded our programming beyond our winter activities and have started offering summer programs that are environmentally and culturally focused and a strong emphasis on stewardship and environmentalism. Edmonton Ski Club has successfully sustained demonstrated sustainable stewardship based on summer programming involving the River Valley activities and have just wrapped up our first summer sharing the physical site with the Edmonton Folk Musical M Music Festival with success. Our new facility would also serve as a production hub for the Edmonton Folk Fest and offers a significant site enhancement for those who travel to our city and take in the festival creating a further draw to our city and its River Valley. This is in addition to other growing tourism events. And when I refer to our facility, I'm talking about the green inclusive community building uh, that we intend to build and we've received $6.6 .6 million towards that and Councillor Rice was so generous with her time in making an appearance at that announcement. Um, in the winter, we partner with the Flying Canoe Festival on a biannual basis to hold live outdoor winter concerts and their signature canoe races on our slopes. We partner with the Alpine Club of Canada, Edmonton, and together we've hosted Alberta's only urban ice climbing wall and the Yeg Ice Festival, celebrating winter activities. In, adult, in addition to cultural and tourism activities, Edmonton Ski Club really strives to offer programming that address the needs in the community. What we have seen is that there is an ever-growing need to provide affordable, barrier-reduced programming to all Edmontonians, and especially equitable winter programming to Edmontonians. Year over year, we have maintained and grown our complement of social partners and the circle of service continues to grow. In the past, and we continue to partner with organizations such as Key Creative for Neurodivergent Edmonton, Edmontonians, Free Play for Kids, uh, Action for Healthy Communities PASS program, the Indigenous Sport Council, um, and we have emerging partnerships with other organizations that create safe sp sporting spaces for um, the gender and sexual minorities of Edmonton. 
We also strive to offer new and more accessible winter programming with the addition of more and more affordable, no cost, low cost, and reduced um, and subsidized programming. We recognize that outdoor recreation is beyond the financial reach of many Edmontonians and especially now. And there are families and individuals who do not, do not have the time and or economic means to take trips to the mountains. And even a day of skiing at one of our local hills is a luxury to many. This is why a core goal of Edmonton Ski Club is to reduce barriers and increase access to outdoor recreation. Offering subsidized programming through partnerships with community organizations and connecting a broad cross-section of our citizens with affordable, accessible recreation. This is in addition to numerous school programs who access our affordable options to sustain their physical and recreational programs in, a, in an environment of really tight budgets. Access to outdoor recreation has immeasurable benefits for our community, enhancing inclusion, physical and mental health, environmental stewardship, and care of our green spaces. As an environmentally driven activity, the creation of a green community space that reduces our carbon footprint through the build of a net zero carbon neutral facility becomes even more important, especially when it is a facility that drives environmental stewardship through exposure and re respectful interaction with the River Valley. In the past, an argument was made by other areas that another ski hill saturates the market. However, that is inaccurate. Edmonton Ski Club enhances the growing market for all by creating a safe, affordable option and grows our economy and local tourism. We are Edmonton's most central year-round winter and summer recreation located right next to the Matart station of the Valley Line LRT and the only one accessible by public transportation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Ms. Sloan. Um, I think we're close to our break time now, so um, we'll come back. I think we have a few others that have um, uh, come on remotely, so we will hear from them when we return at 3.43. Thank you. 345? Okay. Thank you. We get an extra two minutes. Awesome. <laughs>
Okay, we are back. Thank you very much, everyone. I think we'll just do a quick roll call. Councillor Nav. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Hello. And Councillor Tang. We'll be back shortly. Uh, Mayor Sohi and Councillor Hamilton are at the um, speech from the throne, so they will be back when that's wrapped up. And Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartbell. Good afternoon. And Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much. And I think we'll do a last call for speakers on panel number seven. I understand that Adam Carrier is online. Adam, are yes, you? Yes, he is. Yeah. Okay. And Marianne Holm? Yes. Yes. And uh, do we have Gary from Bissell Center? Dickie DeCumba? Or Brian Torrance? And Taylor Soroka or Kevin Campbell. Okay, so it looks like we'll just have Adam Carrier and Marianne Holm. So Adam, if you'd like to go ahead, please. And you've got five minutes. Hello, bonjour, Tansi. Take a bit of opportunity to speak on behalf of the Riptides Water Polo Club. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Adam Carrier, Vice President of the Riptides Water Polo Club, father of three daughters who are all water polo athletes. Bottom line up front, Riptides Water Polo Club does not support changes and reductions to the aquatic facility construction plans of the Lewis Farms recreational facilities. We're at a juncture in time and juncture in space in the road where, this, where the city can choose to support uh, water polo and aquatics or start the clock in the slow death of aquatic sports in Edmonton. Um, Riptides Water Polo Club also advocates for the continuation of the CEIOG funding system. If I also may indulge and risk uh, my five minutes, I'd also offer, offer some of my thoughts on the proceedings thus far. Uh, we've heard from volunteers, members, and leaders of communities all trying to build, grow, and in some cases, heal their communities. And they do so as active citizens of Edmonton to build a city where there is opportunity for all citizens to grow mentally, physically, emotionally, intellectually, and economically. I'm heartened to hear some of these participants, participants elect to refer to themselves as citizens, as participants in the selfless commons. And I reach out to all my, all my community leaders and citizens and thank them for their time and commitment to this city. It's inspiring. The next common thread that I find is that these, these communities are asking council for support uh, and, 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 and help for their, for their marginalized uh, you know, constituents and members, whether economically, culturally, or socially marginalized. Many of these communities are dependent on the CIOG funding, and I plead that this program remains funded. I fear that many of these communities are that represented thus far. Uh, we're playing a zero-sum game in an arena of marginalized citizens and communities all seeking the necessary funding from the same pool of municipal fiscal resources, with the hope for the enhancement of their respective services at best, and for the survival of their organizations at worst. Uh, it's a bit difficult to put a price on a life, the quality of a life, or the future of our youth. So I said, I'm the very pre vice president of the Riptides Water Polo Club. I was, uh, the Riptides Water Polo Club was founded during the pandemic in 2020 and through force of will, good planning and dedication from our current founding president, as well as uh, Rain Paul, who you've heard from uh, and her team while she was our, our head coach and director. We grew during the pandemic, uh, which is remarkable in itself, from a start state of about 40 athletes to our current number, which stands at about 104 athletes, aged from 16 to 13 years old which breaks down to 14, 42% uh, girls and 48% boys. So we still have some work to do to achieve full gender equality, but I'm, I'm, to, be, to be frank, I'm very proud of, of what we have achieved thus far. I'm confident that we're on the right track. And we're, but we are limited in this endeavor by a lack of facilities. We are capped and we're tapped for growth. The reality yesterday, uh, the, rally, the, the rally yesterday from aquatic athletes were 100% represented by our female athletes. And that's not a slight against our male athletes. This is just speaks to how our girls in water polo are civically engaged. Um, it speaks to the importance that this sport plays in their lives. We endeavor to be a diverse and inclusive club. We have internal programs focused on diversity and inclusion to make our, pro our programs financially and culturally accessible 
and equitable. I can ask, answer questions on that later if, uh, if asked. Our, our program starts with focusing on learning to swim and we have taught dozens of children to learn how to swim in our, in our brief two years of existence. We subsequently build foundational skills to train our athletes with advanced water polo skills to prepare them for high performance with our sister club Edmonton Tsunami. Importantly, many of these athletes then return to assist as coaches to support our programs and teach new generations of athletes to develop their own leadership skills and teach these young children. It's a delicate ecosystem. So our problems are, our, our club, as I mentioned, has reached capacity. We have, we have two resources that are in short supply, pool fa facility resources and human resources. We have three facility requirements that our athletes, uh, for our athletes to develop. So we start with a shallow pool for our U8 athletes to teach them to swim. We move on to a deeper pool for our U10 athletes to develop and learn water polo and, and, and to continue to develop their swimming skills. Uh, and this requires uh, this requires a deep end or a, a smaller uh, a smaller dive pool, such as can be found at the Twilliger Rec Center. And then a full size pool is necessary for a U12 and U14 athlete to provide them the opportunity to develop and prepare for international competitive standards of water polo play. And then subsequently, subsequently to move on to national competitive water polo. So the loss of facilities felt by our club is most acutely felt by the competitive water polo community. Our second resource in short supply is our human resources of an assistant in water, in water coaches, which are essential to the effective and safe functioning of their programs and meet and meet athlete to coach supervisor ratios. The number of athletes we can support at the U8 and U10 level are directly proportional to the number of coaches that we can recruit and attract. Mr. These coaches Carrier? are predominantly recruited. Mr. Carrier, I'm, I'm sorry, your five minutes is up. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Marianne Holm. Hi there. Good afternoon, our esteemed city councillors and the city of Edmonton staff. I would like to speak to you today about the funds that have been outlined in the 2023-26 budget for the Edmonton Valley Zoo. Could I have the next slide, please? There was an article in the Edmonton Journal earlier this month some excerpts from the article state that the Valley Zoo could be forced to shut down if it doesn't fix some significant problems, putting animal staff and the public at risk. The zoo is asking the city for $10.9 million to repair and upgrade enclosures for a number of animals. I am wondering why did these safety issues and needed repairs get to this point when the zoo has received a great deal of funding over the years? to the tune of about $130 million in the past decade. The zoo must have known about these areas highlighted in your report long before now. The next bulletin, it says city administration recommends council fund repairs given the urgency. The zoo also expects continued funding for the second phase of nature's wild backyard expansion. So why do we need new areas and new animal habitats when the existing habitats are in disrepair? Would it not make sense to ensure that all habitats meet the Alberta Zoo standards before we start building new areas? And lastly, the journal points out about Lucy's respiratory problems, which are abnormal and concerning for elephants, according to her most public, recent public veterinary records. So next slide, please. This slide highlights the findings from your report about the deficiencies and safety issues at the zoo. At the bottom, it's mentioning Lucy breathing in dust and contaminants due to um, a poor filtration system in her area. Also mentioning resulting injuries to zebras due to their design of their enclosure being unsafe. I won't go through the details because these are attached to the um, budget report, but again, just showing a lot of safety and issues of older um, areas that are in disrepair. So next slide, please. Another article from the Edmonton uh, Journal where the Valley Zoo is requesting $50.3 million in renovations. This was in March. And again, Lucy was excluded. I'd like to note where it mentions that the council did approve borrowing $44.9 million to fund this. Also shown on this in this article is that the Valley Zoo's consultant recommended that Lucy have a hydrotherapy pool. That doesn't seem to be listed here anywhere. 
So that was in 2021. So why does the city continue to foot the bill to bring in these consultants only to ignore their recommendations? There are numerous examples of this, but I don't have time to go into all of them today. Next slide, please. So my suggestions would be to ensure stronger oversight as to how the revenue is used by the Valley Zoo, reverse the decision for funding nature's wild backyard phase two, and upgrade the issues outlined in the report. In addition, ensure all exhibits meet the Alberta Zoo standards for zoos before adding any new areas. Of course, it's long past time Lucy get what she should have had decades ago. She needs a larger area with access to mud and many more enrichments, which were outlined in your report, as well as the new filtration system to address the contaminants. Next slide, please. So while Lucy does deserve a habitat that meets species specific needs and exceeds or meets standards, this will incur a significant expense for the city. Lucy already cost the city an estimated $300,000 per year. In 2011, Toronto City Council was faced with a similar decision about whether to expand or close their exhibit. They decided to close their exhibit due to funding. In Lucy's case, due to her poor health, it could be a big investment for a very short time. Instead, focus should be on relocating Lucy once her health is stabilized. There is much help offered out there to provide um, funding to help her get well and have her move. Zoos and circuses move elephants. No sanctuary has ever lost an elephant in a move. The risk benefit ratio needs to be considered. The report states that there's concerns about the Valley Zoo and its poor reputation on the world stage. As someone who travels a lot, I can attest to the poor reputation of this zoo and it's primarily based on Lucy's management. Thank you for listening to me today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and I'll be happy to answer any other questions you may have at the end. And thank you very much, Ms. Holm. And um, I think that is it for our speakers for today. Um, we'll now go to councillors uh, to ask questions of the speakers. Uh, Councillor Jans, you're up first. Wow, thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who took the time today. I guess um, if I can go to the Paths for People contingent and, and of the three guests, they can choose who answers this. I'm just reading from uh, the American uh, site Strong Towns. They note that investments in bike infrastructure is one of, most, one of the most high returning investments we can make in our towns and cities. And uh, I think one of, the, one of the, I heard loud and clear the mitigating the climate emergency, but I was wondering if any of you could share about just the economic productivity opportunities, local economy opportunities, et cetera. Um, how actually this can be good for business. Yeah, absolutely. I'll take a stab at that. I think um, one thing we ah. have to have sorry, okay, one thing we have to have regard for here is just the um, the evolving nature of commerce. I think um, you know, especially when we look at the local economy, um, the online economy has really subverted or thwarted a lot of progress there just by people uh, engaging with Amazon so much. Um, but what can draw people into businesses is an experience. And th the municipality can have such a large role in supporting the experience uh, along our main streets. And so investments in active transportation infrastructure can be a part of calming a main street, can be a part of enhancing the space and the experience in all four seasons um, to draw people into our local businesses uh, and really fulfill that the corridors visions we have for city plan. I've also received some correspondence from the business improvement areas and uh, others. I'm not sure if those are included in your letters or if you receive them as well. They're not in this pile, but we have received some of them as well, including uh, Old Strathcona. We've got uh, 124th Street, um, just some general support from BIAs. Excellent. Thank you. Is uh, guest Pi and Ann Pi still with us? Oh, excellent. Um, so previous councils made the decision not to build the Lewis Farms Rec Center. Uh, we're wrestling with that now today about whether to, to continue building it to the scope that's uh, proposed. Admin obviously has proposed a correction here. Um, I'm curious to hear Naop's thoughts on that. I don't think as, uh, as Naop, it has enough of an impact on commercial real estate that we have a Naop position. I was asked my personal thoughts on this four years ago, and and said that uh, said that uh, 
at that time, we shouldn't be kind of promising uh, things to folks that we couldn't afford. But uh, but that, that's my that's my personal view. Uh, uh, and as NAP, uh, uh, it's it's not a it's not a uh, it doesn't affect commercial real estate really. But but if the city is to be incurring higher taxes through having to pay off debt or or um, has limited borrowing room to make more pro economically productive investments in other areas like transportation, I imagine you would have uh, opinions on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you have you folks have the unenviable position of having to look at the whole budget uh, as a as a whole and prioritize things. And I think if uh, and and I appreciate the the thought process around prioritizing uh, prioritizing those needs and saying. If we're looking at the outcome of the active transportation, uh, then there's indoor transportation, there's indoor uh, recreation, and there's outdoor recreation, and and uh, but there's you know advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, so I, I know where I personally would, would land on that, but I mean overall the the message is that that you do have to balance those those things because it's not an unlimited uh, bucket. Thank you, and um, if I may ask guest uh, Sloan about the ski club, um, what's the total ask? Currently, the total ask is four million towards the green inclusive community building. Okay, and the ask we heard about from the Edmonton Mountain Bike community last night for an uh, six hundred thousand to go towards a skills park. Just to confirm, these are unrelated projects. Absolutely unrelated. But there is a mountain bike component in the summer at the ski club. So we utilize the Edmonton River Valley bike paths to facilitate mountain bike programming in coordination uh, with hiking and stewardship based activities. Right, but these are separate organizations, separate, separate organi asks, separate projects. Correct. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, I'll yield my time to the chair, but I just want to say thank you again uh, to everybody who came. Thank you very much, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, great to have so many speakers here today. I just want to start with uh, Mr. Appleyard. You know, I really appreciated that that number you gave us. So just to make sure I got it right, uh, with the the tax rebate program, that would enable you to potentially convert what thirty was it sixty units? Sixty units. Yep. To RGI, so that's like a third of income. Uh, that's 30 percent of income yes so that's that really deep subsidy uh the exact type of units that we want to achieve and again we don't have to build a single one those those would that inventory would just effectively appear overnight it's existing inventory that would get a much deeper subsidy than that has now that's great thank you so much um maybe mr pie and and ms Haritz, you may wish to to weigh in as well but i really appreciate the commentary um, around the importance of residential development in the downtown, how that's a, a really critical structural piece that, that we maybe need to be looking at in terms of the downtown rebound in the long term. Did I understand? I think Ms. Ritz, you spoke to that, if I'm correct? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah so just to confirm, that's sort of, a, again, sort of a deep structural thing that we really, really need to, um, to address in our downtown to make it have a sustainable long-term economic rebound. Yeah, so we see that as the next transformational shift downtown um, when people kind of look at us to say, what's the next Rogers Arena? Um, I think it actually is going to be residential and ensuring that our downtown is that 15 minute community that we have uh, thoughtfully built out in the city plan that we don't see necessarily played out downtown quite yet. There's not really enough density for enough coffee shops. We need, we had just opened a grocery store, which is great, but we actually need three more. That was a report in 2015 that said we needed three more. So we really have a lot of work to do in terms of um, ensuring that downtown sees that residential shift. Great, and maybe just that, that return on investment. Mr. Pai, I don't know if you have the numbers, but my, but my recollection is that uh, for the development incentive that was provided for the sort of downtown and Oliver area last year or earlier this year, it was about a one to 25 uh, ratio of return for public invest investment and, and private return. Does that, does that seem like a good ratio and a good leverage to you? Yeah, it's, that's, that's huge, I think that uh, I, I don't recall the exact numbers, but I think it was about a twenty, about a twenty million dollar program. Uh, it'll yield over twenty three uh, hundred people living downtown. That's uh, uh, that's more than uh, that's more than folks than uh, than maybe the one of the largest private employers uh, downtown 
would have. Uh, so, so you could imagine that's like that's a huge percentage of, of population increase for downtown. So over four thousand jobs uh, created uh, just in the construction phase there, uh, and and just in ten projects. So if you're looking at that that kind of ratio, uh, plus uh, yeah, as you say, I think that there's the actual building permit value, which I don't have off the top of my head, but okay. but there's there's spinoff effects just by having an additional 2,500 people downtown, which is uh, which is huge. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you for that, and I appreciate you also flagging that. Um, you know, we uh, we really aren't anticipating a full return to work, basically ever. Is that correct? We we're really seeing that trend of the hybrid approach from from here on in. Yeah, I think like. Uh, you know, I was I was reading an article that was talking about uh, that was talking about 3,500 city employees uh, uh, returning to the office in in um, in April of this year. So you think about 26. You know that that was huge for our industry, right? Like the amount of difference when when folks came back to the office, uh, especially because Edmonton has 40 percent of its employment uh, downtown is is. Uh, is uh, in the public sector. That was a huge. That was a huge thing, and you heard it from from people in commercial real estate. And so that's thirty five hundred people. If we have enough of the twenty five hundred people uh, that we that we're able to have downtown who are here in the daytime and it and uh, and after work, that's uh, that's a major impact. Great, thank you. Uh, and just with my my last question, I want to turn to to Ms. Paul. Uh, thank you so much for coming out today and, and sharing your passion for pools and, and the swimming programs uh, for, for kids in our community. I did just want to pick up, because I, actually I think you answered a question that I had in terms of other municipalities, that it sounded like there was joint funding with, with different partners for some of those facilities. I think I'm just trying to look at ways that we, we might be able to deliver some of those facilities, but again, sort of jointly with other partners. But that's something that you found when you were looking at the other cities? Yeah, with my experience or my understanding of those other facilities, um, the one that did have joint partnership was a YMCA, so there was significant funding through that organization. Um, and the other ones were mostly city funded and public. I, I can't speak for the aquatic community. Um, I know for the longest time we felt that this was a project that was moving forward, so there wasn't anyone looking for additional funding, but um, I think it was the Olympian swim president that spoke last night who's talked about the amount of um, the amount of spendings that the clubs do do at pools, half a million dollars over that for some of these larger clubs. Um, I think if there was time, people would want to try to find additional funding opportunities. But I think right now, as people have spoke to, time is just adding more to the dollar amount. So yeah, yeah. And I, I would say, yes, there's people that are interested to find funding. I don't know how quickly it could turn around. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Councillor Nack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wright, and again, thanks to everyone for, for taking the time uh, for, for sharing their thoughts during the public hearing. Just a few uh, questions maybe to either Ms. Paul or, or Mr. Carrier, as, as I think you both talked, touched on this a bit. Um, I think one of the questions, and I, we were running into this tension about uh, needing, obviously, space for aquatic programming and maybe more professional uh, athletes to do training and things like that and we also heard from the, some of our community reps uh, yesterday uh, about just need for general programming space um, I think one of the questions that came up you know four years ago when we were talking about this is uh, and Mr. Carey had started to touch on this notion of equity diversity and inclusion are these programs that exist you know whether it's water polo whether it's these other different different uh, groups that form is it is it uh, financially accessible to people like is that something that I don't I don't know much about <laughs> these various programs so I'm curious to get an understanding is like can lower income families access these programs participate be involved um, yeah so I, I can, can oh, well so maybe I'll start with oh, Ms. Paul and then I'll go with Ms. <laughs> you want to go ahead yeah, let's yeah go. I can speak to that a little bit I know you speak about diversity um, an interesting stat is black children are three times more likely to drown than white children showing that there is these these huge gaps and if you don't know how the chances or if you don't um, know how to swim it's a life-saving aspect and so in that sense there's this this call that we need to become more diverse in aquatic communities um, sport organized sport as a whole faces financial challenges and there's great programs out there like kids sport um, uh, jumpstart with Canadian tire that help with that funding um, 
And so I know in all the aquatic clubs that I speak to, the cost to participate is lower, if not the same as almost all other organized sport opportunity. And I think that clubs are interested in opportunities. Free Play spoke a lot um, in the earlier panels. And I think that there's opportunities for partnership for people to find new ways to expand that diversity and to bring new people into the sport. And, I'll, and Mr. Carrier, yeah, did you if want I could to add to that, yeah, um, so our, our club does subsidize the uh, have, have li limited subsidies for those families that do uh, uh, qualify for 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 kids sport, um, and but but our ability to do so is limited, uh, frankly, by the size of our community. So it's 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 effectively internally uh, there's there's an internal transfer of uh, of funding that uh, that occurs with, within the limited means of our club. To then subsidize uh, families that uh, that that um, that that are in need of of further further help and assistance. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sure that's not how much time I have. Uh, I think I have far less than that. Um, so I'll ask maybe just one more question to to Miss Paul. Um, and I'm drawing a blank. I should have written it down because I had one more. Uh, oh, that was the last question. I chatted with. Um, someone who lives in uh, the La Pearl community, uh, is one of his daughters, I believe, is involved, and they were talking about how, I think Mr. Carey started touching on this, so we've heard it a few different times, but I, I don't, I'm not sure of the, how big the problem is, but his daughter, who's in this younger, the only time that they have available for their training is like 9.30 to 10.30 or something like that, so I wanted to get a sense of how, how often does that happen, like in terms of having younger participants and not sort of being able to participate at the time that you might normally want to? Yeah, so kind of just with the way that the aquatic um, allocation works at the high performance pool, um, everyone's trying to fight for the small piece of the pie that we get. And so whatever pool time you're given is what you take advantage of. Um, for the Edmonton Water Polo Club with the high performance program currently in the city, um, those athletes range from 13 to 17 for the most part. And almost, I think it's three days a week right now, they're ending at 10 p.m. or later. In addition to they start at 6.30 or 7 in the morning. So by the time athletes leave the pool, change, transit home, um, and get back in the morning, they're significantly under the amount of sleep that they need to be effective in school, um, all those different aspects. So I know the clubs try to do lots of things to help with that, but um, the ma more than half their training ends at 10 p.m. or later. Okay. I'm going to assume Yeah, four nights a week, oh. I'll tell you that, for oh. my older daughter. Thank you. Uh, one, 9.30, three times 10 o'clock. Appreciate that. I'll assume I'm out of time, so thank you. You were, you were paying closer attention than I was to it, Councillor Knack. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the presentations again. Uh, so first of all, the most, uh, to Ms. Hersu, Ms. Hersu, sorry. Uh, talking about more residential development in downtown, uh, and we, uh, uh, Councillor Stevenson mentioned the previous uh, sort of tax deferral program that saw a lot of work go in there. Uh, I understood uh, or thought I heard you mention something about a per door subsidy that might come from mm -hmm. the CRL. Is it a bold yeah, so Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Thanks, thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, honestly, this the status quo downtown just leads to you know a lack of vibrancy overall. No increase in property tax revenues for the city or the province and little to no capital investment from institutional private capital. So the answer to the downtown CRL per door incentive doesn't cost anything today. It's just about the policy option availability. And that's really what we want to see. Um, Calgary just you know, released their core report, which set a light on a lot of the needs downtown has in recovery and residential is that. And so this is just a minor change um, to clarify the policy for use of the CRL in a, in a per door incentive um, that would really, I think, empower private development. So essentially, uh, something that, a policy change that could see more activity now, uh, but not necessarily have a dollar attached to it now. Yes. Fair enough. Um, now, are we talking about conversions of existing buildings, or are we talking about construction of new buildings? Is it, uh, okay. Conversion. Conversion. Because the, the one concern I have about conversion is that when we shift buildings from uh, the non-res tax base to the res tax bases, there's an automatic drop in revenue there. Uh, have you done any, or, or your group have done any sort of calculations or uh, analysis of that? We have been um, specifically on that, and that's something I think the, the Calgary has seen um, through their core working group. 
Um, and so I think there's opportunity for us to explore that. Um, and I, I will be looking into just different grants available to kind of explore those types of, uh, that type of research that we've seen come to light in Calgary. Got it, okay. And then I suppose, maybe going to Mr. Pai, I, you know, I understood you to say that, you know, we really need to think about the things we invest in and, and leverage those dollars, et cetera. Um, and on the one hand, I can, you know, I, I see the point where we're getting into services or areas that the private sector might uh, otherwise be doing. Land development comes to mind. Uh, do, do I understand you to say that if we did less of those things, we might have more dollars, more resources to invest in the other things that we're hearing about through this public hearing? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think that there's uh, there's two areas in land development, and you have to forgive me for referencing it a lot because it, because it's uh, it's related to our business, so we can see it more, most easily. Uh, but uh, but with land development, not only would it would it save quite a lot of uh, of time, uh, administrative time, administration's time, I mean, and, and council's time, uh, and, and in my opinion, lead to a better result. But there's also, uh, there's also just like a value to be unlocked by, like through city land. Uh, so there are options to, uh, uh, you can give that city land to affordable housing providers, but there's actually, the city uh, owns the most land in the city of Edmonton today. Uh, as, as a singular uh, landholder. So you would run out of uh, land to give away before you, before you, you know, uh, you, before you, you met the needs. So I think that there's like opportunities to, uh, to uh, sell some of that land and use that money to fund other priorities. Is there, is there room for, uh, and maybe this is through the CRL, I don't know, I'm not sure the policy limitations, but is there room for um, investment in those kind of community amenities, amenities that would enhance the downtown area. I, you know, it, it seems to, well, we talked about grocery stores a moment ago, but I'm wondering about, you know, a city-owned rec centre. I'm wondering about a school, uh, maybe some of the other amenities that, that uh, the city might support if we have more resources. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the CRL is an excellent opportunity because the more investment that goes in, the more, uh, because you're using money that was created through new investments, and then that yields new, uh, new CRL dollars. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're in favor of, of a lot of residential incentives because I think that that, uh, that then proves the need out for, uh, for some of those uh, uh, other things. Thank you. And I'm reminded that uh, Ms. Haritsu's name is pronounced Ms. Haritsu. So I'm sorry for that, Alex. I got that wrong. Those are my questions. Thank you. No problem, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, is Omar still on the line with us? Not hearing anything. Darn. Um, okay. Then... Um, I will go to Stephen Rates. Um, you've been advocating for safer streets for a long time <laughs> and active transportation, of course, for, for many years. I would be curious to hear you describe the level of support for active transit at this time compared to like, the last decade. Um, you know, I was looking at the giant stack of, of letters that, uh, that you folks brought in today and uh, I think on almost every panel that we've heard from, there's been at least one person who has mentioned active transit. Uh, can, like, wh where are we at? What's the momentum looking like right now? I think there's several factors that are sort of pushing to a swell of support. Um, I think a lot of people can point to their experience in the pandemic and um, being around the house more and within their community more and wanting uh, more free, uh, like public outdoor kind of spaces uh, where you can just enjoy simple activities like walking around. So I think that drives a lot of support. I also just think there is support being driven by concerns around the climate crisis. Um, there's concerns around that, those business needs that we uh, that were referred to in Councillor Jans's question or the answer we provided there. Um, so I think there's there's that support in the community and I think I would I would also want to drag our attention to the support from the city. And I think what we can recognize is that we are, we are moving forward, but we can 
take those big first steps to implementing city plan if we do things more bo boldly this uh, budget cycle. Uh, one reflection that just within our organization's experience in past years, we were here every winter just you know, hoping to get a little bit more investment in active transportation. Um, we could save a lot of our time and grief if we just adequately invested in it right off the hop at the start of the budget cycle. Right, okay, um, well I really appreciate that and maybe just as a follow up, um, any, any of the three of you can answer this, but we've been talking a lot about recreation and the importance of recreation over the past two days and Oftentimes when we're st discussing active mobility infrastructure, it's in the context of, uh, of commuting. But I'm wondering if you can speak to the bike implementation plan as uh, sort of a, a citywide investment in recreation. Yeah, I can take a first stab at that and if you folks want to add on. But I would say the recreation aspect is where most Edmontonians are going to first kind of touch this infrastructure or experience this infrastructure. So there's there's that immediate value um, for folks. Um, if they're walking or rolling or biking around, they have that touch point and see that city investment and appreciate it. Um, and that recreational experience is kind of the, like for lack of a better term, the like the gateway drug to then mode shift to actually um, shifting some of the trips that we make. There are so many other decisions that we need to make to support that, like land use changes uh, and further investment in uh, active transportation. Um, but that can be that first step recreationally um, to really compelling some of this larger change. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I just want to paint a picture of like a lot of the people who are taking advantage of this, because one of the first people that I think of are school-aged children, right, who would bike to school and bike to their after-school programs. We already know that a lot of kids bike to school. We already know that there's a dire need for strong, active infrastructure around school and around those type of hubs and the communities that people live in. And so what this means isn't just like making it easier for people to access that type of transportation, it also makes it a lot safer. Like I don't, I, to be blunt, like I don't wanna see any more, you know, dead kids <laughs> like hit from by cars because they chose to bike to school because they like chose to bike to after school programs. Like, it, it, is that, cl that clear cut for me? Yeah, thank you both for those answers. Um, and I'm just gonna check in one last time uh, if Omar is online. No. Okay, I'll yield the rest of my time, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Barnard, uh, my question is for you. Are you here tonight uh, representing EFCL? Yes. Okay, so the priorities that you listed, uh, how was that created? Was that through communications with the community leagues or is that just with the EFCL members? Yeah, the, um, so with respect to the support for the bike plan, that was something that was uh, created in consultation with our board of directors. Um, and that was uh, a letter we wrote, which we presented to councillors uh, in September of this year. Um, in terms of the stuff around community gardening, um, as I mentioned, community leagues operate uh, the vast majority of the community gardens across Edmonton and are, are definitely the, the predominant players when it comes to that urban farming uh, and also took uh, a lot of advantage of the pop-up gardens program, which is one of the uh, unfunded, a part of that unfunded package. Um, and then in terms of the, uh, the transit stuff uh, around um, tra mass transit, the reason for that is because, you know, we, we work with a lot of community leagues that, uh, that are doing, doing a lot um, trying to address emissions and are, are becoming leaders within their neighborhoods um, when it comes to energy transition and climate action. And so, you know, leagues are working hard to reduce emissions at their facilities and in their neighborhoods and, and showcase energy transition technologies um, and encourage, encourage their residents. But there's only so much impact that community leagues can have with respect to transportation. Um, you know, educating residents isn't, isn't really enough. If someone decides to buy every Edmontonian electric car, that'll be great. And I'm sure that everyone will take one. But as it stands right now, people just can't afford that. And so, you know, alternative transportation options are, are essential to meeting climate targets and community leagues support uh, Edmonton's interest in meeting those targets. And 
really only the city can build the public and active transportation systems that are necessary to achieve that. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Appleyard. So I just wanted to, I know that you had said that if you did have a tax relief or tax exemption, then um, you would be passing that savings along to residents. But from my understanding, we cannot um, guarantee that everyone would be obligated to pass along that savings to residents. So that is something I just want you to know that I will be following up on to uh, kind can of Can I speak to that briefly? Sure, sure you can. So anyone who you'd be giving an exemption or a grant to would be a not-for-profit. So that money is going to either go to building new programs, building new units, or providing deeper subsidy, or repairing existing units. So in a way, it's reducing rent. It just might be in a different form. Yes, I understand it's nonprofit, but I'm. Pr I think nonprofit organizations uh, still wages are paid. Like people still make a living, even if like when, even when they're working for a nonprofit. Yes, we play our employees. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I do realize it's a nonprofit, uh, but but still they're yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Cartmel, can you take the chair, please? Yeah, I have the chair. Thank you. I just have a, a couple of questions. I'm just, uh, Rain Paul, I'm just curious. We've had a lot of um, um, sporting groups come in talking about the, the um, access to the Lewis Farms pool and that, but also speaking about kids needing to learn to swim. Are, are the sports teams going to be taking up all the pool time and, and not leaving anything for swim lessons or public swimming? Yeah, I can't speak to how the allocation would work. That would be a city decision. Um, one thing I can speak to is I know sport groups have identified that there aren't enough learn to swim programs. Swim lessons are full. There's just not enough access. So lots of sports have begun to take on learn to swim programs that are now teaching those same um, learn to swim opportunities that... Um, residents of Edmonton haven't been able to access through the city-run facilities. And I think potentially a narrative that maybe is coming across unintentionally here is the aquatic community is really passionate. So people are showing up to speak about this, but this isn't just a facility being built for aquatic clubs. It's really a multi-use facility, and it's also not just an aquatic Lewis Farms isn't a pool. Lewis Farms is an overall facility with a library, with rinks, with a weight room, with lots of other fitness elements, meeting rooms. Um, so yes, there's lots of aquatic programs really passionate about this because it's an opportunity for us to speak, but Lewis Farms is gonna have, and that would be a city planning question, and I know the allocation at all facilities in Edmonton is different. Kinsman allows more high performance or more sport groups to access it. Um, and I know a stat that's been shared other places is only 4% of some other facilities is available for sport groups because that facility has said, this is how much we need for our own swim lessons or our own programming. So if, like we obviously see swim lessons as a huge need in our city and that would be an opportunity that the city could kind of weigh in on what that allocation would look like um, with the facility and make sure that there is lots of access for swimming, not just for the West End, but all over the city because people will drive to get into programs. Because that's kind of what's been highlighted for me is the, yeah. the need for the swimming. And I'm thinking, well, if we just built smaller local pools, then that could take care of all those learn to swim needs. But okay. Um, and, and yeah, and I don't think that um, um, the aquatic teams should should be, you know, going till 12 o'clock at night like some of the hockey teams have to do, right? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. That's all I had. And I'll take the chair back. Return the chair. And Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for uh, doing such a good job sharing uh, this afternoon. It's very appreciated. Um, so... I'd like to uh, maybe go to Michael Bernard. Uh, do you have like uh, preferred pronouns? Like, cause I don't want to call you Mister if that's not your yeah. thing. Or he, him is is great. Thanks. All right, great. Okay, is it okay if I just refer to you as Michael? Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks. So, Michael, um, you work with communities all the time, and so I'm assuming that a lot of the responses and communications you get are similar to what the city would have gotten through their insight surveys and things like that. So. I guess the thing that I've been wondering about while I've been listening to everyone uh, share their perspectives 
Um, you know, obviously, we've got people who want the city to spend more money. Some people want the city to spend substantially more money, and some people want the city to spend less money. And um, what I often think to myself is, is, okay, so what does that look like? And maybe you can offer some insight here. What does it look like if the city were to say, hold the line on sort of where taxes have been for the past few years, which is 1.8%, 0%, 1.3%, um, which is like, I mean, obviously everyone's seen the impact on services and things like that. And then what if the city went to like the old school, like 8% uh, you know, per year taxes, which no one wants to go to, but it was, it happened. And pe maybe people don't even remember that. But, um, you know, you raised a, a number of issues that are about saving money in the long term, but it costs money to get there. But we also heard perspectives that if we if we do spend that money, there's going to be a resulting cost to the impact it has on businesses, for example. So from the community perspective, that's a lot of preamble, but um, what are you seeing? Um, I mean, I am not in a position to speak for every community in Edmonton in terms of what they would like to see with their taxes. Right. Obviously, course. no one wants taxes to go up, especially um, in the with the inflationary situation that we're in right now. Um, and and so, you know, I'm not here to speak on behalf of business or everyone. But one thing that I will say is that, you know, there there are alternative ways to get recreation there are ways that we can think more locally and and that has immense benefits both for the business sector as well as for the tax base um so you know I, it, it's a little bit difficult for me to to speak to everything that you said uh there was a lot there you know i understand um, completely but but ultimately from from a climate perspective which is more you know the, the the perspective that I came to speak to this evening. If if we keep pushing things further down the road, it's just going to cost us way way more money. Um, that's just it's it's every single study out there says that. And so if if we just keep failing to act, then we're going to be in worse budget situation four years, and it's going to be worse the next four years and the next four years after that. And that's in addition to the human suffering that that we're going to see as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so maybe I'll uh, jump over to an end. Uh, you know, speaking of tax rates and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, differential uh, residential and commercial industrial, that sort of thing. Um, have you been in talks with, uh, have, have, has everyone been in talks with each other, you know, residential, commercial, industrial and saying, okay, what do we think the ratio should land at? Because no matter what changes, it's going to affect one one group a little bit differently than the other. And and uh, I think that we probably need some kind of clarity on where folks would like to land. Any any talks about that? Well, we're not advocating for uh, for a change in that uh, in that ratio. Uh, that's why we talked to the budget overall. Uh, to be honest, I don't think that it's like it's not. I, I find uh, I watch the you know news in other jurisdictions where they're having that conversation and it seems to me uh to be a little bit counterproductive because the because it's not about okay either, one i'm way just or gonna I, I get you thank you sorry i'm gonna cut you short i'm just out of time so i'm gonna hop over to alex see if she's got any insight on that yeah counselor we don't ha we didn't pick and choose what the number would be it's just as low as possible because everyone has been dealing with this so residential has been dealing with the same type of inflation as businesses have and it's just you have a really tough decision in front of you i don't think that there's anything we can offer in terms of what is an acceptable amount um, as long as you've tried to find all of the services and uh, and reductions that you can internally um, that would satisfy us and i think historically we've always asked for zero and, and that's changed between edi naop chamber um, this year, we're, we are understanding that it's zero is not possible. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Burkett. So that concludes the questions. That concludes the questions on uh, to panel uh, seven, right? Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Really, uh, really appreciate your input. Uh, and we're gonna move on to our next panel, panel number eight. I will call the names and uh, uh, Debbie, 
Kriyasir, Northwest Adventist Seniors Society, remotely. Debbie, are you there? I'm sorry? Oh, you're going to give me the update yeah. list? Okay, I'll wait then. Thank you, Joanne. Joanne, thank you. Oh. Okay, ready? All right, Debbie Kriasser. Are you there, Debbie? Joining remotely? No. Sandy Fleming, Edmonton Ski Club, in person or virtually? Sandy, you'll be number two, please. Melanie Hoffman, Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee, remotely. Melanie, are you there? No. Melanie, are you there? No? Oh, Sorry, Debbie, Debbie, I see you, Debbie. Okay, yes, Debbie. I'm here. Got it, got it. Debbie you'll be, num Chris, you'll be number Debbie. one. Yes, sir. Chris, sir, yes, I am. Yeah, yeah yes. if you could mute yourself, Debbie, please, I would appreciate it. Okay. Sandy Fleming, Edmonton's. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Melanie Hoffman, no. Jen Hill, Hill? Heil? Yes, Jennifer Hiles here. Thank oh, you. Oh, Jen Hiles, uh, you're joining us. Good. Govin Timsina, Multicultural Health Brokers. Govin? No. Rispa Trembley, joining remotely. Rispa Trembley. No. Yvonne Quintero, IQ Tennis Pickleball Center. Yvonne? Hmm, interesting. Jody Kifik? Kif Kif Jody Kifik? No. Eva? Kifik from Ad Edmonton Tsunami Water Polo Club? No. Hmm. Dustin Bajer. I am here. Thank you. Marie Frabon. Hi, Mayor. I'm here. Thank you. Christina Kras Ras Zwiski? Ras Zwiski? Major. I am here. Thank you. Oh, Marie Frabon. Jody, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you, Chris. Jody Kaifik. How you say your name? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I see you there. Is uh, is Eva joining you as well? Yes. Okay. Eva's here as well. She's on the same. Jody, can you mute yourself, please? Okay. Now, if you could mute yourself, we'll be here. You go, good. Uh, all right, Dustin is here. Uh, Christina Kras Zwiski, Zwiski, Kruzwiski, sorry. Uh, Christina, no. Evan Lit Litour, Litour? Uh, Litour, yeah. Litour. Okay, good evening. Okay, thank you. Elaine Solez, Friends of Skonarek. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Your seat. And uh, Jeff Papino. Jeff Papino, Friends of Skonarek. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Enrico Lozoi. Lezo Enrico, are you there? Nope. Okay. Katrina Semeniak. Friends of Skonarek. Katrina? Hello. You're there? Okay. Fabiola Del Valle. Friends of Skonarek. 
Fabiola del Valle. No. Alex Dominic. 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 Alex. IQ Tennis and Pickleball Center. Nope. Gracie Klein. Gracie Klein. Snami Reptized Water Polo. Okay. We'll call your names again once. Uh, okay. We are going to start with Debbie Griesser with the Northwest Adventist Seniors Society. Go ahead, please. You have five minutes. Alex Dominic 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 Alex IQ Tennis and Pickleball Center Nope Gracie Klein Debbie are you there? Nami Reptized Water Polo Debbie, you need to mute yeah, your YouTube. If, yeah, if you could mute your YouTube. I'm please. sorry, mute my YouTube. Uh, we yeah. We are going to start with Debbie Priester with the Northwest Adventist Seniors Society. Go ahead, please. You have five minutes. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mayor Sohi and all city councilors. Can you hear? Can, can you hear me? I can, but if you could mute your YouTube on your end. Alex. Or turn the volume down. Oh, my goodness. Mute. Yeah. Yes, yes, I am. Oh, okay. Debbie, you need to mute your YouTube. Yeah, if you could mute your YouTube. I'm sorry, mute my YouTube. Just hold on, hold on. She's trying to figure it out. Let her figure. No, she's still figuring out her. Okay, Debbie, now you're, can you unmute yourself? We can have someone reach out to Debbie and we'll just move on to the next yeah, person. Yeah, okay, we'll come back. Debbie will come back to you. I'll go to Sandy Fleming next. Hey. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for uh, uh, hearing me in hour 21. I I feel like the wheels are still on. Um, thanks very much. Um, so the Edmonton Ski Club is Canada's oldest operating ski club, ski area founded in 1911. Um, we have over 100 years of winter operations and now over three, and now three successful summer seasons behind us, uh, thanks to the partnership with the Edmonton Folk Music Festival in allowing us to share the park with them. Um, Year-round programming is a key part of our offerings, both now and in the future. Um, the project that we're talking about today, the River Valley Outdoor Activity Centre, would leverage over 11 million in funding from other levels of government, 6.6 um, .6 million of which is already secured from the Government of Canada under the Green and Inclusive Community Buildings Program. The request of $4 million, uh, which was brought forward as an unfunded service package um, to the operating budget, um, is for a capital contribution only. Um, there won't be a need for the city s to support the operations on an ongoing basis because our programs themselves are self-sustaining. Under the Federal Green and Inclusive Buildings Program, the facility will be constructed to the Canada, Net, uh, Canada Green Building Council Net Zero Carbon Building Standard. The new facility will be truly unique in Edmonton, one of the first large-sized net zero mass timber buildings in the city and the most environmentally responsible building in the River Valley. We plan to use geothermal heating and cooling, solar power generation, and a highly efficient building envelope. It will be a model project and help to build the expertise of the local green building construction industry, a demonstration project for net zero publicly accessible facilities in a northern climate. Since it's an LRT accessible facility um, and also accessible by the River Valley Trail System, the facility will allow Edmontonians to enjoy outdoor activities while having a lower environmental impact. As a community-led project, the building construction and ongoing operation will be taken on by our nonprofit organization, reducing the burden on the city to plan, construct, and operate the building. 
Since the building will be net zero, the lack of utility bills means it will, will significantly reduce operating costs, which in turn will allow us to spend those funds on recreational programming. Since the activities that the facility enables are outdoors, this means the amount of investment that the city would provide um, is lower in terms of what activities are enabled when compared with other types of more intensive um, recreational activities that would otherwise occur indoors. We believe this fact, along with the support from other levels of government, means it's an effective investment in a publicly accessible recreation amenity. We're very thankful for the guidance and support of the City of Edmonton staff, as well as Council for partnering with, with us to get to this point, um, mostly recently with City Council's support for an interim funding to support the construction of the interim facilities that we now have in place on site, which will allow both the Edmonton Ski Club and the Edmonton Folk Festival to continue operations um, during the process in, in which we moved out of our previous facility. We're also grateful for, for the support and guidance of our key project partners, including the Edmonton Folk Music Festival and the Indigenous Sport Council. You'll hear from Andrew from the Folk Festival and Richard from the Indigenous Sport Council uh, in later panels. Um, both organizations of which will be instrumental in the planning process of the new facility, and we look forward to working with to offer cultural and recreational programming that is so important to the fabric of our city. We're very excited to be leading this project following a long history of offering outdoor recreation to Edmontonians, and we believe this green building project will leave a true legacy for many generations of Edmontons, Edmontonians to experience all four seasons of outdoor activities in our River Valley for many generations to come. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'll check back if Debbie Griester is ready to go now. Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, I'm sorry about my technical difficulties. Okay. No worries. Hello, hello Mr. Mr. Sohi, um, Mayor Sohi, and the rest of the councillors there. Um, uh, thank you for letting me speak. So I'm Debbie, from the Executive Director from Northwest Edmonton Seniors, and I would like to speak to you on their behalf today. Our organization provides facilities for seniors age 55 plus um, to enjoy programs, activities, and events. We provide supports to seniors through our volunteer program. Our goal is to connect and engage, um, engage with seniors to offer them the opportunity to become involved with their communities. I would like to speak about the about a grant at Northwest Edmonton Seniors was approved for, and due to the the COVID pandemic, um, we were the um, the Northwest. We had to, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so our um, yeah. Uh, for the Northwest Community Hub Business Case Development. Okay. So Northwest Edmonton Seniors entered a partnership back in 2018, and I did come down to council one time with um, a, a board member also to speak about the, the uh, Northwest Community Hub, okay, uh, which we, we started this hub uh, partnership with ABC Head Start, El Rashid Mosque, and Area Council One. So that was back in 2018. Um, in 2019, we applied for the Community Facility Partner Capital Grant Program and city recommended funding of $58,169. And due to the COVID, um, our, the partners um, decided that it was important for them to, to look after their organizations, okay, and manage their programs for their participants during the pandemic. So our meetings have had stopped, paused, okay? So the business, the money that we were approved for, for the, to work on the business case, that money was canceled, the grant was canceled. So what we're asking for is if we could have that, uh, that funding restored, that 50, 58,000 restored, so we could continue to work on our business case. Um, the, all the partners are in agreement to start meeting again. And uh, we, so that, that is our plan. And we also would like, um, we're interested in resuming planning discussions with the city. And it has been expressed to us that we, we should be working with, we will be working with a neighborhood services representative. 
So that that is something we would like to have restored to us. The next thing I would like to speak about is our operate. Uh, it's our our okay. Northwest Edmonton Seniors application for FCSS Family and Community Support Services funding for a three-year term of a funding stream. So in April, we applied for this three years of funding through FCSS for our volunteer program, which was um, 70,000 per year. Um, in, in July, we were notified that we, we were not successful with this funding for the next three years for our volunteer program. Um, we were notified in October that there are there is some extra funds um, available through the Senior Center Investment Program, um, the Facility Conservation Program. So, but that funding is so is less than the seventy thousand per year. It's like forty thousand per year. So we are a little worried about our funding for our volunteer program for our seniors. Okay. Um, in past, we've been funded by FCSS since 1981. So we've been funded by, by that um, stream for a very long time. Um, funding is receiving, okay. So the uh, facility conservation program, it, the funds available for that annually is up to $40,000. So it's right there we're looking at less funds per year to fund our program. We are concerned that the available funding won't be enough to support our volunteer program. Um, Northwest Edmonton seniors values volunteerism. Without many of our volunteers, we would not have so many successful programs. Meaningful volunteer roles support seniors being engaged and give seniors a sense of belonging and connectedness. Our volunteer program is a preventative social need in the community. Northwest Edmonton Seniors um, totally supports our volunteers and would, would like them to uh, continue. Sorry, Debbie, time is up. Is it up? Sorry, yeah. I had one last closing thing. Okay. Can I say one thing? Quickly. Yes. The, um, I, to my knowledge, the City Council doesn't have a seniors advisor. Okay, and my question to council is, are there plans for council to add a seniors advisor? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right. So mm -hmm. next we go to um, Melanie Hoffman. Thank you, council. I'm um, a member of the Energy Transition and Climate Resilience Committee, but I am here today just as myself, as a community regeneration advocate. Um, I'm here to again to offer my partnership because I am deeply about our city's well-being and am deeply concerned by this budget that to me suggests that the city is struggling to take the climate emergency seriously. And I get that. Uh, there are a lot of needs and wants tugging on our attention in 2022 for myself as a physical scientist. I feel like I've always understood that human activity was changing the climate, um, but it wasn't really terribly urgent. It was only four years ago when my work brought me face to face day after day with the mountains of evidence that shows unequivocally that we are in a global climate and nature emergency that I really got it and I got activated. And ultimately I found good news from climate scientists and ecologists and engineers and indigenous leaders. We already know the solutions. We have the know-how we need but we continue to desperately require bold implementation at all levels. Administration's climate team put forward a really minimal request for funding toward Edmonton's climate emergency response. It is a minimalist foundation, a modest request towards our continued existence. It must absolutely form the basis of your four-year budget. Our municipal climate emergency declaration is three years old now, so um, I figure this must be the first four-year budget that is to directly mount an emergency response. Some small capital climate items are funded, rec center solar, tree planting programs, but uh, none of those foundational infrastructure pieces that are needed to unlock next steps in the transition. So what is the Edmonton we want to live in? We're all here yesterday, today, tomorrow, 
because we love the city. We are at home here, we care, we all want to see our communities flourish. So I hope how can those of us who carry the reality of the climate emergency in our hearts, souls, and minds help council and administration. The Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee is just the tip of the iceberg of Edmontonians committed to climate action. We understand the real cost of inaction. So many of us are doing the work to transform our lives and our communities, but individuals alone cannot win this. We need your help. We need a budget that mounts an emergency response for our communities, and this budget does not serve Edmonton. Over 6,000 homes in exhibition lands and river crossing might never have access to fossil-free district energy, requiring retrofits within a decade of being built. Do you want to do that to homeowners? Families remain stuck using their cars, unable to safely switch to a bike or a bus. Seniors and other vulnerable Edmontonians die in heat waves, unable to find shelter because there are no local resilience hubs. This is not the Edmonton I want my daughter to grow up in. I need you to feel my terror when we realize we won't have done enough. Your work makes a massive difference in our lives. From the property tax bills, those of us affluent enough to own a home pay, to our ability to move around the city and be safe in an extreme weather event. I'm here to help facilitate climate reality and climate solutions and to help drill down into how much different actions have the potential to contribute to climate action as the carbon budget aims to do. Globally, Edmonton is among the wealthiest communities and also among those with the highest per person greenhouse gas emissions. It is our duty to do our fair share so that we may continue to collaboratively advance action at the provincial and federal level and request action from all other humans on this planet. Municipalities are the sweet spot for climate action. In our communities is where the transformation to a regenerative society is ultimately going to happen. So how are you going to turn this into a climate emergency budget? Will you create a new budget that is a climate emergency budget first, then fund necessary work such as the high level bridge and then address other wants, needs and nice to have? My request is that you pass a budget that gives us a fighting chance at that 35% increase in our emissions by 2025, which is the year after the next. There will be no Edmonton of 2 million, not as we envision in the city plan, in the scenario that this proposed budget charts. I want to see that city plan become reality. You choose your role in this apocalypse. The Greek word apocalypsis means nothing more than revelation. So please tell me, will you help make this revelation a positive one? Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. So we are almost at five o'clock. We are going to take a dinner break now and we'll be back at uh, six and we will resume with, uh, with the speakers at that time. Until then, we are on recess.
to order. We have Gorm, and uh, we heard from uh, Debbie Kisser, Sandy Fleming, Melanie Hoffman, and next speaker will be Jennifer Hayel. But before I do that, I have a very special request from someone. And that someone is our speaker number 20, Gracie Klein. And uh, she's probably the youngest presenter to us today. And she has requested if her friend, Brooke Halbauer, could go with her to make presentation together. Is that okay, team? I think when we can make that happen, Gracie. Right? Okay. All right, so we're going to make that happen. And also, we have Keith uh, Helsinga waiting almost for two days, all day today, right? We're going to add him to the uh, panel eight as well, right? So, but we have to wait your turn. You'll be the last one on panel eight. Good. Can all I right. Say thank you now. Huh? No, can I say no. Thank you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can say thank you. We like thank yous. Yeah. All right. Okay, Jen, you are next. Go ahead. My name is Jennifer Heil, and I'm grateful to speak to you today about the $4 million request for funding for the River Valley Outdoor Center. And I also want to share how the Edmonton Ski Club has the power to change the entire trajectory of our citizens' lives. The request for $4 million in funding offers an outsized return, unlocking an additional $11.6 million in investments from, a partner, from partners and impacting many generations to come. So if it wasn't for the Edmonton Ski Club, I would not be an Olympic champion in freestyle mogul skiing, nor would I have just graduated from Stanford University where I pursued a one-year MBA in order to lead a women's health tech startup. So how are these two things linked and why do they matter? <laughs> well, when I was nine years old in West Edmonton doing errands with my mom, I opened a Sports Illustrated magazine filled with pages of Olympic athletes. And it was right then and there in the West End that I decided I would become an Olympian and try to win a gold medal for Canada. It was the Edmonton Ski Club that afforded me the opportunity to pursue this dream. I'm so proud to be a world-class skier from the Edmonton Ski Club. Some other places may have huge mountains, but more importantly, we have strong programs and community leaders passionate, skilled, and dedicated program leaders. I can remember the excitement of driving from downtown Spruce Grove into the big city, into the heart of the River Valley. I felt the energy of the city, and I had the opportunity for the first time to meet kids from Edmonton and all across the region. It was exciting, and I felt like I belonged in the big city. The extensive and diverse community groups that are involved in the development of the River Valley Outdoor Center are going to also make this place a home for so many kids across the region. Many of these kids who are currently underserved. Before pursuing my, uh, my education at Stanford, I was actually VP of Via Sport British Columbia, responsible for sport programming for 800,000 members in British Columbia. And I also led the development of the Safe Sports Center to address ab abuse and harassment in sport. So I can tell you from my experience that it's not enough to say that the River Valley Outdoor Center will be accessible and inclusive. And this group behind this project understands this. It's why they're going beyond ticking the boxes. The group is designing a welcoming environment by including its key stakeholders in the design process in order to make sure that these kids, especially those from underserved groups, underserved groups, know that they matter, know that they have a safe place to come and build their confidence and support their mental health through physical activity and being outdoors. This has never been more important as we find ourselves in the middle of a mental health crisis of our youth. Experts are identifying symptoms of anxiety in children as young as five years old. So to conclude and answer that question on how getting started at the Edmonton Ski Club is related to my education and why it matters at all today, 
Well, let's look at the research. The research shows that being outside is an effective treatment for depression and that kids who are physically active do better in school, earn more at work, can prevent and treat depression and anxiety, reduce drug use, and this list goes on and on. All of these aspects are true in my own life. Sport has single-handedly taught me how to be resilient and confident in order to live my life to the fullest and to be an active community member. Getting kids active outdoors and engaged in the community for all these reasons is just no longer a nice to have. So I'd like to ask for, with your support, we can ensure that this unique and dynamic project goes forward to help build a community that sets all of our citizens up for success and signals that they matter. These are often difficult outcomes to quantify, but we know they are the foundation in supporting healthy citizens and a dynamic community. So thank you for your consideration and thank you for this opportunity today. Now, thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. Really appreciate it. And next, we will go to Govin Timsina from Multicultural Health Brokers. Govin, are you there? Nope. How about Rispa Trombley? Rispa Trombley. Nope. Ivan Quintero. Yvonne Quintero. Nope. Yvonne, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm oh. here. Hello. All right, you're next. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, Major and Counselors for this opportunity to talk uh, and represent a group that has uh, been trying for many years to build an indoor facility for tennis and pickleball. I am a professional fitness and tennis coach uh, and currently coaching at the University of Alberta. And I work there with different groups uh, of kids, levels, uh, beginners from five-year-old to 18-year-olds, advanced players, also some adults. Um, as you probably, all of you already know, tennis has grown so much in the last few years in popularity, uh, probably mostly because of the success of our professional players in the sport. Uh, Canada just won um, three or four days ago, just won the Davis Cup for the first time in over 100 years. Uh, so is, uh, I've been witness uh, of coaching tennis in the city, uh, in the summertime uh, of how much talent we have in this courts, city courts and with kids and adults as well, but mostly with kids. And this talent kind of gets lost when winter comes, right? So, uh, because we don't have enough indoor facilities for the demand. So they kind of fall in love with the sport, but then they don't have a place to go uh, after that. So they kind of quit. Some stay, but then quit. We only have one public in indoor facility. I, I work there at the Savile Sports Center and he's uh, working to his capacity. And it doesn't, we can't we can take any more kids there. So we've been working on this and uh, I can speak from my own experience uh, coming from a country in South America, Venezuela specifically, uh, Tennis has brought me where I am right now. Uh, I've been trying to do this for many years. I try over there, but the political situation of the country uh, has led to a massive immigration. I end up in Canada and I'm so happy for it. I've been living, this is my home now. I've been even living here for over 11 years now and a proud Canadian citizen. And uh, coaching here, the team of the university, we have brought to Edmonton three national university championships. Uh, so so I, I, I'm very passionate about the sport and I would really like these kids to have more opportunity, the same opportunities I had. I was just lucky that I was born in a country where it's 20, 20 degrees all year round and I had a chance to develop the sport. Uh, this, this brings me to Pickleball. 
pickable, as we probably already know, is, is the fastest grown sport in North America. And uh, it's mostly seniors, the one that play this sport. And again, they don't, they don't have a home in Edmonton. There's zero indoors uh, pickable facilities in, in Edmonton. Uh, I can see why they like it so much. You don't, it's a smaller court and just keeps our, our seniors, you know, with something to do, especially during the winter time. And uh, it's, it's just great for, for everyone, right? So I'm here to ask for funding for the recreation uh, partnership and facility investment program, right? That uh, supports this, this types of, of uh, projects, right? In the past, uh, uh, the Community Facility Partnership Capital Grant Program, okay, that's how it was called in the past, and now it's called Recreation Partnership and Facility Investment Program. And they both, both program has the purpose to partnership between cities and group like ours. So I just, you know, wanna uh, ask the counselors to consider this and to fund this program see if we can make this a reality. Uh, there's another member of our group that will be speaking later on and that will give you more details about, about our idea. So thank you very much for considering and that's it. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Yvonne. And uh, next we have Jody Kifiak, uh, Adventist Nami Water Polo Club. In joining us and uh, we'll follow by Eva. So Jody, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you guys. Um, uh, thank you, good evening, Mayor Sohi and Council. My name is Jody Kifuk, I'm the president of the Edmonton Water School Club. I Ivan, Ivan, can you put yourself on mute, please? <laughs> Yvonne, here you go, good, sorry. Good, Jody, nope, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I currently have two daughters in water polo. Some of our parents and athlete, athletes attended council yesterday. We were here, we were here there in council from 10 a.m. to 3.30. <laughs> it really gave us an understanding and appreciation for what you, the council, have to decide for the future of our great city. So I thank you. Our water polo club was supported yesterday, supported yesterday in a small rally outside City Hall with athletes from diving as well as artistic swimming. It was heartwarming to see young female athletes take time out of their school day and parents out of their work day to join the efforts of voicing their collective opinion through a peaceful demonstration and standing up for something they truly believe in. The fact that all of these all the athletes attended yesterday were female speaks volumes that aquatics is keeping them engaged, passionate and committed to their sport. Uh, it's not often that our aquatic community joins together to support one another. Um, the aquatic community at the Kinsman, Kinsman tries to be fair to one another when it comes to pool allocation, but it's a stressful situation as there's simply not enough room for all of our clubs to function efficiently. We do the best we can with what we have. However, our clubs are being stunted as there is no room to grow. I'll take you through a bit of what a water polo what a practice looks like at the Kinsman from our water polo perspective. There are practices where we share the pool with master swimming. They need a 50 meter training course. What that means for water polo is we do not have access to the wall. No wall equals no net. No wall equals no pushing off for the swim ball. We work around the 50 meter lane ropes until their practice is complete. There are practices where kayak water polo takes over the 50 meter pool and the 40 athletes from water polo go to the dive tank to finish their practice. What does that mean for water polo is we're cramped into the dive tank, which is about five degrees warmer than the regular pool and water polo athletes. It, it what seems like a small difference in water temperature is actually a lot. Like I said, we do the best we can and we make do with what we have. Edmonton Tsunami, Tsunami currently trains at the Kinsman until 10 p.m. Our athletes are aged 13 and up. Most of our athletes commute to the Kinsman is over 30 minutes away from their home. So athletes on average are going to bed between 11 and midnight, four days a week. If our athletes wanna be a part of Water Polo Canada's regional development program, they need to be back at the Kinsman for 6.30 a.m. So on average, these growing 
young teenagers with a love for their sport and possible Olympic dreams are getting five hours of rest a night. Late pool times are a detriment for growing our sport as well. Alberta Water Polo has named Edmonton Tsunami the high performance program in Edmonton. If younger athletes, 12 years of age, want to join the National League program, they too will have these late night practices and early mornings. This is a tough transition and one that most parents do not want to make. So if water polo is having these kind of issues, then I can only imagine the stress that is being placed on public swim or leisure swim at the Kinsmen, as well as other facilities around Edmonton. Swimming is a life skill and pool time should be available to all Edmontonians. There are many different aquatic programs that will benefit from a 50 meter pool. Not all of these programs are high performance. What about underwater hockey? Kayak water polo, which also require a 550 meter pool. If Lewis Farms Aquatic Center is built with its original approved plans, it will enhance and elevate pool allocation for all our aquatic communities. Lewis Farms Aquatic Center is not just about high performance. It will be a center and a facility that will affect aquatics as a whole in Edmonton. This facility is not a want. It is a need. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Jody. Uh, Eva, you're next. Okay, switch. Okay. Hi. Um, hello, Mayor Sui and Council. Uh, my name is Ava Kafuk. I am 13 years old. And I am going to be speaking about my experience of water polo and the Lewis Farmers Pool. Um, I have been playing water polo for almost nine years now, and I'm currently playing water polo with uh, Edmonton Tsunami. Water polo has always been such a safe space, and it's always given me a sense of belonging, and it's always been my home, and just the people there are just so amazing, and they're just awesome. My dreams of water polo, I've always wanted to go to the Olympics since I was eight. Kendra Paul went to the Olympics and she is still on the national team. I've always wanted to be here and I've always reached high and wanted to get where she wanted to go. And I, I want to win our country a gold medal in the Olympics. I've also wanted to go to college, do college water polo for a couple of years now. That's always also been on my list. But the thing that's been really hard to keep my mind on track is the pools, our pool space is very limited and restricted. We're, like my mom said, we are getting pushed into the dive tank. Uh, most of our practices, we, the pool, it's really, it's really hot and it's affecting my ability to play and perform at the, the level, my best, to the best of my ability. There are also times, our pool time is, uh, is uh, awful. It's, it's, we end at 10 o'clock and I don't get home until 1130 and therefore I go to bed around midnight and then I have to get up again at five o'clock in the morning to be at the pool at six. It is struggle. It is honestly and then I have to uh, juggle academics and school into this. It's almost impossible. Well, and like it, I'm, I'm 13 years old. I can't imagine what the 12 uh, people younger than me are going through. And I did the transition last year to going from the community level coming up to the NCL level. It was pretty tough, and I wasn't doing the morning practices then. I can't imagine what the bridge program is doing right now and what the girls are going through. Oh well. It was definitely probably easier for me to do it, but then it just, it's just getting worse and worse as the years go on. If this pool does get built, this pool time, we will get to spread out and the West End is closer to my house and we'll be getting to the pool faster and more efficiently. This pool is important and it, we need this pool. It's 
it's just we need it and it's it's going to support all the people that want to go far in water polo, including me and my teammates. It's going to help us reach for our goals and get supported. It's just going to push us further and further, and it's going to help us. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Eva, for, uh, for joining us and sharing your thoughts with us. Before I go to Dustin, Dustin uh, Costler, uh, uh, Hamilton, you want to make that a little procedural amendment that we need to make? Yeah. Yes, um, this is uh, very quick. Um, that the following be added to the November 28, 29, 30, 2022 City Council non-stat public hearing budget meeting agenda. Uh, replacement pages 7.2, uh, proposed 2023 to 26 operating budget, attachment to pages 639 and 640. Yeah, You're just replacing the pages with new pages, yeah. okay. Uh, need Second. a seconder? Second by Councillor uh, Nack, right? Okay, okay please vote. Uh, yes, In for favor. me. Yes. Yes. I don't think we have any of us. Okay. Just vote verbally if you're not signed on to uh, eScribe. Yeah, I'm kicked out. I'm a yes. in favor we have all the votes display the votes please that is carried 13 to 0 okay now we are going to go to Dustin Badger joining us remotely hello uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present um, this is uh, just listening to these conversations <laughs> there's there's a lot to take in um, and so uh, thanks for for, um, yeah, thanks for giving us this, this chance. Uh, my name is Dustin Bajer, and I am uh, one of the original members of the, and, and current member of the Edmonton Food Council. Uh, I consult for Sustainable Food Edmonton. I'm an urban beekeeper uh, and a community tree grower. I also um, am an urban agriculture uh, consultant, and I'm here to talk in support of the unfunded service package of $480,000 to enable urban farming and gardens on public land in lieu of turf management. And so I believe that the idea here is that instead of the city spending money managing turf, we could uh, convert some land that has been deemed appropriate to urban farms and to urban gardens. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about uh, climate change. Um, and I strongly believe that urban agriculture is a climate adaptation strategy. Um, I believe that urban agriculture, urban farms, urban gardens is uh, an important uh, piece of green infrastructure. Uh, I do think that it is a fantastic community building tool and place making tool. And I would like to make the case that it is fantastic for um, a local economy. Uh, in 2013, this is going to seem like a tangent, but in 2013, there was 13 craft breweries operating in the province of Alberta. Uh, in 2022, there's a little over 170 employing over 3,000 people. And so the question is, is what happened in the last nine years where we've gone from 13 to 130? And in December of 2013, uh, what happened was the provincial government reduced the barriers to entry uh, for craft breweries by reducing the minimum batch size. I kind of equate um, or I equate allowing urban farms on city land as a similar kind of lowering, lowering of the um, of those barriers. Um, so the biggest barrier presently to urban agriculture is access to land. Um, I know of quite a few folks who would love to practice urban ag and I think have some really interesting innovative models, um, but access to uh, access to land is always kind of that barrier. And so I, I, I strongly feel that while reducing the amount of land that the city needs to manage as turf, um, the city could um, in fact, uh, allow an entire sort of segment of, of agriculture that's been sitting here waiting, trying to figure out how to do this uh, to, to flourish. 
licorice. And so I think that there's a huge uh, economic opportunity here. And I think that it makes sense. It's very much in alignment with fresh. Uh, it's very much in alignment with city plan. Um, I think it's very much in alignment with the energy transition strategy. And so for that reason, I re highly recommend um, uh, making it a reality. I think there's a really, a really great opportunity here for the city of Edmonton. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dustin. Our next, we go to Murray Frabone, joining remotely. Murray? Murray Frabone? Hi. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Council, for having me. My name is Marie Frabone. I am here to oppose any funding, which includes the $10.9 million in the capital budget for 2023 to 2026 to the Edmonton Zoo. I'm imploring the council to please vote no for the funding of the $10.9 million until a complete evaluation is done by a third party on the zoo and its foundations for the city and zoo to release all financial reports and itemized statements of spending over the last 10 years and make it readily available to the council and public for review by the Freedom of Information Act within 30 days. To also include an investigation into Gary Doerr over his tenure as director of the Edmonton Zoo. Over the last 10 years, the zoo has been funded $131 million. Most recently, in March of 2022, another $50.3 million was approved for winterizing certain animal habitats. Not one dollar of it, might I add, was allotted for the elephant enclosure. Now, eight months later, the zoo once again is asking for another $10.9 million for upgrades and improvements. There is a pool that was highly recommended by an expert hired by the zoo for therapeutic care for one of the animals. Yes, it was Lucy. Does the 50.3 or the 10.9 million include this highly specialized pool or will additional funding be needed? Quote from Doerr, hopes it can be included in the 50.3 million, end of quote. Council and taxpayers, this is definitely a question that you should be asking now. Quoting Councilman Cartmel, the decision was made to be in the zoo business almost 20 years ago, end of quote. It should not be just a given to approve funding for the zoo because it's part of the city's regular maintenance and renewal plan. Over the years, but in particularly most recently, the zoo has continued to not adhere to their major deficiencies reported by the city itself. Before the 50. 0.3 million was approved. Yes, I know it's not a done deal. The zoo director, Gary Doerr, was fully aware, as were patrons of the zoo, of the aging zoo and all the deficiencies, which included animal and patron safety. Yet none of that money was allotted to those issues first. The reason behind the 50.3 million is to winterize summer animal enclosures so the zoo could gain more foot traffic in the winter and add some comfort to the patrons in the cold months as stated. It's called greed over safety. The taxpayers, patrons, mayor, as the council should be outraged after the findings of the city's report about their zoo. The report has been seen around the globe. It is extremely damaging to the city of Edmonton's reputation. Mayor Sohi, this is your city. So again, I implore you before signing on the dotted line, please just say no to the $10.9 million for the zoo and all under other funding. Please consider an investigation into the zoo and its foundations the last 10 years spending report and the dealings of the zoo director. Only then will you be able to make a very sound fact-based decision moving forward. I thank you, Mayor Sohi and council for your time. Thank you so much, Marie. Next, we will go to Christina 
Kruzeski, joining us remotely. Christina Kruzeski, going once, going twice. Christina Kruzeski, okay. We'll go next to Evan Lit Latour, Latour, right? Uh, Latour. <laughs> Latour, sorry, right. thank you. Present, yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Sohi and members of the City Council. My name is Evan Latour, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Protector Winters Edmonton chapter. We are a diverse group of outdoor enthusiasts who want to utilize our passion for natural spaces and turn that passion into direct climate action. Advocating for investments that will result in a climate resilient city is a key policy pillar for our organization. I am here today to voice our support of the implementation of the use of capital funds that will contribute to making Empton a more resilient city in the face of our changing climate. Over the past two days, you have heard from many individuals talk about the importance of investments in climate resilient infrastructure. Yes, these initiatives will support the reduction of Edmonton's environmental impact, but there are many other benefits to supporting these initiatives, which I would like to highlight. Implementing the energy transition strategy creates an opportunity for our city to continue the tradition of being some of the best energy innovators in the world. Our expertise in the energy sector has led to growth and economic prosperity in the past, and we can set our city up to respond to and supply the energy market in the future. These investments will result in the increased energy independence, reduce the environmental impact of our electrical grid, and provide jobs across multiple sectors. Approving funding for the Affordable Housing Investment Plan supports those who are most at risk for being impacted by the changing climate high quality, energy efficient, stable housing is both a social and environment or an economic investment. These actions will enable low income households to move out of poverty and prevent others from falling into less than ideal living situations. Creating opportunities for families to no longer rely on food banks and other social services, this will allow for Edmonton to become more prosperous as a city. As other speakers have mentioned, the timing for affordable housing is more important than ever in terms of alignment of support between the provincial and federal governments. Supporting the D District Connector Bike Network is a direct investment in the safety of Edmontonians who want the freedom and accessibility to travel between communities without using a vehicle. The potential and increased ridership can capture much more than people commuting to work. These can be families utilizing the space to teach their kids how to ride a bicycle in a safe environment, retired individuals who want to explore and interact with their communities in a more meaningful way, and children whose parents are letting them learn how to take on small amounts of responsibility by cycling to school instead of being dropped off in a car. Through these investments and initiatives that progress towards our environmental goals, Edmonton creates an opportunity to diversify our energy and economic sources while also moving our city towards a zero carbon future. As an example, Transportation is one of the largest sources of carbon pollution in Canada. If the appropriate cycling environment allowed an individual to decide to ride their bicycle instead of driving just once a day, their personal emissions would drop by 67%. To achieve this increase in ridership, safe cycling infrastructure needs to be developed, as it is one of the most important factors in increasing the amount of cyclists within a city. Investments in green infrastructure are benefits to the health and well being of Edmontonians and can provide economic impacts to small businesses embedded in communities, which was also mentioned by previous speakers today. The city of Edmonton put out a call for its citizens to work together to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 35% by the year 2035. Achieving a goal such as this requires strong leadership on initiatives that create the opportunity for Edmontonians to have a personal impact and to contribute to completing this goal while providing a benefit to the city's economy. It's time for Edmonton to follow the evidence and create a healthier, more sustainable city. I'd also just like to take uh, take the time to just thank everyone for their time. And I really appreciate the high level of attentiveness that this council has provided to the many speakers throughout the course of these hearings. Um, this concludes my comments. Thank you. 
Thank you, Evan. Next, we will go to Elaine Sol Solez, <coughs> friends of Sconarek, joining us remotely. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Elaine Solez, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Friends of Scona Rec. Our group is advocating for funding for the Rolling Hills Leisure Center in the upcoming four-year capital budget. We, re we really appreciate that this past May, the Community and Public Services Committee approved preparing an unfunded profile for this project to be considered for funding in the capital budget deliberation. In previous councils on various aspects of this project a number of times over the years, as well as advocating to keep Scone Pool open to an alt. The Elaine, as well as contain a gym. Elaine, now uh, you're not coming out clear. What, what we will do is actually, oh. if you could go to a better find a better spot with better connection or or we are tight turning off your camera see how it goes um, okay I'll, I'll try that that oh i lost my connection yeah okay we'll come back to you you try to fix that and i'll come back to you later on but i'll go next to uh uh jeff papino jeff are you there Yes, I am. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My topic is in uh, support of funding the construction of the compact rec center at the Rolling Miles District Park site uh, for the 2023 to 26 budget. And I'm sure that the councillors and city staff are well versed in the details of the city plan and the Connect Edmonton strategy plans. So I won't bother with a lengthy regurgitation of specific details and or read straight from the plans. But I will remind you that both plans offer uh, the council vision strategy and goal setting related to uh, promoting healthy and active living for all residents of Edmonton, supporting community focused recreational, leisure, social and cultural programs, the fostering of vibrant, complete communities with a variety of amenities and recreational activities, as well as transportation options. And more specifically, the plans discuss the creation of communities of communities or districts with the diverse amenities that support Edmontonians living more locally, developing, enabling and animating community hubs for intergenerational gathering, efficient use of transportation infrastructure that will serve a variety of demands and purposes. So I don't think anyone here would take issue with these ambitions. And I also uh, realize there's a great deal of complexity of how this will be realized throughout the different parts of the city. Uh, where the rubber hits the road in the Scona district is that the construction of a compact rec center at Rolly Miles Park would fill the gap in recreational amenities created by the closure of Scona Pool. Uh, would offer the ability to leverage existing land resources to expand the range of recreational opportunities available to people on what will be the, the site of a newly improved and renovated Rolly Miles District Park, which has, has already been, been funded. And finally, it will fit neatly into the transportation network, the existing transportation network, including the active transport and bike lane network. So let's take this forward and talk about a couple of the targets outlined in the city plan as we move from 1 million to 2 million residents. And just, just remind everyone that the, the plan projects 600,000 additional residents will be welcomed into the redeveloping area with 50% of new units added through infill uh, citywide. And so that's exactly the kind of neighborhood that we're talking about with the uh, Scona district. 15 minute districts that will allow people to easily complete their daily needs and 50% of trips will be made by transit and active transportation. So how does the creation of the Raleigh Miles Rec Center tie into realizing this vision and achieving these targets? Well, first let's talk about intensification and densification. We've already seen intensification in the Scona district with a variety of medium scale developments that are, have been completed and the trend of replacing single family dwellings with semi-detached and skinny homes. Undoubtedly, this trend will continue along with the eventual completion of developments that will be built on sites that have already been zoned or rezoned, I should say, for medium and large projects. And when we think about what this actually looks like in the Scona district, it means far more people 
with far less individual space who, who live in this area. It also means that people who choose to live in this area will have decided to live in a more urban environment uh, that would be very well served by the 15 minute communities, district amenities and community hubs that the plan outlines. And what about the people that aren't living in this district? Well, let's face it, there will still be a lot of people living further out and we know that. Uh, how will a new rec center benefit them? Well, living local doesn't mean that everything needs to be next to where you live. Amenities that are close to where you work, where you go to school, where you hang out, or where you pass by every day is, is also part of your local life. So the many people who travel Calgary Trail on their commute south, the students from all over the city who attend Skona High School, and the people using the Raleigh Miles District Park amenities can stop in and enjoy the, the rec centre along with the local residents. But let's change the focus from what everyone else is doing or what they might do, and we'll change it to, how about me? My family of four currently lives in a 73-year-old 900-square-foot house. We live in Allendale. We live with one car and our children are in the local high school and junior high. We bought our house well before we started our family. And while things are a bit cozy now, uh, we have everything we need in this community. And we expect that eventually it will be just the two of us again. And by this time, we expect to be contemplating retirement. And unlike my parents, or our parents, who moved out of their empty family home and for, uh, moved like you know further in to the core for a more compact and connected place, my partner and I hope to be able to retire and age in place, enjoying great amenities, including a recreation center and community hub in our 15 minute district. And this sounds pretty good to me. Um, but when I imagine what would make this scenario even better, it would be that our children would consider remaining in our area would, to be a, a viable option. A rec center is obviously not sorry, going to Jeff. break this issue. Jeff, I'm creating sorry. the kinds of livable urban communities described in the city plan. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right, we'll go back to Elaine Solaz, if your connection is better. Elaine, are you there? Okay, we'll come. Uh, yes, I, I'm, okay. I am here. Okay, am go ahead. Here. I'm just trying to, uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm trying to find my presentation again. It, it uh, kind of uh, may have disappeared on me. No, here we go. Okay, go ahead. Here we go. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Elaine Solez, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Friends of Skona Rec. Our group is advocating for funding the Rolling Miles Leisure Center and the upcoming four-year capital budget. We really appreciate that this past May, the Community and Public Services Committee approved preparing an unfunded profile for this project to be considered for funding in the capital budget deliberations this fall. We've been before you and previous councils on various aspects of this project times over the years, as well as advocating to keep Skona Pool open until the new leisure center is built. The Rolling Miles Leisure Center will replace Skona Pool, as well as contain a gym, exercise area, and multi-purpose room, contributing to creating a 15-minute community in the Skona district that the city plan envisions. It will also contribute to the transportation mode shift. Separated bike lanes have already been added to nearby roads, 76th Avenue and 106th Street. Uh, if the clerk has it, could you please show my video now? Thank you. Um, the vi video shows the banners that uh, we put up at the time that uh, Skonapool was With the closing of Skona Pool, it is time to fund this new facility. With the design work underway, funded by Council in an adjustment to the previous capital budget, it is time to fund the Rolling Miles Leisure Center in this capital budget. The design will be ready next fall. Uh, could you please show my photo? I don't know if this is, um, is up there or not because I can't see it myself. Um, and leave it up for the rest of my presentation. But if it isn't there, all it says is time for a new rec center and it's hanging on the fence of uh, Skona Pool. As the Edmonton Sports Council speaker indicated yesterday, the compact leisure center planned for Rolly Miles Park is the future of rec facilities in Edmonton. This type of facility supports the city plans focus on creating 15 minute communities throughout the city by providing rec opportunities as higher density infill is built and the population grows. 
Rolling miles also will take pressure off the currently overburdened poles elsewhere in the city. As, as Jeff mentioned, it's ideally located along Calgary Trail, which is used by thousands of commuters each day to serve Edmontonians outside this Kona district. When the Rolling Miles Leisure Center was discussed at committee at the time the development of the functional program was launched, oh, now about oh, seven or eight years ago, it was seen as a model or prototype for future recreation facilities in the city. Building this facility will advance the proof of concept for providing smaller scale indoor recreation for Edmontonians. That said, we've read the capital budget documents and are aware of the budget constraints and the city's myriad important capital priorities. We're reasonable and realistic. We've been patient and persistent over many years and are prepared to continue our advocacy if funding isn't available right now. Time marches on though. While our persistence may be unlimited, our longevity isn't. I'm now in my mid seventies and want to be around to attend the opening of the Rolling Miles Leisure Center, as well as swim and participate in other activities there in my later years. I'd also like to take my granddaughter currently seven months old, to the new pool. She had her first and last swim at Skona Pool last month. In closing, we asked council to add the Rolling Miles Leisure Center to the 2023-26 capital budget as soon as you're able to do so. Hopefully the province will announce some of their surplus for min municipal infrastructure in 2023. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Elaine. So next we will go to Enrico Lazoi, friends of Skonarek, joining us remotely. Enrico, are you there? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, he's not going to be able to make it. Okay, no problem. How about Katrina Semeniak, friends of Skonarek, joining remotely. Katrina, there you are, go ahead. Dear Honorable Mayor and City Councilors, I'm happy to return to your chambers to share my passion for what our city has started, our first small-scale pool and gym called the Rolling Miles Leisure Center in Skona District Park. When my husband and I moved to Queen Alexandra 11 years ago, we found modest accommodations, then built our life to make healthy choices, easier choices. After years of walking to the U of A, when it was time to start our family business, we chose a building that we could walk to. Generations of excellent city planning and careful zoning practices have enabled us to walk to our church, dentist, salons, dance classes, playgrounds, Skona track, Skona pool, groceries, entertainment, and now that we have four young children to their elementary school every day. These were our choices and we made them on purpose. We meet neighbors in our streets and we thrive in a single vehicle. Two years ago, we deliberately purchased a lot in Queen Alexandra and developed a skinny infill here. When we can walk to places we enjoy, the healthy choice becomes the easy choice. And your vote to fund this center will help Edmontonians become better stewards of our environment by lowering our personal greenhouse gas emissions. The plan is to build as clean and green as possible to include accessible outdoor as well as purposeful indoor spaces to play in the larger context of the Skona district plan. It will benefit all the people who live here and all the people who pass through from downtown core or university. Now that my kids are older, they walk themselves all over the place with many of our close friends keeping an eye on their safety because we built those relationships too. They could walk to mini Olympian swimming and to summer swim camp and to regular swimming lessons. And we all participated in a family swim, which our generous community league sponsored for us right in our neighborhood at Skona Pool. None of us have swam since Skona Pool's closed. It's just not doable for us anymore. We've heard at least twice today that swimming is a life skill and lots of kids are currently missing out. If you think this sounds too good to be true, then I encourage you to call your realtor and come check out homes in Queen Alexandra and I will bring you a pie when you move in. Better yet, let's finish what your predecessors have started and focus on what we value, affordable, walkable, 
inclusive, city-run fitness for everybody, especially the children who will still be children when Rolling Miles is complete. This small footprint recreation model will become the norm so that more neighborhoods in our great city, including your neighborhoods, will get to experience the joy and health benefits of a much shorter commute to a city rec center. This is the vision for a healthy, sustainable city. Your decision to finish funding the Rolling Miles Leisure Center in this budget cycle supports personal well-being, mental health, active transportation, and environmental stewardship. As a community, we always hope to keep Scona open until its replacement was built, and we are so close. The designs are beautiful, and many people are actively engaged in this project. So avoid further delay and say yes to funding this new model of Edmonton Rec Center today. Thank you for having us here, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Katrina. Next, we have Fabiola Del Valley, friends of the Skonarek, joining us remotely. Fabiola. Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yep. Okay. Hello, Honorable Mayor and City Councilor. My name is Fabiola Del Valle, and I live in the Queen Alexandra community. I'm so nervous to speak in front of not so many people. It's my first time to doing this. Don't be <laughs> nervous at all. all. <laughs> Don't be nervous at all, first, please. Yeah. <laughs> first of all, I immigrated to Canada uh, 14 years ago. And, and this time I've been uh, trying to learn how to drive, but I have no success here yet. So I traveled only by bus. Esconapol was the best and the closest place to go with my two young daughters for fun and fitness. I took my girls to Kingsland Pool one time. And it was a very difficult for me. Uh, I can return and the city bus gets, um, <laughs> the city bus to get there was fine, but the way back was very complicated. The three of us had to go so long to arrive back home. I cannot go from Queen Alex to Kingsman by bus or walking. Sadly, this year I couldn't find any spots available for my daughter's swimming classes. They will not learn to swim because Skonapur is closed. For this reason, the small Rolling Miles Recreation Center will be my dream come true. Every time I walk past a uh, Skona Pool, I imagine how the new Rolling Miles Leisure Center will change my life for, better, for the better. I will be much easier to walk only for a few blocks. And if funding this small pool, pool is in your hands, I know many friends and neighbors and all Edmontonians who travel through the core will appreciate having the Rolling Miles Recreation Center, please. I'm so happy to advocate for Rolling Miles. Well, thank, thank you so much. You did well. <laughs> there you go. Cool. So there's, a, there's a little kid behind peeking uh, their head. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My two daughters are <laughs> beside me say, you can do it, mom. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And you did it. Okay. Okay. Well, the next we thank go you to so you. Know, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate that. Next, we will go to Alex Dom Dominic, IQ Tennis and Pickleball Center. Joining us remotely. Alex, are you there? You need to unmute Alex. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, yeah, my name is Alex Dominic, and I'm here to talk about a uh, proposed multi-sports center at uh, John Fry Sport Park that our organization proposed to build. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so the goals of the project is to encourage and promote the games of pickleball, tennis, and beach volleyball at all age levels regardless of ability, to provide access to year-round pickable tennis and beach volleyball courts in Edmonton. We offer to offer inclusive and barrier-free facilities to enjoy the sports. 
Um, could you go on next slide, uh, next one, please? Um, so I'll do some project background. Um, um, you heard from our colleague from Ivan Contera before. So um, here is the background for the project. So first of all, uh, the city of Edmonton is experiencing huge demand for indoor tennis and pickable courts. For example, availability for public indoor tennis specific courts in Calgary is 21, which is approximately one per 76,000 people. In Raider, four, one per 25,000 people. In Edmonton, it's eight courts and it's one per 187,000 people. That's how many courts we have here. There are currently zero indoor speakable sport specific courts in Edmonton. Uh, this group need to rent different warehouses, uh, share courts with volleyball, which is have a wrong surface and it's, they have really big trouble to play on those surfaces. There are currently zero indoor beach volleyball courts in Edmonton. And in comparison, Calgary has five. Pickable is the fastest growing sport in Canada and Alberta being province with the highest number of registered pickable players in the country. According to Tennis Canada, Edmonton needs to increase the current tennis courts capacity. But in fact, Edmonton tennis courts inventory declined in the last 15 years. Also, many existing courts are in non-playable shape. Edmonton needs to identify the land for indoor courts facility and Joe Fry Sport Park is the perfect location for the new city indoor multi-sport center. Next one, please. Um, so near around multi-sport facilities already part of the John Fry Sport Park master plan. Our proposed indoor multi-sport center at John Fry Sport Park will support the increasing demand for indoor courts as well as provide convenient access for Edmontonians and out of town business. Next one, please. Um, you can see here, uh, this is the city proposal for the John Fry Park current, um, which we got from the um, city offices. Next slide, please. Um, so we are proposing, the facility we are proposing will contain, we actually, if you can go to the next slide, I will explain it right here, thank you. Uh, the main floor will include 10 tennis courts, eight pickable courts, and two beach volleyball courts. Change rooms, washrooms, showers, front desk area, and equipment storage area. The second floor contain viewing area, pro shop, and offices. The course area is divided with tennis courts being on one side and the pickable beach courts and volleyball courts on the other side of the viewing area, which provides better sound Proofing. Next one, please. Um, IQ Tennis and Pickable Center was chosen by the city of Edmonton through request for expression of interest process as the preferred group to construct and operate year round tennis and pickable facilities in Edmonton. Our group was formed in 2016 and register official as non-profit organization IQ Tennis and Pokeball Center in 2022. Our group is supported by Tennis Canada, Tennis Alberta, Pickable Alberta, and Volleyball Alberta. Next one, please. Um, our group will be able to commit up to $3 million of investments for construction of the proposed multi-sport center. The, focal, uh, the funds are through Alberta government grants private and bank loans. IQ Tennis Pickable Center with the city's financial support will be able to build indoor year-round multi-sport center. The operating cost will be borne through the membership fees and will not require any financial support from the city. Next one, please. So next, yeah. So here you see, uh, this is a letter from support. From I am Alberta. sorry. Uh, Alex, I would have to stop you here. Sorry, five minutes are up. Oh, I'm sorry. I just got, uh, if you no. come to the last slide, that's what we're asking for. Yeah, just uh, uh, just send us the slide. We'll have a, we have the slide here, just so, but you can email that to us. Good. I do. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. I have to be fair on five minutes for everyone. Sorry. All right, mm -hmm. now we are going to have some fun. Right, Gracie? 
Hey, Ron, you're next. Gracie Klein. All right, you have five minutes, Gracie. Go for it. Hello, council members and Mayor Sohi. My name is Gracie Klein. Thank you for letting me speak to you today about the importance of the Lewis Farms Aquatic Facility. I'm 11 years old, and I am a water polo athlete and a competitive swimmer. My dream is to get an aquatic university scholarship and to play for the national women's water polo team. I would like to give you a snapshot of my life as an aquatic athlete. I train four to five days per week. Some days I don't get out of the pool until 10 o'clock at night because there's not enough pool space for any earlier times to train in a deep water pool in the city of Edmonton. By the time I get home and get ready for bed, it is 11.30 at night. That is very late for an, for an elementary student. As I continue with my swimming, these late nights will increase. It amazes me that you will spend $170 million over the next three and a half years on 100 kilometers of bike lanes and are considering reducing the planned pool, pool space at the new Lewis Farms facility. The budget surplus of $69 million this year more than covers the proposed $59 million cut to the Lewis Farms pool. Calgary has six times more competitive swimmers than Edmonton because they have more pool space. Edmonton is also behind same city size in aquatic facility access. Additionally, the last 50-meter pool built in Edmonton was in 1977. This stands as our only 50-meter pool. At the time, the population of Edmonton was 470,000 people. Our population today in Edmonton and the surrounding areas is over 1.2 million. These numbers alone overwhelmingly support the building of an Olympic-sized swimming pool with a deep water tank. Every pool built in the city from 2008 has lost pool space from the original plan except for Clairview. The current proposal for Lewis Farms Pool is a 71% re reduction in aquatic space from the 2004 strategic plan. I am 11 years old and I realize this reduction simply does not make sense. This city council closed the Skona swimming pool. This was a detrimental blow to high school competitive swimming in Edmonton. Swimming is an amazing physical activity that should be accessible to all citizens. You can make the choice to support the development of aquatic athletes in the city. Please make the right choice to support kids like me and Edmonton in achieving our dreams by building an Olympic-sized swimming pool with a deep water tank. Thank you. Thank you, Gracie. Well done. Yes, absolutely. Now we're going to go to your friend. Right? Brooke Halbauer. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, Mayor Sohi and Honorable Council Members. My name is Brooke Halbauer from Riptides and Tsunami Water Polo. I'm here to discuss the importance of having another high-performance aquatic center like Lewis Farms. For starters, there is already very limited pool space suitable for water polo in the city. This means that as an 11-year-old athlete in the high-performance stream, I have some weekday practices that go until 10 p.m. This is really hard on, or sorry, this is, this means I'm getting to bed sometime between 11 and 11.30. And this is really hard on me, but I love water polo and it means so much to me to be able to participate on the same team my older sister helped win national medals with. I'm worried that the pool space situation will become worse and worse because of pools closing and more demand. I'm also nervous that when I'm older, the Kinsman Sports Center will have even less space or shut down for repairs. And in that case, my team and say, I won't have anywhere to train. Edmonton has lots of water polo players that have gone to train or play with the national team. We even have Kindred Paul, an Olympian from the most recent Olympics. In order to continue having Olympians, we need more pool space, and Lewis Farms was something we were all excited about. The reason why I'm here is because I love water polo. I've been watching it since I was an infant and dream of being an Olympian myself. I'm worried that the pro proposed changes to the Lewis Farms pool will lessen the ch chances of this dream coming true. Thank you for your time, and I hope you can reconsider your changes to the Lewis Farms pool. Well, thank you to both of you for coming and uh, making presentations. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, uh, now we're going to go to Keith Heslinga. Keith? Marvelous. That's excellent on getting the name right. Okay. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm Keith, and like, thank you very much to Council and Mayor Sohi for getting me in early because, ironically enough, I'm going to, after this, bike to the pool to go to a water polo practice 
but I'm not asking for money for either of those two things. So um, really what I wanna do is I, I just kinda wanna touch on some budget effects that I've noticed but I don't hear in civic discourse from you or admin or amongst the public, right? And I really just wanna touch on some assumptions that we make as a city and administration makes as a city um, that really affect budget. Um, and that's the assumption that every road that we build, like we are going to repair that road and if we can't afford to do it, you guys are expected to raise taxes so you can do it. Then that's just what's gonna happen, right? Right now we have $12 billion of road in Edmonton and that means on a 50 year replacement schedule, eventually we're gonna be paying just for replacement, not resurfacing or crack fixing, $250 million per year. That's a billion dollars per capital cycle and because inflation works how inflation works, it's just gonna rise with inflation. That's, we're already locked in. Um, and then the other thing that we assume is that every road that gets full, we say that it's failed and we expect us to increase the size, right? And so these things really put us on a treadmill of being forced to raise taxes and the best that all of you can do is like really look at the budget and I really appreciate that, but what that does is that, that it, ensures that we don't get hosed when this happens, but we're still stuck paying $250 million per year just to replace the roads. And I don't need to look at anybody's numbers to know if it lasts for 50 years, there's $12.5 billion of it, that's what it is, right? Plus resurfacing, plus everything else, right? And then if you look at the habits that we have as a city, we build everything, or most things, out on the edge, which forces us to put more roads to it, and we really hope that we're gonna build houses out there so it won't look like the edge, but that just keeps us on that same treadmill, right? We can think about like the new bus barn, right? The LRT maintenance facility that's south of Anthony Henday. I'm sorry guys, the new pool, right? They're all way out there, um, and this is a really bad habit, right? And, we're, and, and it's making things worse for us. Um, and unfortunately, it looks like, to me, the fix that we've kind of chosen is to paper over business as usual with window dressing. Um, right, like, basically, city plan says, we promise to stop expanding, but it doesn't really say to the limits that we, you know, annexed a year before we put city plan out. And that's no guarantee that in 2023, when we run out of space, a future council won't just annex more, right? Um, we talk a lot about 15 minute neighborhoods, but not a lot about 15 minute catchments, right? So if you think of the new bus barn, well, how many people who are gonna be cleaning buses, working on buses, or driving buses, can walk, take their bike, or take the bus there in 15 minutes? Like, it's really easy to say, does this neighborhood have a pool, check. I mean, I'm an engineer and I love check boxes. Most of your administration loves check boxes. But to go and say, even if you think of like downtown, how many workers who can work downtown live 15 minutes from downtown? Like maybe we need less businesses downtown, more people. But like a 15 minute catchment is a lot harder to do. So I, I like it's tough, what I'm asking you to do is tough. Um, all right, and I wanna just touch briefly on bike lanes, right, because of the way that uh, we've done it. So uh, 230066 uh, is a $30 million bike lane on Saskatchewan Drive. And it's that because you gotta build on the side of the hill. But you gotta build on the side of the hill because you don't wanna take away that lane to traffic. 23067, $4 million. Uh, for the Saskatchewan Drive. Well, you've already closed that down during COVID multiple times. You open it up in the summer for almost free and there's $4 million to expand the bike lane. And that's, so it's really, that's a car cost. It's not a bike cost. Anyway, thank you so much for all your time and getting me in early. <laughs> there you go, you finished right on time. Thank you so much. Okay, well, I'm gonna, that concludes the, uh, 
people on panel eight, but I'm going to actually walk through some of the people, call their names again if they are here. Uh, Govin Tims Timsina, Multicultural Health Brokers, are you here? Govin? One, two, three, nope, okay. Rispa Trombley. Rispa Trombley. One, two, three. No. Uh, Christina Krzyzewski. Christina Krzyzewski. One, two, three. No. Enrique, Enrico Lozoi. Enrico Lozoi. One, two, three. No. All right. Now we can safely go into questions to members of the public. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'm not sure if she is still on the call. So I'm going back to our first speaker, Debbie Creaser. Are you still here, Debbie? Yes, I'm here. Oh, yay. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to go back to your asks and make sure I understood. So you, in the last budget cycle, you and several other organizations were approved for concept planning for a community hub. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And the amount that that approval was for is 59,000? Yes. yes. And, and so, and you've talked to Al Rashid, you've talked to area council and ABC and they're all they're all back in. It was really just circumstantial with, circumstantial with the pandemic and just sort of re-looking inwards during, to keep, yes, there, keep the lights agreed. on. Yes. Okay. That's correct. And can you talk a little bit more about, like, one thing that I don't think you got to really talk about in your presentation is... I know that the city is really moving to more of a centralized hub and spoke model uh, for the FCSS funding and with, with seniors. Can you speak to a little bit about what this will look like? What's at stake if this funding is not uh, received by not only Northwest Edmonton, but, but any of the other senior centers that have relied on FCSS funding and have lost FCSS funding? Yeah, there's um, there's about seven, maybe seven or eight senior centers in total. Um, I believe that lost our lost our funding for our 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 volunteer programs. Um, so I'm not really sure um, what happened there. Um, FCSS came back and and um, and they're now trying to find other funding for us uh, through the through the um, the skip grant. A community center investment program so they're they're trying to and they're in December they're supposed to get back to us um, so that maybe we can use some of that facility conservation funds but I don't know why um, we weren't given um, we weren't given it, because it was so many senior centers that were dropped for funding um, it just didn't make sense why that was happening to us um, and so there was no sort of decline it, over time, right? Like it wasn't like seventy thousand to sixty, like down. It was a drop, com like a complete drop, right? Right, right, right. Okay. We were asked to apply for a three-year funding um, back in uh, April, which we we got the approval to put in the full application, and then we were we were denied. So, um, and in you know we had years ago we had more more funding dollars than that because we had outreach as well so the outreach was was taken from us um the funding um and i believe fcss is looking at a new outreach model as well uh for july 1st of 2023 um so so they're changing things up um okay no that's um, that's great and then yeah. with back to the the original sort of hub business case development have you yes. you talked about needing an nrc a neighborhood resource coordinator assigned so did you originally have one and then again kind of that fell off during the pandemic and then you need in the, the nrc to come reconnect again 
Because, like, did you have That's conversations right. with administration about the reinstating of this fund prior to the budget debate? We did not. We didn't have any communication, actually. Um, things kind of cooled off, right, with COVID, and mm -hmm. then and now we're coming back around and um, just exploring uh, what's happening with us. Um, we had a, a, a representative from Sid, from a administration with the city that worked with us um, before COVID, and so it wasn't an NRC. Um, that person left, and then the, the other city person came on board. So now I guess we're waiting to reconnect. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. So I it's a bit of a struggle, you know. Yes. Yeah, no, I appreciate. Thank you for that context. I'm out of time, but I know it was uh, intimidating, and I you did a great job presenting today, Debbie. Thank you. Oh. I know it's difficult. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Rutherford, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering, uh, Mr. Domnich, did you want a little extra time here to finish off your presentation on the pickleball? You're muted, uh, Alex. Or some, we can't hear you for some reason. No, still no. not. Can't hear you, no. Why don't you fix your uh, mic in the meantime? I'll, I'll can, I can come back to Councillor Wright if that's the only okay. question we have. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That was going to be one of my questions as well. Uh, but uh, Dustin Badger, are you still online? <coughs> no. Dustin Badger? No? Okay, I guess he's not there anymore. Uh, Alex Domnich, can we hear you now? No, we can't hear you yet. Hi, but I guess we can't hear you. No, sorry, no. Alex, can't hear you. Can you disconnect your earbuds or your AirPod? No. I'm here. Oh, Yvonne, 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 maybe okay, yeah, yeah, you Yvonne, can answer that question. Why don't you yeah. answer then? Yvonne, what was the uh, ask? I know that you said there's uh, your group has $3 million to contribute to the project. What is your yeah. ask from the city? Yes, we do. Uh, well, it depends if is 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 if the recreation partnership and a, and facility investment program is funded, right? We believe the whole the whole amount to build the place is about seven million. We have three, so you know around there. Okay, thank you for that answer. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Principal. That sounds to your question as well, Councilor Wright. I just wanted to give him the opportunity so okay. we could see it. So they need $4 million. <laughs> Got it. Consul Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to to Sandy uh, from the Ski Club. Um, so you've already secured $6.6 .6 million from the federal government. You're requesting $4 million, but that is not not ongoing. That's not to help with operations. Did That's I hear right. that right? Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and then I'm just curious... You mentioned some of the, the key partners that would be involved in this. How important is this project for the ongoing operations of Folk Fest as well? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, uh, hopefully Andrew, their board chair, will be able to speak to that um, tomorrow. Okay. Um, but um, every summer, they uh, historically, they used the, the ski club facility for their base of operations, um, which was a city-owned facility. So effectively, the city was providing them somewhere for them to run their their operations every year. Um, so I think there's there's an ongoing expectation from them that that be maintained, um, and certainly they they have a mandate to green their operations and to be environmentally responsible. So I think they they like the idea of having a, a an environmentally sustainable modern facility to uh, to run their festival out of each year. Okay. Okay. That's that's great. And I'll um, I can follow up with Andrew tomorrow. Uh, I, did, I missed his name on the list, uh, but happy to hear he'll be joining us. Um, and then maybe just in terms of timing. So I know uh, council supported the ski club in, in having the temporary facilities on site. Um, when I look at the unfunded package, it looks like um, funding would be in twenty twenty five. 
Is that correct? When, are, when is the project supposed to be done? Um, and does that timing work? Um, we're looking at the end of 25 for, uh, for opening the facility. Okay. So I think it, it potentially could work, but um, certainly 24 is probably when most of the cost commitments would, would need to be made to contractors and so on. Okay, great. Um, that's actually it for me. Uh, I'm happy here there'll be some other speakers from some of the partners that are working alongside you. So I'll hold off for those. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Tang. Hello. Yes. Hello. I think, Alex, your mic is fully functional yes. now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. I think okay. your, the, uh, the question was answered by your colleague, Yvonne, was on the how much, right. how much you it need. It was not exactly answered, if I can just... Yeah, you know bit. what? You know what? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and uh, go ahead and respond to that question around what exactly is the ask? Okay, so uh, three things we're asking here. Uh, first of all, we're asking to keep John Fry Sports Park for the existing and future uh, sport projects. Number one. Number two, we're asking to reinstate community. Um, uh, the, the program that was canceled for the community finance project. And uh, the third one, it will be, we're asking to uh, help us to finance the project that we are offering to build in John Fry. Um, the, Ivan was a little bit, um, um, so the, the way we see that financing, we, we can provide up to $3 million for this project. The, if the program, through the city for the uh, sports facility will be approved. They can provide um, up to 30% of the project cost. And uh, um, a similar project was built in Calgary, it cost about um, a little bit over 9 million. So we'll be looking three to $4 million in addition to that. So if the, um, if the, um, um, the program to the city will not be reinstated, then we will be asking for more money to cover that project. Okay, yeah, great, thank you very much. Um, you know, we've had some conversations uh, with you and Yvonne about John Fry specifically. Um, yes. And, um, and so, just, so just so that we're clear, the total project you're looking at uh, for the indoor facility is around 4 million. The total cost of the project, including parking lots, including services, including all the um, all the uh, grading, dirt moving, everything is uh, not it's up to nine million dollars. And this okay. is not um, so the, the the bubble itself and, and the courts itself, but if they we're going to build them by itself, it will not be more than five million dollars. OK, and which um, we already have three. So if city can help us with building the parking lots, bringing the services in, then of course the, you know, maybe yeah. through other means, that cost of the project reduced dramatically. Yeah, no, great. And the last time we spoke, um, I understand that there will have been some conversations with uh, city staff as there's some, you know, geological studies that need to still need to be done at the park. Um, just wondering if your group has been in conversation with city staff about servicing, about, um, uh, you know, potential partnership, recognizing that this community recreation partnership grant is up for budget discussion this time. We've been talking to them almost on a weekly basis. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, as far as I know, they do have some kind of uh, ideas how to proceed with that project that actually, um, as you know, that is city's idea to build um, project on this land, on John Fry Park, which we completely um, support. Mm -hmm. um, because right now, like I said, we, we don't have enough course, not for tennis, not for pickleball. Yeah. And uh, being a uh, winter city, basically, that's, that's yeah. a must to have. I guess the last question for you, uh, Alex. Um, I think on your slide, I've noticed that I think you have quite a n bit more number of partners than the last time we spoke. So you were able Correct. to, so you've, you've able to build more partnerships since in the last few months. 
Correct. Okay. Uh, we added uh, um, um, Volleyball Alberta to um, to the our partners. Uh, we figured that it will be quite cheap to a uh, two um, uh, two um, beach volleyball course to the project to build okay. it under one roof and which create more opportunity for more people to participate. That's great. Right now, thank you. Not. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tank. Councillor Jans. Thank you. Um, if I can go to uh, guest Solez, Elaine Solez, is your internet better? Uh, I think I'm okay. Yeah, so can you walk me through, I guess, so I've been, I've been quite critical of the Lewis Farms Rec Center right now that we just don't have the money to proceed here. Um, I wanted to get your sense of, of course, I know the group would love to have Raleigh Miles built immediately, um, but can I just get a clear sense of what is the ask of the group for this budget for this council? Okay, our ask is that at, that if okay, our ask is for the funding for the Rolly Miles Rec Center as presented in the uh, unfunded um, uh, projects list. I, I think it's something around seventy five million, I believe. Um, but just as a um, a concern we have is that we, we realize that there are a lot of, of uh, important things that the city uh, does here, and we aren't trying to bump anything right now. And we we understand that there may be provincial announcements and so forth uh, later on in the four year budget, and that you do the budget, uh, the capital budget, from time to time, and can make adjustments based on new funding uh, that becomes available that projects are completed uh, under budget, that frees up money. Some projects don't go ahead, that frees up money. So all we're, we're um, saying is that if you can't do it right now, we would like it allocated at, at uh, some point um, in, the, in this budget cycle. And, and we aren't trying to queue jump. Uh, the Lewis Farms has been, um, uh, you were, um, we're next in line after that one for rec facilities in the city. And I think it's been fairly clear that it, the need for that has been demonstrated. The, the price is pretty eye popping, but you know, it's, that's what the price is. So that, that would be, that would be our comment. We're not trying to bump another, um, another facility. We need facilities everywhere in the city. Right. But we would like to get it funded um, uh, and not not wait uh, to, you know, wait for more years. Right. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody who came, and I'll yield my time back. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is Gracie still here? She is. Oh, great. And, and Gracie, I missed the name of your friend. Uh, it's Brooke Hallbauer. Oh, okay. Hello, Brooke. Okay, so both of you, thank you so much for coming to speak. It's such a daunting thing and uh, shows a lot of bravery, so thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions. You may not know the answer to them, but that's okay. Um, a few days ago, maybe just yesterday, we had a former city councillor who came and talked about how we could have had the first um, common, like the first stadium that would have a roof over it, and that would have allowed us to use the stadium for so many more purposes over the years and really maximize our investment. Um, she was sad that they never did it. And really, no one really remembers that debate anyway. So when you hear about um, Lewis uh, Farms Rec Center getting you know, maybe scaled back or even paused. Um, I'm just wondering if you can think about how you will feel when you're an adult and you're telling your kids about it. Either of you can reply. Do you think that 
the the debates that we're having today will matter or do you think that having something that worked for you and your friends and to help you fulfill your dreams was maybe more important Well, this is a hard question to answer. I'm not sure how to answer it, but I do think the debates that we're having now, they do matter. Um, and I think for the future, they will matter as well. And I don't really know how to answer your question any further. Sorry. Yeah, sir. it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. What about Brooke? Um, I would have to say the same as Gracie. <laughs> Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. And I got to say that your statements were very well prepared, and they really moved me. And I, I just want you to know that, that I, I really took to heart everything you said. And I want you to know that this council is going to do everything in its power to help your dreams come true. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything, but we're definitely going to work on it. So thank you so much for coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor thank, Pickett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Councilor Hamilton. I just wanted to thank the young ladies uh, for uh, obviously everyone. I uh, thank you for coming and, and sticking with us all day, but thank you um, for coming. And uh, I know it's a school night um, and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, not everyone your age uh, come, gets to come and speak to council. So thank you. All right, special applause for Gracie and Brooke. Okay, so that concludes the questions, right? Yep. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, now we are gonna go move on to panel number nine. And uh, uh, I'll read out the names. David Dodge, Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. Remotely, David, are you there? David, one, two, three, no. Megan Ecker, Edmonton Heritage Council. Megan, are you there? One, two, three, no. Daniel Grist, joining remotely. Daniel, one, two, three, no. Oh, Daniel, are you there? No. No. Richard. Uh, Rich. Yeah, Daniel, I'm here. Daniel, you're there? Okay, good. Uh, Richard Goodswimmer, Indigenous Sport Council of Alberta, in person. Thank you. You'll be number four. Han Leong. I see Han. Please come down. Number five, Yashusi Huki. Yes, hey, ha, here you go. Number six, Ellen Kwan. Ellen, you'll be number seven. Tanika Burley. Hi, Tanika, nice to see you again. You'll be number eight, William Law. There you are. Number nine, Haroon Ali. I saw Haroon earlier. Haroon, are you joining virtually? One, two, three, Haroon. No. Natasja Triberg, Edmonton Water Polo Community. Natasha, there you are. Okay, please. You'll be number 11. Christy Morn, Arts on the Avenue, in person. Christy Morn, or remotely. Christy, one, two, three. Nope. Kimo Mansare, Africa Center. Kimo, joining remotely. One, two, three, no. Milan, Rajmi, Raman, Rajmi, 
Okay, they thank you so much. Uh, Andrew Curry, Edmonton Folk Music Festival Society. Andrew Curry. One, two, three, Andrew Curry. No. Emmanuel Onha, Africa Center. Emmanuel Onha. One, two, three, no. Yar Eniet, Yar Eniet, from Yeg the Come Up Africa Center. One, two, three, Yar, no. Kamlesh Mahadiu, Kamlesh Mahadiu, one, two, three, Kamlesh Mahadiu, no. Jasmine Chong, Breast Friends Society. Jasmine Chong, one, two, three, no. Heather Thomas, Breast Friends Society in person, no, uh, virtually, no. Heather, all right, no. Okay, we are gonna start with Daniel Grist. Daniel, Hello. please go ahead. Okay. Uh, my time starts, yeah? Yes, go ahead, please. Awesome. Uh, so, hello, I'm Daniel Grist. I'm here today representing the uh, Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee, and I'm speaking against this budget. So, first off, I'd like to thank you all for spending two long days listening to all our concerns. Uh, long, long days from what I've witnessed. Um, I know there's an impossible number of asks from Edmontonians with a varying array of concerns and a limited budget that can never meet every request. Uh, I do not envy you all the task that is asked of you. Yet, Edmonton declared a climate emergency in 2019. As part of our emergency response, we set ourselves carbon emissions targets of 35% reduction by 2025, 50% reduction by 2030, net zero by 2050, and for the city corporation net zero by 2040. Yet this budget, the first budget since we declared our climate emergency, fails to reach our emissions reduction target for 2025, sets us up to fail our 2030 target and leaves a monumental and increasingly difficult task for net zero by 2050. The city corporation who aims to be net zero by 2040 will use a significant share of its remaining carbon budget in this budget cycle, consuming its remaining carbon budget in nine to 10 years time. Reading through this budget, it is a budget of rec centers, roads, LRT expansion, and park renewal, with some shared pathways tacked on and a sprinkling of electric buses. The vast majority of our funding decisions could be taken from any budget in the past 30 years. This is the greenest administration the city has ever seen, with the most environmentally aware council. How can it be that this is the budget we get? This is the crisis of the climate crisis a slow march towards climate change, our brains and societies ill-equipped to deal with a slow build crisis whose critical effects will be felt decades in the future. When a forest fire happens, we know what to do. We can evacuate nearly 100,000 people in a matter of days, and no one would imagine mentioning the cost of helicopter fuel or emergency shelter, war, flooding, pandemics. These are tangible, immediate threats with tangible, immediate responses. Do this or this happens in a matter of hours, days, or weeks. The climate crisis is a distant thing. It's something that someone else can fix in some other budget, another time, another council, another administration. But this is the makings of the crisis. This conversation, this time, this council, this administration, this budget, this inaction. We are an educated, wealthy city with extremely high per capita carbon emissions. We have the knowledge, the means, and the moral duty to do our part in tackling climate change, yet are choosing not to do so. This is an $8 billion budget, yet 10 million cannot be found to ensure the vehicles the city replaces over this budget cycle are lower emissions than those we have today. Instead, we will get like-for-like -like vehicle replacements that will continue emitting for a decade or more to come. This is an $8 billion budget, yet 24 million cannot be found to ensure the buses we replace over this budget cycle are zero emissions, buses that will continue emitting for potentially the next 25 years. This is an $8 billion budget, yet 35 million cannot be found to upgrade our transit infrastructure to low emissions. 
This is an $8 billion budget, yet $22.5 million cannot be found to fully fund the initial stages of the city's bike network. This is an $8 billion budget, yet $13.6 million cannot be found to complete missing sidewalk connections so that more Edmontonians can walk instead of drive. This is not a climate emergency budget. We are proposing to pass a budget that we admit will not hit our own emergency response targets. The only conclusions we can draw from this is that city admin is not treating this as an emergency, that you councillors are not treating this as an emergency. Having spoken with a number of you, I cannot believe this is the, the desire of this council or the desire of administration. This means our decision-making process is broken. This process yesterday and today is a great example of why our society struggles to deal effectively with climate change. You have heard hundreds of requests for funding over the past two days from well-deserving people, requests that will bring joy to communities, that will ease the burden of transportation, will give us parks to walk in, facilities to play in, projects that can be realized this year, next year, or the year after. How can climate decisions ever win against the near-term emotional, societal, and political payoffs of such projects? We must finance our climate goal projects. We must design a process in which climate projects can be feasibly funded. We cannot in good conscience recommend voting for a budget that our own administration tells us will fail to meet the crisis response we knew to be necessary in 2019. We ask that you vote against this budget, delay this budget, pass this budget for one year only, whatever you deem necessary. We cannot throw away these next four years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Next, we will go to Richard Goodswimmer. Hi, uh, Tansi, Mayor Sohi, and City Councilors. My name is Richard Goodswimmer, and I'm a proud member of the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, which is located in uh, northwestern Alberta. Uh, I am thankful and honored to be able to work here in uh, Treaty 6 territory. Uh, I am a program coordinator with the Indigenous Sports Council of Alberta, and we are a non-profit multi-sport organization that, re that represents all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in the province of Alberta. Our vision is a united and inspired Indigenous community building healthier uh, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual lives. Uh, our mission is to lead in creating uh, and promoting a strong foundational holistic health and wellness, and competitive opportunities for our Indigenous people, their families, and their communities through sport, physical activity, recreation, and culture. Um, as many of you know, Edmonton currently is one of the largest, has one of the largest Indigenous populations in North America. And the ISCA has worked hard to foster new and exciting relationships across Alberta to provide health and wellness opportunities to our ever-growing Indigenous community here in Edmonton. <clears throat> the Edmonton Ski Club has stepped up and we have enjoyed working with them for the past two ski, ski seasons and provide some fun and affordable programming uh, in our partnership. We are working closely with the Edmonton Ski Club to make sure that the new facility they are build, that they look to build will allow us to continue to offer our programs and hopefully expand it, benefiting many more Indigenous youth here in Edmonton. Uh, the Indigenous Sports Council of Alberta is a growing organization and this new facility potentially has the ability to offer us more uh, increased, uh, uh, provide more programming to our Indigenous youth here in Edmonton. Um, we at the ISCA are so grateful for the continued support we have received in the capital region, in particular from the Edmonton Ski Club. We have been graciously invited to share our vision with the architects and planners for the project over the next few months. We, we, we are invited to meet with them and we are looking forward to continuing our partnership with the Edmonton Ski Club for years to come. So. Uh, in our language, there's a word, it's called uh, Mio Matsuen, uh, um, uh, and that means a good life. So that's the holistic look at, uh, at what we try to provide to our people, right? So in, in building these partnerships, that's exactly what we want to provide, is a good life to our people. Uh, and uh, that's uh, short and sweet, and uh, uh, that means thank you all. 
No, thank you. Uh, really appreciate uh, your participating in this conversation. Really, uh, next we will go to Han Leong. Thank you, Your Worship, Mayor Sui and Venerable Councillors. My name is Han Leong, and I'm the chair of the Chinatown Transmission Collaborative Society. The CTC helps steward the Chinatown strategy, urban interface plan, and the areas of South and North Chinatown. I'm here today to ask Council to continue what they started in May. We had two deaths in our community. A lot has changed since then. We are not here to talk about the past. We are here to talk about the future, the future of Chinatown, specifically the need for investment along 97th Street, the underpass, 107A Avenue, Mary Burley Park, and the streetscapes of Macaulay. I have sent each of you a letter summarizing the ask with letters of support from organizations such as Qualico, Avenue Living, Macaulay Community League, and so forth. Today we are asking the City of Edmonton to continue their commitment to Chinatown, one previous councils ignored, and to fund capital investments in Chinatown. We cannot wait another 4, 8, 12, 16, 20 years. This advocacy has not been done in the past. We didn't make an ask. We weren't ready in 2019, 2022. We, we are ready now. City of Edmonton has been a loyal advocate for Chinatown. When our community suffered loss, the city provided financial relief and the Healthy Streets program against maybe even their own beliefs. Funding police is not a popular theme, but it was the right choice for Chinatown. We still don't know when the next murder can happen. Will it? Could it? What will we do if it happens again? But this council did the right thing. You knew this was the right choice, and we thank you. City Council and City Administration set up the $1 million Chinatown Recovery Fund to restore business confidence. We needed safety and security, and you provided $300,000 for short-term relief. We asked for manpower, and you provided Brett Latchford, Reach, and city staff because you understood the years of neglect, and you wanted to do something about it. On June 15th, a motion was made at Executive Committee to address the lack of capital investments, and I heard this council question City Administration for reasons why the Chinatown strategy was not being funded. I've seen the budget, and I'm grateful for the Harbin Gate and the operating budget for CTC. We are grateful to have developed the relationships and partnerships within city administration and council that understand the work we do, are doing and how important it is. I trust in this council, I trust in this mayor, but we are not done. We have urgency in Chinatown. We desperately need to change the narrative for Chinatown. This is going to take your help. Today I'm here for the final ingredient. We want to talk about taking the next step. For everything the CTC can do, for every mural or event we can host, we cannot replicate the impact and signal the city can send by funding capital projects in Chinatown. We need to talk about timing, momentum, and hope. Neighborhood renewal will begin in Macaulay and Chinatown soon, and there are opportunities to do the work in one shot to save time and cost and reduce the construction impact on our community. Avenue Living owns the Capitol Towers and is transforming it from an area of disorder into a new rental product for students and seniors. Qualico is on the cusp of unlocking a new gateway into Chinatown with station lands and a residential density we have not seen in decades. Investment is back in Chinatown. There is hope. We have been waiting for this moment. The time is now. The CDC is only four years old, yet we have made huge steps forward to advance the pillars of the Chinatown strategy. I have spent the past year getting this board right, finding the right people, and then putting them in the right positions, developing advocacy and strategy for this moment, for today. This is called momentum. We have the right people in the right places now, not in four years, now. We are ready to take the next step. Last, we talk about hope. Hope, there's a lot of great projects that we've heard climate change, transit, River Valley recreational centers, a lot of hard decisions during a time of extreme economic circumstances. We need to show fiscal restraint to separate wants from needs. Chinatown needs to change. It needs to be revitalized. And Edmonton needs to support foundational communities or they will be neglected and lost. We need funding for social services, mental illness, drug poisoning, shelter spaces. These are all important for Chinatown too. But Chinatown's been waiting for 20 years. Multiple budget cycles has passed us over. Our alleys, our sidewalks and parks, capital investment in our community is lacking. Capital investments are a signal to the world. It tells real estate developers, shoppers, store owners to have confidence in an area. We need to change the narrative and signal something new to take advantage of timing when programs like Healthy Streets and Neighborhood Renewal are in play, when help is on the way, when we have momentum in our community, when we still have hope. We need to signal to the rest of Edmonton, Canada, the world that we want to be a great city. And it starts by supporting foundational communities like Chinatown, Little Italy, White Avenue, Alberta Avenue. Chinatown's gone through a lot. We take on a disproportionate share of the burden when it comes to social services and houselessness. And we need an equal and offsetting commitment from council to fund capital investments and support our community while we all figure out the issue with houselessness. This makes sense. We're only asking for the tools, the capital investment that we can use and lift up our community while we are still under duress. We need to take the next step. Thank you for your time and for listening and to continue to listen to the needs of Chinatown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Han. Uh, next, we will go to Yasushi Oki. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Mayor, councillors, great to see you up there. It's wonderful because I've had an opportunity to speak uh, almost to each and every one of you. And I, I know outside of this council, you say call call me by my first name, but uh, here, uh, councillors, mayor, I'm here. Um, my name is Yasushi Oki. I'm the executive director of Green Violin. It's a community development company, and our vision is a robust, vibrant neighborhood. I happen to live in Macaulay, and I'm here today as a community development advocate for Macaulay. And I have to keep reminding my Macaulay neighbors that Chinatown is a huge part of Macaulay. It's in the southern qu uh, quarter of our neighborhood, and we really want to support what's happening in China, align our efforts in Macaulay with helping Chinatown out as well, because we truly live in a 15-minute community. I can, I can walk to Chinatown, I can walk to downtown, it's all 15 minutes, up to Alberta Avenue, over to the stadium. It's, it's what we're all talking about when we are talking about a car-free way of living. But we have to step physically over the broken sidewalks, over the broken people that are there. And it's a tough community. I mean, there are brilliant people there, but there's also a lot of desperate people there. Um, I was going to start my talk by saying donuts and incremental improvement. But I think at this late stage of your uh, two days of hearing us talk, you don't need fancy words or jokes. Um, what I wanted to say about donuts is, I, I'm close to a lot of the businesses in my neighborhood, uh, whether it's the Italian Center shop or whether it's shops in Chinatown. And I know that as people, not shop owners, but as people, these shop owners are giving uh, food or meals to those who are needy on the street. So that's the donut. There's a, uh, there's a shop in um, my neighborhood where um, if you need a donut, if a homeless person needs a donut and a glass of water, they get it. There's no question asked. And it's just, just this kind of humanity that runs through our neighborhood. And, and I kind of feel like my ask, which is for mayor and council to keep the street improvements and the park improvements in Chinatown in the budget, I feel like it's only $10 million, which as a, as a person, 10 million sounds a lot like a lot, but like Daniel said, as part of a huge budget, it could be just like that symbolic donut that you give our community. Because like Han mentioned, we, we carry a lot of the burden of the, um, the struggling people, and we just need that kind of hope, as Han said. Um, I should mention that my company is called Green Violin. It's a nonprofit. Violin, because the violin is a symbol of hope. Just like that donut that we give to the homeless person is a, a symbol of hope. It's not a full meal. It's not all the calories they need, but there's that connection of humanity that really gets them through the day. And if a little bit of street improvement, if a little bit of color in our, in our 97th Street can bring that hope to the people who live there and then show that to the rest of Edmonton that it's another wonderful street to go to uh, and that we can rank up there with uh, White Avenue and 124th Street, 118th Street, uh, Alberta Avenue got its improvements. It's like this is the last leg of that uh, rectangle that needs a little bit of extra help so that it becomes this wonderful place that I know it can be because I live there. Um, so I guess incremental change uh, and incremental improvement is what I'm asking for here. It's a small ask for this big budget, but budget by budget, I feel like we have to make positive steps forward. Otherwise, we're going to slip more and more into a desperate, um, almost a, a streetscape that's undesirable. And I don't want to say undesirable because I like going there still. I remember what it used to be like. I want it to be like that again. Uh, I've, I've walked with you, Mr. Mayor, and some councillors, and I know you have a commitment to the area because you've uh, I've over heard you say to your councillors, what can we do to improve this area? So I know that the desire is there. And I guess um, I started off by saying, I'm, I know most of you by first name, because I want to make it personal, like the, the, the shop owners who, who I'll keep anonymous here, that if you have it in you to give us that little bit of hope uh, so that budget by budget, we have an incremental improvement in our neighborhood. I think it's gonna be a, a wonderful way for not just this council, but subsequent ones to keep improving our Chinatown. Um, so again, I ask for, uh, for your consideration in throwing us a, a donut and keeping the uh, street and park improvement budget uh, portion alive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will go to Ellen Kwan. Yes, uh, thank you. Am I on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Your Worship Mayor Sohi and Councillors. Uh, today I'm here to request the City Council to give strong consideration to include the four Chinatown capital project in the 2023 to 2026 capital budget. Uh, firstly, uh, on behalf of the Chinatown community, I wish to express our appreciation 
to the City Council for your strong leadership on various initiatives on Chinatown economic recovery, safety, and security. Also wish to uh, thank the administration for their support and their initiatives as well. On uh, June 15, uh, 2022, the Executive Committee passed a motion to include uh, the capital projects identified in the Chinatown Strategy Plan in the 2023-2026 Capital Plan and the administration to provide projects, uh, project locations and cost estimates. Uh, the Chinatown Strategy Plan was completed in 2017, but none of the capital projects were included in the previous four-year capital plans or capital budgets. Uh, currently, the administration has identified four unfunded Chinatown capital projects on 97th Street, 107A Avenue, uh, Chinatown Streetscaping within the Macaulay neighborhood, and Mary Burley Park. Uh, ideally, all four, all four projects should be in the 2023-2026 capital budget, given that in terms of priority, uh, 97th Street, uh, Chinatown Street, Streetscaping in, Macaulay, in the Macaulay neighborhood and Murray Bury Park should be given the strongest consideration. Since 170 Avenue is scheduled for repaving in 2027, if necessary, one could defer this to the next capital budget cycle deliberation. Uh, firstly, uh, on 97th Street from 105th Avenue to 107th Avenue is scheduled for repaving in 2024 and 2025. Uh, for these two blocks, any capital works from the Chinatown plan and within the roadway right away should be added to the repaving project for cost efficiency. Secondly, the Macaulay neighborhood renewal work is scheduled for 2025. For again, for cost efficiency, any capital work in the from the Chinatown uh, plan uh, should be included um, uh, should be added uh, should be included uh, to the neighborhood renewal projects as well. Uh, let me uh, explain uh, cost efficiency. Uh, for example, the neighborhood renewal program we will replace existing sidewalks, let's say $1 million for X length. Uh, Chinatown plan uh, calls for the zodiac stamp concrete with thematic color, uh, say red. Uh, in my estimate, the extra cost would be 30%, $300,000. So in this case, the total cost would be $1.3 million. But if you go to another scenario that uh, we'll do it in 10 years later uh, at a cost of 1.3 million. Uh, so if you look at the 10 year period investment, the total uh, would be 2.3 million. So if you're doing it right now, we're really talking about a, a saving of $1 million uh, because uh, if you don't do it right now and do it 10 years later, we really throwing away that $1 million investment uh, that we're doing right now with the neighborhood renewal program. Of course, another disadvantage would be that the business will be disrupted again for another two years if we do it as two uh, separate projects. So the similar logic applies to street light and other roadway and ancillary items. Uh, more importantly, uh, the neighborhood renewal program and repaving uh, lately won't happen for another 30 years. So if we don't do it, if we do, if we don't do it right now, I, I'm not sure it could be another 30 years before we have another chance. Uh, what we're describing here is not unique. Uh, the city has made similar decisions on LRT project uh, to include the downtown Epco tunnel pedestrian underpass and also the future LRT station underneath the Brownlee building. Uh, regarding the Mary Prairie Park, the Chinatown master plan that was done uh, about 10 years ago calls for a Chinatown community space that enables an inclusive and programmable public space for the community. Uh, in addition to the cultural event, we envision this is an intercultural celebration space for the indigenous, the black, and the Chinese communities. Overall, it will be a great opportunity to combine the Chinatown strategy capital work uh, with uh, city's neighborhood renewal program uh, uh, or repaving work. In our opinion, this would be a very timely and cost efficient and also contribute to a unique dis distinct identity that's essential to capitalizing on Chinatown's cultural expression. Alan, oh. sorry. No, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, OK, next, uh, Tanika Burley. Hello, can you, can you all hear me? Yep. OK, um, good evening, Honorable Mayor Amarjit Sohi and distinguished members of City Council. My name is Tanika Burley. I'm the granddaughter of Mary Burley. 
I am here on behalf of the Mary Burley Black Angel Society. It only seems like yesterday that I was he that I was here before the City Council on June 15th, 2022. At that time, City Council was discussing possible funding for revitalization projects for Chinatown and Mary Burley Park. I am also here in support of Chinatown as Mary Burley Park is located within this historic community. I wish to ask the City Council to provide some clarity on what dollars are going to be allocated, if any, in this capital budget towards the Mary Burley Park, as well as Chinatown, both require infrastructure improvements. My family came to Canada from the United States in 1970. The Burley family settled in the Macaulay neighborhood. Mary Burley walked to work every day to provide a living for her family of six. I grew up hearing the stories of what life was like then, memories of a once thriving Chinatown and a Macaulay community. If the Chinatown and Mary Burley revitalization projects are put into this budget, this community can rebuild itself and hopes for the future can be restored. The Friends of Mary Burley Park hosted the first Mary Burley Proclamation Day celebration at the park on July 13, 2022. The Friends of Mary Park worked with the CTC, Chinatown Transformation Collaborative Society of Edmonton. The CTC donated goods and their participation was very helpful in making this event a success. Moving forward, we hope to work with CTC and the City of Edmonton to ensure that the Mary Burley Park is a safe and welcoming space for everyone. We know that revitalization of Chinatown and Mary Burley Park will bring the community and the City of Edmonton together. In closing, I'd like to say that I'm grateful to the City Council for allowing me this opportunity to come out and speak on this matter. It is my hope that these important projects receive funding. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Tanika. Next, we will go to William Lau. Thank you, Your Worship. I want to wrap us up with a vision of what Chinatown can look or feel like um, with these infrastructure improvements um, that have been promised five years ago. So fast forward five years later, 2027. It's 5 p.m. on a Saturday, um, and even though it's a weekend, you're still doing council stuff, because um, of course you all get reelected. And you're at that point <laughs> where everything on your to-do list is both urgent and important, but you had a long, long weekend. And your mind is exhausted, you've hit this writer's block, and on top of that, you know you owe the family some quality time. So what the heck, you decide to take a break. Where should you go, though? What day is that again? It's a Saturday. And you know right away, without checking your phone, that you can always rely on the Chinatown night market for a good time. Great food, amazing vibes. Very affordable, too, by the way. And know if you get ready quick, you can make it in time for the 6 p.m. late show. So you rush your partner because you know it will be tough to find parking on a Saturday night in Chinatown. Since that time, you and your council colleagues decided to invest into Chinatown streetscapes back in 2022. The community leveraged the new infrastructure, complemented it with a regular night market every weekend, and before long, Chinatown has become the alternative to White Ave for evening activities and nightlife. You end up driving straight to City Hall for parking, because you know you're cutting it close to 6 p.m., and you know Chinatown will be packed. So you park at City Hall, and as you exit the parkade, you're joined by other groups coming from Churchill Station, heading towards Chinatown, too. You all, you all walk towards 97th Street with the log courts on your right, the ram on, the, on your left, as you eavesdrop on a group of newcomers debating which Chinatown restaurant has the best pho noodle soup. You know the answer. Suddenly, your kid squeezes your hand in excitement as you turn the corner onto 97th Street. Ahead of you, smiles fill the street, laughter fills the air. And above them, a vibrant canopy of lanterns and lights ready to put on a show. The clock strikes six and the crowd comes to a silence. There are speakers that line both sides of 97th Street, and within the first 10 seconds, you recognize the prelude as Aerosmith's Don't Wanna Miss a Thing. Your partner holds you tight as you enjoy this magnificent spectacle, swaying to the rhythm of the music while admiring the dynamic synchronized lights that stretch across and along 97th Street, reminding you of the Bellagio Fountain in Vegas or the Symphony of Lights in Hong Kong's Victoria Harbor. Gosh, it's probably the best five minutes of your day. <laughs> And as the crowd starts to disperse and diffuse into the various restaurants, your partner asks what you want to eat. Being the politician that you are, you want to share your love across businesses. Um, so you suggest street food, since your colleagues also made vending permits more accessible in early 2023. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> the city streets have been blessed with an outburst of aunties and uncles that have brought their talent and their culture to the streets. 
over the next bit. You fill yourselves up with a combination of bannock burgers, all day dim sum, takoyaki, $3 tacos, um, jerk chicken, um, and much, much more. Between the bites, you'd be answering your kids' questions as they ask you to explain all the Chinese proverbs stamped in the concrete. Ren xin qi, tai shan yi. When we work together, we can move mountains. Qian li zhi xin, shi yu zhu xia. A thousand mile journey starts with one step. And as you feel the food coma kicking in, your partner reminds you that you have all this work to finish up. Um, but asks that you stay a few more minutes to watch the light show one more time before you head home, as it's almost 7 p.m. And as your partner holds you tight again, and as you see the glimmer and awe in your kid's eyes, you recognize that this was probably the most enjoyable hour of the week. Your spirits are lifted, your mind is cleared, and you reflect through some of the proverbs you just shared with your kid, and all of a sudden your to-do list doesn't seem that overwhelming either. And that's what Chinatown is, a place where you always get more than you expect. So community members um, are, are doing our best to do our part, and we hope that the city council can as well. And in today's specific instance, um, fund the commitments that have already, already been made in previous planning efforts. Thank you. We'll meet you there on Saturday evening. <laughs> Couple yeah. more years. Yes. Whether we are councillors or mayors or not, we'll meet you there anyways, right? So, yeah. Uh, okay, next we will go to uh, Natasja Triberg. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor Sohi and council members for this opportunity um, to speak. Um, I am going to talk about um, Lewis Farms Aquatic Facility, which I know you have heard um, several times in almost every panel. Um, just for a bit of background, I've been a volunteer in sports in Edmonton for over 20 years, and I've spent over half those years in aquatic sports and in various aquatic sports. So I did want to come and speak to this today. I'm also the mom of two daughters, uh, one who spoke earlier tonight, Brooke, and I also have an older daughter who's in her senior year in the US on a Div 1 water polo scholarship. I've seen firsthand the success that can come from keeping girls involved in sports. Um, one of the things I think this, these proceedings have been great. I think having maybe topic-focused panels would have been better so that you wouldn't have been hearing the same thing over and over in each, um, in each panel. Um, having said that, I think it's important to quickly try to summarize some of the main points that you've heard about the Lewis Farms Aquatic Facility. Um, I'll try to do that quickly and hopefully finish um, sooner so we can all get out of here. Um, the first thing I wanted to remind you of was what Herb outlined. He suggested that any kind of delay um, caused by a redesign of the facility will likely mean that you won't see significant cost savings from downscaling the Lewis Farms project. I also want to remind you about how the Lewis Estates Community League outlined the desperate need for more aquatic space for recreation and swim les lessons for the population in the West End. Additionally, swimming in aquatics is the number one rec activity in Edmonton. You also heard from school-aged athletes who have to train late into the evening due, the la due to the lack of available space for competitive aquatic user groups. You have also heard that any significant shutdown at the Kinsmen, which was completed in 1976, could completely shut down the diving program in Edmonton and will also greatly impact all of the other competitive aquatics groups. You've also heard that we are no longer competitive with respect to our facilities when compared to cities like Calgary and Saskatoon. Additionally, you've heard how pools built in Edmonton have been continually downsized to make them virtually unusable and inaccessible to competitive aquatics groups. You've also heard that high school girls in competitive sports are 92% less likely to become involved with drugs and 80% 80, 80 less likely to have an unwanted pregnancy. We've talked about girls in sport, but I don't think we've really outlined why we feel these aquatic sports are relevant to, specifically to girls in sports. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. What I think is important when we look at all these points, I think it's important to, to think about them all and digest them. I also think it's really important to look at who's presenting them. You don't have one team, you don't have one sport coming to speak to you about this topic. Rather, you've heard from community leagues, from the Edmonton Sport Council, from swim clubs, from diving clubs, from water polo clubs, from artistic swimming clubs, from master swimming and provincial sport organizations. 
These are groups who are often forced to fight with each other over meager, the meager pool space that is available in Edmonton. It's not insignificant to note that they have come together, all bringing you the same message over these last couple of days. And this is because this project does not pit one group against another. It provides space for all groups, community groups, for diving, for swimming, for water polo, all of these groups. When we talk about promoting gender equity in sport, it's important to note that these aquatic sports are either close to being equitable between boys and girls or are dominated by girls. I've been in the water polo community for a while, and while in Alberta, girls make up about 42% of the athletes, I can tell you that teams here, it goes back and forth. Sometimes there's more girls, sometimes there's more boys. So I would say it's close to 50-50 in Edmonton. While this is impressive when we're talking about a, a sport that comes from Eastern Europe and has been male-dominated in the past, when we look at other aquatic groups in Edmonton, the presence of girls is even more significant. 65% of competitive swimmers in Edmonton are girls, 60% of competitive divers in Edmonton are girls, and we know overwhelmingly the number of girls in um, artistic swimming. It's overwhelmingly girls in that sport. I think this has been exemplified by the girls that have come and spoken to you, the athletes that have come here and were outside yesterday as well. It is notable that the presence of women in these sports reaches all the way up to the top positions in Canada. For example, the Aquatics Canada Board of Directors are all women. This leads me to wonder if the fact that these female-dominated sports, these sports are female-dominated, is why we continue to see competitive pool space I am sorry, Natasha. Okay, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Maybe somebody will, somebody will follow up with a question to you, then you can finish your presentation then. I just need to be fair on five minutes for everyone. Good, good. I'm pretty sure someone will follow. I'll give you that opportunity. Uh, Milan Regmi. Um, I am present, Mr. Mayor. Yes, go ahead. All right, uh, first of all, I want to give um, a city council, um, I want to thank city council for giving us the opportunity to um, uh, speak to you guys um, regarding the my budget. I think it's very important as we want to um, uh, see what our city will look like in about four years from now. And this is a very important conversation that we should be all be having as Edmontonians. I want to speak um, uh, um, based on my personal experience as a university student, um, as a fourth year university student, and um, also being um, a part of my um, a university students council, where I've heard um, uh, as a council representative from uh, the people I represent as well. So when I looked at the proposed budget for the upcoming budget cycle, I saw both potential and downfalls in the budget I was proposed. And like I said, I'm speaking as a university student myself who uses city services often, such as transit, and also for students that I've personally talked to. A big thing I want to touch on is transit, which is in your operating budget, is receiving about 12.8% of the $3.2 billion in total. One of the things I've noticed is that service times have been reduced on weekdays to every six minutes on peak times and 12 minutes on non-peak times. Before, I remember it being every five to 10 minutes on weekdays. Yeah, in your capital budget, I see that only about $240,500 is being invested into new light rail vehicles to replace the existing fleet. And while I support this move to help ensure better safety for riders, I feel like the safety more, lies more into what, what happens off the train rather than what happens on a train, which I'm going to get into. When people are waiting for a long time to get on the LRT, this has potential to compromise their personal safety as transit hubs are fighting for so many people of crime tending to be higher in transit stations. I sit on my university student council, like I said, and this has been expressed to me by my constituents personally. I know friends personally that have experienced assault and violent acts against them on the LRT, and when they called their help, there was no response. So therefore, I do believe that um, the best way for city, to, city council to go forward to help ensure um, there's more safety for students on transit is to ensure that we um, uh, are investing into making sure that we have enough trains that way there's more frequent service and that students are not feeling you know as frightened to get on the LRT. Another thing I want to touch on is what we need to do as well is to invest in harm reduction and ensure there are spaces where people are taken and provide shelter and needs before the risk of a violent situation escalates. The root causes of crime is usually situations that sometimes individuals don't have control over such as houselessness, joblessness, and so on. Yet the city of Edmonton is only investing $4.2 million into the 24-7 health diversion program, which both becoming in the first year of the budget alone. In terms of response to a drug poison 
housing crisis, only $402,000 being invested into irresponsible four years, again, with an even larger bulk coming to the first year alone. In the house's response, about $4.7 to $4.8 million. Why am I bringing this up? It's not just solely about the funding, it's more about the accessibility aspects. Even if we have these projects, how will it help if there is not enough funding and accessibility? There is, after all, $7 million being invested in transit safety resource stabilization, but it's only hiring up the seven new community outreach transit teams. And I'm worried that in the future, based on how much, based on um, taking public transit myself and having gone through many um, underground, um, uh, many pathways and seeing that um, the homeless population just seems to keep on growing and growing, I'm worried that, um, with, and also when we take in the cost of living, I'm also, I'm worried that there'll be a lot more people struggling with homelessness, but not enough resources to be able to keep up with that. So therefore, um, while I certainly um, uh, do appreciate that there are investments being made in these areas, what I'd like to do is I think for the benefit of both people who are um, uh, in situations where, you know, they might have no place but to go to a shelter and also for the safety of um, students, including myself, who regularly take transit and don't want to feel unsafe, is that I personally would like to see more investment going into 24-7 um, uh, um, crisis teams, into um, uh, mental health um, uh, services and ensuring that we have the resources to be able to um, to be able to get these um, uh, to be able to really get those who are homeless into um, shelters and get given appropriate resources such as um, harm reduction and um, uh, safe and safe intake supplies, as well as ensuring that we invest into you know more frequent service. On that note, I would like to also touch on um, also you'll touch on transit accessibility up for a brief moment. I was very pleased to see that almost a third of budget is going into LRT expansion, of the third of capital budget that being, and this and that it will help. Um, as I do believe transit expansion will help students who are often having to wait long times and take long bus routes in both the west and northwest sides of the city. And it will, I believe these investments transit will really help make commutes more efficient. That being said, um, that that being said, this is part of the reason why I'm asking that we invest more in um, tr replacing transit vehicles and upgrading them, be, um, and ensuring that we have frequent we have more transit vehicles. So that way, we can ensure that when it's ready to go, there's frequent service being offered between them and to ensure that students have the accessibility to go to the university as needed. And with that, I will turn it back to Puzzle and I thank, thank you for the first time. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the list to call back the names of the people that we, that were not able to join us. I see some of them are here. David Dodge, you here? I am here, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, Megan Ecker, are you here? Megan? No, Harun Ali, I see, uh, is present here. Uh, Christy Morn, Christy Morn, Kimo, Mansari, yes, Kimo, are you there? Yes. Okay, and Andrew Curry, Emmanuel Onha. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, and Yar Anilith. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, Kamalesh Mahadu. Okay, no worries. Jasmine Chong, Heather Thomas. Okay, all right, we'll start with David Dodge. Yep. Harun, if you. You, Harun, if you could come down, please. Uh, take a seat or maybe a number 14 there in the corner. Go ahead, David. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, Your Worship and City Councilors. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here, and uh, it's been very interesting watching all the presentations. We obviously have an amazing city with lots of amazing things. They called upon us to provide advice on Blatchford, the EV strategy, sustainable buildings, electric bus initiatives, GHG management, district energy, and a host of other projects and policies, such as the city plan. Everybody in the administration was bringing their initiatives to the committee and council often asked administration to do that. Uh, council members told us again and again, push harder, go further, faster. It was very empowering to tell you the truth. And